Welcome everyone to the December 2020 Faction War. Here are your champions for the day. It's going to be Lotus Moon on the High Elves, Xyphos on the Wood Elves, Gabo Slayer once again on the Lizardmen, Tank on the Vampire Counts, Flying Taco on the Tomb Kings, Guac on Bretonia, Ice Power Total War on Dark Elves, and the Dark Lord himself, Falcon, going to be coming in with the Chevaliers for Ponce Calls. We have Tesla on the Beastmen, Valkanos on Norska, Papa Palpatine who is going to be in our first match of the day here on the Warriors of Chaos. Yimais once again on the Dawi to seek some vengeance for past wrongs. King of the Dead here on the Vampire Coast. Faust, the son of Sigmar on the Empire. Hadris, two-time Faction War winner here on the Skaven. And Vicious Satsuma on the Greenskins. Welcome to the stream, guys. Should be quite a bit of fun. These are your champions for the day. Now, if we take a look at the actual bracket... The first game of the day, I know it's a little bit tricky, it's a 16-man bracket, <laughs> might be a little bit hard to read. It's going to be Palpatine facing off against Vicious Satsuma in our first match of the day, which is going to be Warriors of Chaos against Greenskins. How you guys doing? Welcome, welcome. Followed by that, we actually have a pretty intense duel. It's going to be Lotus Moon on the High Elves and Xyphos on the New Wood Elves, and then it's going to be Beastmen vs. Dark Elves and Falcon vs. Yumais. It's going to be Chevaliers and Dwarves to round out the first half of uh, today's round of uh, 16. Welcome guys, hope you're all doing well. You, you're just on time, we're just getting started with this bad boy. Make sure to let us know in chat who you're rooting for. Who's your champion for the day? If you guys of course are channel members, you'll have access to an emoji for every faction. So uh, let's do it. I know, this is going to be a fun one. Chaos vs. Greenskins, I've always liked this matchup. Just kind of a, you know, no messing around, just get in there, get some crumping. You know, both armies want to crump essentially, which is always a good time. So, once again, here are your champions for the day, and we'll uh, get this first game started here in just a second. All right, go ahead. How you guys doing? Welcome, welcome. What predictions do you have? Who do you guys think is going to win today? So, you know, there was actually an interesting pattern I saw when I was looking at the previous winners for Faction Wars. So, for the past six Faction Wars, there's been seven in total. Um, Talaxlan Soothsayer did win the first Faction War with the Sons of Sigmar. He won with the Empire. But ever since then, the faction wars have been an alternating win cycle between Felcon, Anticity, and Hadris. Uh, Felcon have, has been switching factions, um, but Anticity was with his coast, and Hadris it was with his Skaven, which is pretty hilarious. So we'll see. We will see, my friends. We are, of course, in our first match, which is going to be on Altar of Outskirts. We'll be loading in in just a second, and I'll make sure to get rid of the screen blocker just to uh, spare you guys the misery of uh, listening to my radio show. So let's do this, and let's get rid of the blocker. Thank you, Wolf, for your uh, fine service. Of course, every game here in the Faction Wars, for any of you guys who are new to this format, is a best of one. So uh, the scores at the top are slightly irrelevant, but nonetheless, it looks kind of cool. Damn it, turn. Same time as the Northwestern Ohio State game. I'm sorry, man. It's prime time. King of the Dead saying, me and Hadrius wanted to be first, but all right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, King. Don't worry. You guys will get to go. It's going to be good. So, for the forces here of the Greenskins, let's take a look here at the armies of the Vicious Satsuma. He's going to be coming in with Black Orcs. Black Orcs have always been really, really good against Chaos, obviously. They trade well with all the infantry. Eric Larson, thank you for becoming a member here on the channel. Let us know your allegiance here in chat. Guys, you're rooting for the Greenskins. If you are, let us hear a big fat wah in chat. Or if you're pulling for the uh, Children of the Dark Gods, you know, whatever, whatever god you're dedicated to, shout that bad boy out. Run Command, thank you for becoming a member as well. Enjoy the new emojis, my friends. Support your faction and all the glory they deserve. Yes, yes, very good stuff indeed. So here we got Orc Boys in the front, a couple uh, Trolls in the back, which is kind of a cool inclusion. It gives you a little bit of mass, and obviously Trolls are pretty cheap. Only 800 uh, gold for these bad boys, and 100 weapon strength. I mean, their stats certainly not bad. It's mainly just their leadership, obviously. Grom the Paunch as the Lord Choice. Grom is very tough to snipe, which, uh, you know... And also, he's pretty good against Sigvald, I suppose, although he does lack armor piercing. Sigvald has been making a bit of a comeback in the meta. Granted, I don't know if Sigvald is the pick in this matchup. For the Warriors of Chaos, Papa Palpatine, he's got a Warhounds flanking with Marauder Horsemasters. His front battle line is going to be Chaos Warriors and Marauders. So really, um, he does not have much armor piercing in the front line. It looks like a very massive skirmish army, actually. So yeah, look at this. Triple Marauder Horsemen with throwing axes right here. Perhaps a good countermeasure against Black Orcs. You know, Black Orcs are slow, very immobile. The throwing axes, if the Warriors of Chaos could somehow defeat the Greenskins in the skirmish game here, 
I think that the throwing axes could be a variable that could you know help to defeat the black orcs because as far as this chaos army goes its infantry is definitely not up to the task of fighting the greenskin infantry so <laughs> eric larson just spamming ariel there i love it all right we got a chaos sorcerer lord of fire he's burning head fireball and cascading fire cloak and it looks like he's going to be going for an early sniping attempt here on the giant river troll hag the fireball coming downtown and He's going to be tearing into the hide here of the troll hag, and yeah, not a big deal, honestly. She'll regenerate. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I don't know what I would fireball here if I would fireball at all. Maybe trying to fireball the night goblin shaman or something, but even still, um, it looks like he's just a battery mostly. Granted, he does have the gaze. Now, interestingly enough, Chaos appears to be wanting to fight here in the front line. Although maybe he's just going to be pulling a little bit of a bait and switch here, like trying to get the black orcs to engage against Mirror Guard and then pulling back. I think that would be the prudent play, and that's exactly what he's doing. So the Mirror Guard are pulling back, very well played there by Palpatine. And now the Throwing Axes, you'll see, they do some really good damage against Black Orcs. Yeah, the Black Orcs getting peppered down, but Grom the Paunch coming in. His Royal Thickness going to be just rolling through those guys. It looks like he doesn't actually kill any Mirror Guard, but he does do some topical damage and kind of scratches the paint on their Immaculate Armor. But Throwing Axe is still throwing in and getting some really, really good value. Like I said, Black Orcs down to about 60% more or less, and uh, now they're in sustained combat here versus the uh, Mirror Guard. Which, uh, of course, they should do pretty well in that engagement. However, Mirror Guard do have some really good stats. Here we have Chaos Warriors against Black Orcs, which is a really inefficient trade. Um, you know, obviously he doesn't have much of a choice based on the army he brought, but the Chaos Warriors there are going to get crumbs. Ooh, a big burning head in the back. It does hit the Orc Boys, but nice dodge there. The Forest Goblin Spider Riders are able to get back and uh, avoid that burning head. It does roast some Orc Boys in the back, though, which certainly isn't bad by any stretch. I feel like Chaos is going to kind of get forced into a bit of a... A kiting situation here. I mean, they have a Manticore Lord. They also have a second Manticore, um, which is an Exalted Hero, mind you. So I think starting to starting to kite the Greenskin Army and try and pick them apart. Oh, and look at this in the back. I missed it. He does have the Swords of Chaos. Oh, that's so heavy metal. I love it here from Palpatine. The Swords of Chaos are pretty good against trolls. They do fire damage, so they can actually break them really quickly. And also gives you some extra Black Orc uh, kind of a beatdown units here. So the front line has been won by the Greenskins. Chaos Warriors and Mirror Guard are being crumped horribly. Trolls and Black Orcs kind of uh, pounding on them pretty well. But in the backfield, we do have these Swords of Chaos with the Cascading Fire Cloak. And these guys are uh, doing some okay work. But now it looks like they're going to be afflicted with the Spirit Leech. And also the Hag's coming in. And she can mither them and lock them in place. And this is not a unit you want to be losing early. The Swords of Chaos here are definitely going to be taking a massive beating. But, you know, Chaos does have all of its Marauder Horsemen, and the Black Orc units are uh, getting fairly damaged. This one is down to about 15%. These Black Orcs here are about half health, more or less. Arez, thank you for becoming a member here on the channel. And then we have a huge donation coming in from Mike E of $78. He says, happy birthday. Thanks for all the content. You're very welcome, man. And Arez as well with the $20 donation, as well as the membership. Thank you guys so much. Hopefully you're enjoying this glorious battle, because I certainly am. Now, it's pretty even at this point. I would say a slight advantage to the Greenskins, considering that Chaos is kind of without a front line of sorts. And Marauder Horseman ammunition, I suppose, is not bad. The Marauder Horseman might be able to kind of pepper down these Black Orcs with their remaining ammunition, especially with some good cycle charging here from the Exalted Heroes. Interestingly enough, last night I actually casted an entire Best of Five series with Papa Palpatine for my Swiss League that was really, really good. And I saw him in a similar situation. He came in against a faction, didn't quite have the armor piercing in the front line, but was able to still pull it out using uh, his Marauder Horseman and his Manscore characters. And the Greenskin mobility is more or less kind of crumped. Um, over here, it looks like, yeah, Spider Riders are being chased off. We have some Spider Rider archers here. So yeah, it does look like the Greenskins have the advantage, um, obviously, in the infantry and, you know, the mainline force. But yeah, ammunition's running a little bit low with Chaos. And Grom the Paunch is a really annoying screen against this. He could just kind of chase them down, and Grom the Paunch, um, of course, regenerates. So any damage, you know, that these guys get in, he's going to be able to heal that. I think maybe you would have to get the two Chaos Man's course to try and beat down Grom the Paunch. I mean, but the Greenskin Army isn't, you know, winning any beauty contests either here. You can see it's quite damaged. The Black Orcs are all a little bit beat up, but the Trolls are healing. Another big variable that is a little bit of a problem. Uh, but nice pick here. You can see Marauder Horseman going after those Black Orcs. But man, oh man, guys, they are running out of ammunition. And uh, I do not know how it's going to go once they're out of ammo. I think those Black Orcs and Trolls are just going to be unstoppable. I mean, Manticores are cute and all. Might be able to get a terror out. But, um, you know, the Black Orcs are immune to psychology. They're going to hold. Black Orcs, I think, are probably my favorite unit on the Greenskin roster. They're just so heavy metal. Now, something funny to point out. Have you guys ever noticed from, like, when you zoom out really high up and look at the Black Orcs? They look like these, like, hockey players. They look like they're just dragging these giant hockey sticks. I don't know if you guys have ever had that uh, happen to you. But I find it quite funny. Anyways, here on the flank, we do have a, a nice isolation attempt going on. The Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Fire does engage against the Orc Boys. And oh, look at this, guys. Swords of Chaos are back on the menu, boys. 
And they're coming in to ride down these uh, Orc Boys once again. And they do certainly get some uh, good damage against those bad boys, but they're just Orc Boys. Black Orcs are the big existential threat you have to face. And on the far side, those Black Orcs were broken. I love that Palpatine is scrapping so hard, despite, you know, being on the, uh, the back leg here. Now, something else to consider is that Chaos could get, potentially, a really, really good surround. Nice little uh, Vindictive Glare coming down there from the Goblin, able to poke that Chaos Sorcerer Lord, but... He could get a good surround, right? So get everything around the greenskins and then collapse from all angles with the horsemen in conjunction with like a burning head or something. Oh, it looks like a fireball. Oh no, and the fireball hits a tree. Oh, that's like the worst feeling ever, man. Oh, that sucks so bad. I hate when that happens, but you know, it's, you gotta watch out for terrain. Much like in 40K or any other wargaming type platform, you gotta watch out for terrain. And here are some of the Marauder Horsemen are throwing axes, do engage in melee. But I think the only chance Palpatine would have would be to get a full surround and maybe like a terror route on most things. But I think with Grom the Paunch, Black Orcs, plus the Hag, I don't think that's really going to be possible. And also, since we last looked here on the last episode, the, uh, the Trolls were able to heal up pretty massively. And I feel like they're in a pretty commanding position right now. And uh, you can see Chaos is getting in there. Ooh, big burning head attempt. Could potentially do some uh, okay damage. If anything, though, it'll break the leadership of some of these trolls, maybe. We'll see. Although, oh, very nice. The Great Uns is here. Grom the Paunch shouting words of encouragement to his people, giving a huge leadership boon, which kind of counteracts the alpha striking uh, tactics here of the Warriors of Chaos. But I think the Greenskins are going to hold. Some trolls actually would have broken here if not for the uh, De Great Uns is here. And it might wear off here in just a second, and maybe some of the trolls actually will break from there. Here comes another Manticorp going after the little goblin, punting him into the formation. But Chaos, I just don't think, has the bodies to do this, unfortunately. It looks like there are some Chaos Marauders over here, but for the most part, the Greenskins are holding firm. That was a really good Alpha Strike attempt here by Papa Palpatine. Going to be charging in once again, and Grom the Paunch getting hammered pretty good here. Man, oh man, this would be an insane comeback. If this, like, Exalted Hero can go Super Saiyan and solo Grom, but he does have Lucky Banner, and his axe popped, and those Black Works are just not moving, man. Immune to Psychology, pretty good base leadership by Greenskin standards, and, uh... Yeah, the trolls are kind of breaking. We've got two units of trolls broken. Some black orcs here are broken. Palpatine going to be pulling back for one last go at it, but that is going to be GG. Well played. Vicious Satsuma and the Greenskins hold on. And the Wah advances to the second round. Very well played to both players. It was certainly a very fun game. But, you know, I think you need more um, anti-armor against those black orcs. Um, although the Marauder Horsemen did okay. Maybe, you know, what would have been good too would have been a Hell Cannon against black orcs. That would have really punished them pretty good, but... um. Yeah, hold firm, boys. Hold firm. Very well played to those two fine gentlemen. If we look at the scores here, you can see the real breadwinners. Uh, the Hag obviously did good. Grom did good. Trolls did all right. But yeah, it was it was mainly, I guess, the, the holding Black Orcs. The damage values were spread all over the army, more or less. Chaos Sorcerer Lord did pretty good at 1,700. And uh, aside from that, the infantry didn't do too hot. Um, Marauders kind of got beaten down, as did the Warriors. But um, I love it, man. Palpatine coming in with Swords of Chaos, too. I mean, talk dirty to us, guys. It's, it's pretty glorious, for sure. All right, yes. Use the glorious Scars Nick emoji. Well played! The Greenskins will be advancing on, so let us go ahead and update our bracket for the day. It's going to be Vicious Satsuma facing the winner of either the High Elves or the Wood Elves. So he's going to be having an Elvish surprise here in the next round as we load in to our next map. GG, well played. It was the Shamans having uh, full value on the Bounce of Power. <laughs> yeah, they're discussing the tactics of that game there. I've always felt like Chaos can do okay in that matchup. Uh, myself, I think that Chaos Warriors with Great Opens do pretty well for the cost. The Hell Cannon mixed in there can be very, very strong as well. Oh my goodness, there's so many people playing right now. Just the Wild West. Just the Wild West indeed. All right, so let me find this lobby and we'll uh, get this party started in just a second. I need to tell them to open a spectator slot if they haven't. All right. Okay. We'll uh, be there in just a moment. <laughs> That's pretty funny. All right, we're just getting... I'm too weak, Anakin. Palpatine, you know, he put up a great fight, man. He's a very scrappy player. And I'm really excited to show you the best of five series he played in my uh, Swiss League that we have going right now. I think. Let's see if we can get in this lobby here. All right, let's double check it. Let me see what they put the password as. 
Let's see what Lotus said the password is. Okay. All right, we're in. We did it, baby. <laughs> Also, um, for any of you guys who are new to the community, may not have seen a faction war before, um, essentially, we run a March Madness type event kind of behind the scenes, which is quite a bit of fun. So basically, players will guess, they'll create a bracket and, and try and you know guess who's going to win. And whoever gets the most accurate bracket is also going to be uh, earning a prize pool, which is always a good time. All right. Cool. Now we're loading in. It's going to be our next match. It's going to be Lotus Moon on the High Elves facing off against the Wood Elves. So let's see if the hype is there, if the new and improved Wood Elves can make it to the next round, or if they'll be dismantled by an old, the old classic here of the dreaded High Elves. All right. So we're in the map here. Let's go ahead and switch on over and load into this bad boy. And there we go. Looks good to me. Have any of the? Uh, I haven't discussed the calendar idea yet. No, I haven't really gone out about about that. But you know, it's something I'll think about. Hadrius is coming up for sure. Hadrius, the two-time Skaven champion, uh, he won in a really epic series. I believe it was against Anticity once, and then the other time he was able to win against Norska in the grand finals. That was Zardar Total Ward that um, faced off against Hadrius that that first time that he was able to win with Skaven. That was a really really good series. I, I enjoyed that one quite a bit. It's going to be Lotus Moon versus Zyphos here. Who are you guys rooting for? The Elvish Duel. <laughs> Hadri's in chat saying he's going to lose on purpose just to destroy all your brackets. Oh, that's rough. And again, uh, Mike E and Arez, thank you guys so much for your donations. Mike with a fat $78 donation and Arez with a $20 donation really means a lot, guys. Appreciate that. And here we are. Let's take a look at this. I'm curious. You know, I've been wondering from a High Elf perspective the most efficient way to play this as well as a Wood Elf perspective. So we're going to get a quick look here. So for Zyphos, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a man of the, uh, the old world here. He's got his old style, Triple Waywatcher, of course, coming in with a Spell Singer of Life. A Glade Lord here, which is going to be just on a standard horse, it would appear. Yeah, the standard uh, kind of old school horse. I don't think it's going to be the Great Stag. Although that could be quite cool. Um, so Prey of Anathrema, pretty basic stuff. Wild Hunters of Kernis, Wild Riders. The only new unit that Zyphos is bringing to the table is going to be one unit of Blade Singers. Now, this is a kind of a nice contingent, just in case Lotus Moon goes with a defensive kind of box formation with Silver and Guard or Phoenix Guard or anything like that. Having the Blade Singers will be quite nice. Hey, Mario, thank you for the donation, man. Really appreciate it. Right back at you. Let us know, guys, in chat. Who are you rooting for? Zyphos or Zotphos and his beloved Wood Elves or... Are you rooting for the High Elves, man? There's got to be some High Elf fans out there. They don't, they don't, you know, they don't get the respect they deserve. Even though I think High Elves can do some serious damage in the hands of a player like Lotus Moon. Let us know who you're rooting for. So for Lotus Moon, he does have the Archmage of Fire, two units of Shadow Warriors, a massive core of Rangers, which might struggle a little bit against Wild Riders, but uh, they are backed up here by Dragon Princes. Yeah, triple Dragon Prince. Oh man, this is going to be a lot for Xyphos here. It's going to be a lot for him to handle. That is a lot of forward moving aggression. Also, a Tiernock Chariot. Oh, the dreaded Tiernock Chariot. You almost never see that thing, man. This is super exciting. And that is no ordinary horse. It's an elven steed. I know, you know, I feel like Zotes are really good in this matchup. But Zyphos has this, this thing about Zotes where he won't use them, which I think is a huge... Like, it, it's definitely going to hurt in some matchups. Although this style of play, you know, Wood Elves with Prey of Anathrema, it's, it's, it's always been really good. And uh, it still will continue to be good, right? But, you know, Lotus Moon is also a Wood Elf main, so if anybody knows how to deal with this style of play, I think it probably would be Lotus Moon. As long as he doesn't get caught in a really bad Prey of Anathrema or a compromising situation, I think he should more or less be okay. But, yeah, the Bladesingers will destroy the Rangers, but they'll also take a fair amount of damage back. Bladesingers um, are expensive. I, I de definitely wouldn't want them to be fighting, like, chaff units. Also, if they do get run down by Dragon Princes, oh boy, that could hurt really, really bad because they are very squishy. Um, 15 armor, good melee defense, mind you, but Shock Cav will really give them the business. Start anytime. Yes, you guys can start whenever you're ready. Zotes are MVP versus High Elves. I agree, Doctor. My Wood Elf build runs um, two Zotes, if I'm not mistaken, against the uh, High Elves. Because they're so good against like Dragon Princes and things like that. The magic damage, getting around physical resist on Princes definitely is quite nice. Now, oh, oh, you better watch out, Lotus. Oh, man. The Prey of Anathrema could have almost come down there, but Lotus was paying attention. But, like, a single Prey of Anathrema on a squishy lord like a Archmage of Fire, that could be bread buttered for sure. <laughs> Zyphos is a classy gentleman. He is. He absolutely is. 
And you know, he's a man of his principles here. So here comes the first volley. Just going to be tearing into the Rangers there and does some nice damage. But, you know, Rangers can take it like champs. They got physical resist. They'll, they'll be all right. Because they're ugly. <laughs> Is that why he doesn't like Zotes? Oh my god, that's so funny. All right, more volleys coming in. Ooh, nice one on the Dragon Princess here. Able to take out a couple models, and or at least a model, and also do some good HP damage. And the uh, Wood Elves are, as expected, kiting backwards. Would have been really interesting to see, like, a Dryad Rush with, like, Zotes backing it up. See how that would have traded against, like, the Princes and whatnot. But I'm sure we'll... You know what would be pretty crazy? If in this tournament, at some point, we do get to see Zyphos use Zotes, that would be a, a pretty magical experience. Now, the Eternal Guard will actually probably struggle against Rangers in terms of a cost-effectiveness standpoint. Here we have the Wild Hunters of Kernis eyeing the Tyrannoch Chariot, but the Tyrannoch Chariot is no mere chariot. It is a chariot with bows, and uh, they're going to be shooting downtown of the Wild Hunters of Kernis and getting some good value. Nice little ambush here by Lotus Moon, his Shadow Warriors are able to envelop the Waywatchers here, and uh, you know, actually get an optimal fire, but oh man, those Waywatchers shooting back with the Vengeance. Now where is this Fireball going? Oh, almost hit the tree. Looks like Fireball is going downtown against the Eternal Guard, and it gets in there and actually takes out a fair amount of models. Yeah, it looks like 12 models went down in total. And there is going to be an Earth Blood on the Way Watchers, trying to keep those bad boys uh, afloat. But now the Jaws of the Hiles, the Jaws of the Asser, are going to be surrounding here. And, uh, you know, Xyphos is kind of running out of room to work with. Eventually here, he's going to be having to engage his front line. And the Eternal Guard will probably win against these Rangers, considering how damaged they are. Prince is taking some uh, decent damage as well. Down to 43 models from 45, but a pretty big uh, HP deficit. Nice charge from Xyphos here, able to use the Wild Hunters of Kernis to hammer into the Rangers, and now he's pulling back. And it looks like another Fireball maybe coming in from the Archmage. It's a direct Fireball too, so it's not going right down the pipe and potentially doing big damage. So, so far it's looking pretty good for the Hardwood. Um, they've gotten some really nice picks in the army, really nice cycle charging here from the Wild Hunters of Kernis. But they better watch out. I mean, one bad charge here from these Princes into the Wild Hunters could lead to some pretty big damage, although it looks like Lotus Moon might be trying to path pass them with the Dragon Princes. I can't quite tell, although Spears are now coming up. And it looks like some sort of heal is going to be going down. Flesh to stone. That's actually really nice. So now the Wild Hunters. Oh, look at that. Beautiful net right there. And the counter charge with the flesh to stone. Backed up by Spears. Xyphos is certainly uh, not messing about, man. But the Blade Singers are taking some big damage here from the uh, Shadow Warriors downtown. But the big problem for the High Elves is the fact that all three of the War Dancers, or excuse me, the Way Watchers, are still very much alive and very uh, functional here in this match. So here comes the Way Watchers. Shooting down once again into these units here. Oh no, but look at this! The Archmage of Fire pounces on the Glade Lord, and she kind of gets pinned in amongst the Dragon Princes. Oh, that's really not good. Is that Glade Lord going to be surviving here? The Wild Hunters of Kern is trading very well with that Flesh to Stone, but now suddenly there's a big flank engagement, and if Xyphos loses his Glade Lord this early, that could just be bread buttered. Um, but it looks like, man, he's just barely able to survive, and that's probably due to the fact that the Eternal Guard buffering in there was so good. Now, the back line's getting a little bit messy. There are some Dragon Princes back here. We do have Dragon Princes on these Way Watchers, and Xyphos in his backfield is running a little bit barren as it pertains to um, support units. Here comes a Fat Fireball, good to be going after the Glade Lord, and nice hit right there. A direct hit does some pretty substantial damage. And, uh, man, he just barely survived that. That's a pretty stressful situation. Now, something here to take note of is that Blade Singers are actually really good against armor, uh, Armored Cavalry, if you have them on the right mode. But currently, Xyphos does have them on the Anti-Infantry mode, which means they'll kill Rangers more quickly, but... Not so much the Dragon Princes. Now the Archmage of Fire is going to be landing, going after it, and he does get the Glade Lord. The Glade Lord's in big trouble. The Eagle, of course, has the advantage of the air as well as speed, and the Glade Lord is going to be broken. Xyphos has indeed lost his Lord. Is that going to be enough for Lotus Moon to uh, get back in this uh, scrappy game here? You can see the Rangers are starting to collapse on the Way Watchers. Although, no Great Stag Knights. Great Stag Knights could have also been kind of a useful inclusion here, although I suppose they wouldn't trade too well against Princes uh, regardless. And here comes a counter charge here. Xyphos coming for vengeance. You can see that the Wild Hunters of Kernis are on top of the Archmage of Fire here. And ooh, this could be the comeback. He gets on top of the cast this character, which is not only Xyphos, or excuse me, Lotus Moon's Lord, but also his caster. Very close to the edge of the battlefield too. So probably he's going to break off. But honestly, I don't think it's going to get away. That won't even matter. And it looks like Xyphos is going to probably scrap this one back. Even after losing his Lord like that, man. Yep, he gets in, he kills the Wood Elf Lord, he still has two cavalry units, and somehow, some way, all of his Way Watchers are alive and the High Elves fall apart. What a game, holy shit. That was, uh, that was something, man. That was something, alright. So Xyphos with a victory, it was a very well played game. I, I love the, uh, I love the, the Ranger and the width of the army and the fireballs and everything, but, um, at the end of the day, the Way Watchers got just too much value. Um, a thousand here, fifteen hundred here. And 1100 here. Xyphos showing the old ways still work. 
Um, but the Blade Singers, I like that addition. It kind of gives him this like sweeper unit to really punch in there and take things out. Um, here, yeah. The Flesh to Stone, that, that was a really sexy combo. That Flesh to Stone, like switcheroo with the Prey of Anothrama to break the charge from the Dragon Princes. Because the Princes will only really wreck Wild Riders on the charge. If they're taking a charge, their DPS isn't that great in sustained combat. Yeah, it was it was really good, man. Awesome game. Well played to both. Lotus Moon, very well played, man. Looking forward to seeing you in Faction Wars in the future. And well played to Azotphos. Still staying true to his uh, anti-Azote roots. And uh, he is going to be advancing on to the next part of the bracket here. So it's going to be Wood Elves versus Greenskins, which I actually think is a pretty good matchup. I've come up with a couple of counter builds against Wood Elves with Greenskins that have been pretty effective. So I think that would be a really good scrap. Next, we have Beastmen versus Dark Elves. Oh boy, I'm going to love this. And my game crashed for some reason. So we got to fire this bad boy up once again, but it's okay. Uh, Tyrion uh, probably wouldn't be too good there. Yeah, he just he's, he's a little bit too easy to snipe. Um, you know, Larry is always good, Alariel, because you can, you know, you have Tempest in case they bring any flyers and you have healing, so... You know, there's a bunch of ways to play it. There is a bunch of ways to play it. Poor orcs are going to have such... You know what, I, James Rye? It depends on how practiced Vicious Satsuma is. Um, personally, I think Greenskins have some good tools against Wood Elves. They have a lot of snares, a lot of, like, cheap chaff to kind of absorb the shots. They can, they can do some really nasty stuff. It's time for Tesla. It is. So we're going to find the game here. Ice power versus Tesla. We're in. Meets back on the menu, boys. And the beast men are here. The Bray Herd. Oh, dude, I'm so excited for this. Two of your four favorite factions forced to fight already. I'm sorry. I know. They're, they're, it's, it's always painful when that happens. Can you pause? I need to get some coffee. Eric Larson, you have probably about three or four minutes before the next game starts. So, Ice Power and Tesla. So it's going to be Drukey versus the Beastmen here in our next match, which should be quite a bit of fun. And again, if you want to see who's playing what here in this glorious, glorious battle, there's the tale of the tape. All right. Picture on YouTube is showing the last faction war. Yeah, that's stupid. Oh, I'll have to fix that. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know. Stupid YouTube just being a troll. I will update it. Don't you worry. Who is on the Tomb Kings? The Flying Taco. Certainly a very powerful champion. Flying Taco, of course, was the victor of uh, my most recent ECL season. He did fall in the Ever Chosen to uh, some very serious competition, but was able to win the ECL season, which obviously is a huge accomplishment. So Flying Taco is definitely a really, really good player, and uh, I'm quite excited to see him in action. Uh. All right. Dark Elves versus Beast Men? Yes. So I, I actually saw Tesla in action. Let's go ahead and switch in here. When he played in my ECL preseason. So my ECL is going to be starting in the first week of January. And we had a preseason tournament, right? So I saw Tesla play in that tournament. And he got to the grand finals. And in many of his matches, he was playing Beastmen extremely well. And defeating factions like Skaven and uh, Wood Elves. And was just doing so good. So that kind of really inspired me. And uh, as such, he's here in this tournament. And he's uh, he's done pretty good. I am US. Uh, I'm, I'm in California. That's my time zone. Yeah. So for me right now, it's 930 in the morning. Thank you guys again for joining. Really appreciate all your support. And here we are. The faction war is upon us. Let us know in chat. You a fan of the Bray Herd? Is Morgur your boy? Because he is indeed here in the battle. Or you like to get a little bit edgy. You know, you shop at Hot Topic from time to time. Are the Dark Elves your uh, your potion of choice? Let us know in chat. It's going to be Ice Power Total War leading the Dark Elves facing off against the dreaded Bray Herd. I always love the Beastmen, man. You know, it's always fun to see him succeed. Poor guys. Although, it's, interestingly enough, Dark Elves and Beastmen are kind of two factions right now that everybody kind of makes fun of, but we'll see. Um, Anticity was not free for this faction war. No, he had some personal obligations and uh, was busy today. So, uh, we got the glorious King of the Dead on there. Don't worry. Vampire Coast fans will not be disappointed. So, for the Beastmen, it's going to be Gore Herds in the front, which, with the dual wielding weapons, it looks like it's going to be Ungor Spearman buffering triple Ungor Raider or double Ungor Raider, backed up by Pig Cavalry. Looks like it's going to be four... Uh, cuts of bacon here. And on the flanks, we have centigores. Basic centigores are the way to go. Um, you don't really need the great weapons. I mean, I guess to deal with like cold knights are a little bit more effective, but honestly, you have razor gores for that. And you have other cheap options to deal with them. So yeah, it's going to be quad centigore bacon up in the middle with gore herds, a pretty, you know, invested main line, actually. I mean, gore herds aren't cheap. I mean, they're, they're 550. So they're kind of in that mid range of like a mid tier infantry unit. 
but also, you know, four units of bacon, four cuts of bacon, and a Brace Shaman with a Vile Tide and a Brace Scream. So actually no summons from this Beastman build with the exception of Morker the Shadow Gave. I think that's really, really exciting. And now for the Druki. Ice Power Total War, baby. Ice, Ice, Power, Total War. He's got the Marathi uh, debuff blob, it would appear. So he's got a Canaid Assassin, a double Canaid Assassin with Marathi. No, it's it's just Marathi with the debuffs, but the Canaid Assassins are quite nice. Um, Web of Shadows can be very efficient against Beastman troops, and also they do have some range attacks against like Centigors and you know other forms of poke like that. It's going to be Spearmen backed up by Cold One Knights, Cold One Dread Knights back here, Dark Riders, Dark Riders, and we do also have a single Scourge Runner Chariot, I believe, no, actually two on either side of the formation. Scourge Runners have always been good against Beastmen. They can poke the big monsters like Centigors and Minotaurs and Razor Gores with their anti-large and also can serve as chariots in the fourth quarter of the game. So here we go, my friends. Release the bacon. Release the edge. Let's get that uh, early 2000s emo mascara going here and have a glorious battle. Start when ready. No worries. Yeah, there's a tiny bit of lag, it looks like. So there may be some lag in this game. You have to remember players are connecting from all over the planet. So um, it can cause some issues when we connect from America, South America, to Europe, to, you know, all over the place. And uh, things can get pretty wild. Well, let us know, guys. Who are you rooting for? Dark Elf Foot Blobs are certainly very strong and probably pretty viable against Beastmen, too. The Bray Herd is waiting. The Centigors are going to be advancing forward. Andrew in chat saying, I graduated with my undergrad today. The stream is an awesome gift. Hey, congratulations on the graduation, man. Hope your future is bright and successful and filled with joy and uh, glorious accomplishments, my friend. Cheers, Andrew. Ice, ice, baby. I know. I remember vanilla ice, man. Those were those were the days. Yeah, a little bit of lag here. Not too bad, though. Certainly bearable. And honestly, in this matchup, um, it's going to be fast one way or the other. This isn't going to be a long, grindy matchup. So even if there is a little bit of lag, it should be something that is... Uh, <laughs> it's It should be very doable here. So Chaos Warhounds with Poison, rushing to intercept these Scourge Hunter Chariots. Scourge Hunters better be careful. They only have 84 speed. The Poison Hounds can certainly catch them. And if there are Centigors to follow up, um, they can certainly kill those things. But now the front line is underway. I'm quite curious about how uh, Morker plus his Bray Shaman are going to be trading with the Canaid Assassins in Marathi. Something interesting to note. And here, these Scourge Runners on this side are going to be kind of keeping an eye on these Chaos Warhounds of Poison. You know, being a little bit cautious. Ice Power Total War does, of course, have his Dark Riders and his Cold One Dread Knights back here. Oh, man. He's going with Double Dread Knight. Now, we do have the engagement over here. The Poison Hounds do actually engage with the Chariots and kind of get wrecked, actually. So that was a much better engagement here for the Druki. And now the Dark Riders, as well as the Knights of the Ebon Claw, are going to be countercharging. And the Centigors are going to be pulling back at the last second. Definitely a very, very smart play. So in the front line, no surprises, the Beastmen are dunking all over the face of the Dread Spears. I mean, they have Razor Gores plus Gore Herds. Two, th two units that... Razor Gores by themselves aren't great here, but Gore Herds are really good at cutting through Lightning Armor troops. And here in the center, we have a bit of a blob fight as well. Marathi debuffing the melee attack of the Razor Gores down to six, and the Spears down to seven. And uh, the K-8 Assassins, of course, doing very well. But um, yeah, the losing the Dread Spears here might lead to a surround. We will see. I think the Dark Elves are probably going to be losing most of the infantry fights, but where they can get some good value, of course, is using their Dread Knights and their Scourge Runners to win the mobility game and maybe defeat the Centigors in combat. We will see. Looks like a Vile Tide's going to be going down. Nice dodge there by the Druki. It doesn't do too much damage. It just kind of tickles the pickle of that back rank right there. And now we do have a Blob fight here on the outside. So we have Centigors and Poison Hounds engaging against Dread Knights. Now, normally Dread Knights would be in a happy-go-lucky position here, but I feel like Druki probably need to stay a little bit tighter together in this matchup because what's going to happen now is the Centigors and other infantry are going to surround the Coldwind Dread Knights uh, just with pure numbers and bodies. These pigs will probably come back, and um, it could be a little bit of a precarious situation. So we'll see how that goes. Back in the center mass of the engagement, we do have the dreaded uh, Marathi Blob, although she's taking a little bit of damage. It looks like Morker might have gotten in there. No, actually just Razor Gores and Gore Herds are getting some good damage against Mama Marathi, and the, the Bray Herd seems to be getting good surrounds. If we look all over the battlefield, Scourge Runners over here kind of screened out. Dread Knights are running from Razor Gores instead of fighting. We have Dark Riders and Dread Spears here dying as well. And over here, I mean, this is a really potentially huge loss. We'll see how the Dread Knights do. They're actually trading quite well considering how heavily outnumbered they are. You know what? The Dread Knights might be able to carry this battle here. We'll see. Bounce Power is Beastman favored, but it pretty much always is in the early game. Um, having, you know, a uh, big old, man uh, not Manticore summons, but Chaos Spawn summons and things like that pretty much always tanks the Bounce of Power in the beginning, but... You know, so far, I do feel like the Beastmen overall have probably gotten more value on the battlefield, really kind of uh, forcing the Dark Elves into this 
really hard pit fight right here. Now Marathi, I think, is actually dying. Yeah, Marathi's going down here. Goreherds have exceptional DPS against light armor for their cost. 36 base weapon strength with really good melee attack. Even after Marathi debuffs them, the blob is going to be uh, pretty serious business. Pretty serious indeed. So Marathi is shaken and is mainly stirred, but a really nice soul stealer coming in from Marathi could be enough to stabilize her and kind of get her leadership going. And also stacks with um, a web of shadows as well. So that's something to consider, but... Yeah, again, guys, sorry about the lag. It happens every now and then. Usually there's at least one game in Faction Wars where there's a little bit of lag. I've played with all these players individually before, and usually none of them have any lag issues. So it um, could just be a temporary thing or, you know, something going on. Certain countries connecting in certain ways. It's uh, it's truly uh, the Wild West. Nonetheless, though, we get to watch the slideshow battles. Here, it looks like the Dread Knights are going to be fully surrounded. So the Bray Herd piling in with just cheap spears and different things like that. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big loss. Although, Coldland Dread Knights, how well have they done for themselves? Uh, only 400 value. That's pretty painful for sure, considering they're about to die. And Because uh, Razor Gores in there give huge AP values. The Spears buffer, and when they break, Centigores and or Hounds can chase them down. Um, back in the center mass, the Beastmen seem to be, again, in a pretty commanding position. Ungor Raiders are still functional. Um, Dread Knight's still lurking on the edge of the battlefield. We do have the Knights of the Ebon Claw still kind of going, but I don't know if they're going to be enough. Marathi getting that Soul Stealer definitely was a very, very nice play. Also, you have to remember is that the Beastmen are about to run out of summons. It looks like all three of the Dark Elf characters are actually going to be rotating over and uh, opting to go after Morker the Shadow Cave. You know, it's kind of an all-in play. I mean, it could potentially work. Web of Shadows may be on cooldown here, or off cooldown, so maybe a little bit of AoE to kind of clean off the uh, Ungors. But the Raiders are still functional. There's Razor Gores coming back as well. And uh, you know, over here we have another engagement going down with the uh, Centigores. But you know what? Ice Power's actually gotten a... Fairly scary goon squad together, and this is definitely nice. Having this critical mass to run over any beastmen resistance. Resistance is futile beastmen, and uh, they're going to be hunting down the centigors here, although centigors and the mobility of the beastmen kind of allows them to dictate these engagements, so we will see. So back here, Scourge Runner Chariot's going to be getting popped pretty good by those Ungor Raiders. Volume of Fire. Scourge Runners, of course, do have 80 armor, so they're going to be somewhat durable against that, but I think with... um. Marathi and the Assassins probably going down to this Beastman blob. I just don't think it's going to be going too well. Morker did take a little bit of damage though, mind you, and it looks like the Chariots of Ice Power. That's kind of nice, actually. Oh, a big Soul Stealer here could actually do some work. It's going to be hitting all the infantry. But the Canaid Assassins are just getting so low, man. And even if the Beastman do break here... Oh, yeah, look at that. The second spawn of uh, Chaos Spawner out. Morker probably used his staff there, or it was the Stave of... Um, or the uh, Spirit Essence of Chaos, or whatever it's called, where he uh, creates one from a nearby unit. That's going to be tough. Those spawn will hit very hard against Marathi as well as EK8 Assassins, but she's doing really well, actually. I have to say, Ice Power is scrapping incredibly well here in this uh, battle. So here comes the Scourge Runner Chariots bouncing out to shut down the Ungor Raiders. I think that's going to be a very valuable engagement for them. However, Beastmen do have some Razor Gores back here, and you can see immediately Tesla is really on point with that. He's able to get his uh, Razor Gores and pile them in to attack those Scourge Runner Chariots, and those bad boys taking some uh, damage, that is for sure. And uh, the Gore Hurts here getting run down by Chariots as well. But is Marathi going to be able to carry this? I mean, it's the game's not out of reach yet. Um, when the spawn disappear, the balance of power will probably go about a quarter of the way back to the middle. A little uh, Doom Bolt going down there. But my magic isn't terribly effective against Morker in my experience. He's, he's definitely uh, a raid boss to bring down. Yes, let the Moos out. Who let the Beasts out? Well, it would appear Tesla of Clan BBB has let the uh, Beasts out. And now, Morker the Shadow, Shadow Gave going to be going in and uh, most certainly finishing off Marathi. I don't think Marathi has much of a chance there. Really good with debuffs, really good Magician, but in terms of sustained combat versus a character like Morger with Poison and Regeneration, it's going to be a bad bad day at the office for old Marathi. And it uh, looks like it's getting danger close to army losses as the Beastmen do surround and um, finish off Marathi. And yeah, you can see it's going to be army losses here in just a second. Dread Knights were a cool idea, I guess. I, although I think Beastmen don't really have the value targets for them because like just throwing chaff at... That, you know, pigs and spears and cheap units at the uh, Dread Knights, I think, led to the downfall of the Druki. Again, sorry about the lag. I'll tell the players to check in on that after the game. But nonetheless, the Bray Herd advances on. Let's see the value. More Crit the Shadow gave, 600. Uh, we'll look for anything of big note. Well, it looks like 1,000 on these pigs. Certainly not bad. Centigors did decent. Yeah, and you know, the Beastmen really spread the value across the board there. So, um... Very well played. I like the build by Ice Power. You know, Dread Knights, I just haven't had Dread Knights work in this matchup. I think uh, Doomfire Warlocks are much better. You get free free damage, and they also do better DPS, in my experience, against Light Armor. But yeah, I like the Canid Assassin plus Marathi Blob. I think that's quite strong. Um, Scourge Runners pretty much always do good 
but yeah the dread knights i think were the weak link in that build just in my experience but it was it was it was a good try very well played so let's go ahead here and uh, go on over to the faction war bracket it's going to be tesla advancing to face the winner of felcon or Umais. So it's either going to be Beastmen against Bretonia or the Chevaliers or Beastmen versus the Dwarves. Both of which are, you know, are doable matchups. Yeah. GG well played. Let's get to this next game. All right, so let's jump out of here. And go there. Yeah, there's only one elf faction left. It's going to be the wood elves, but, you know, they, they kind of had to fight against one another. So, um, yeah, it was a different thing here. All right, we're loading into the next match, guys. Let's see who it is. It's going to be Felcon against Umais. It's going to be dwarves against Chevaliers on Troll Country. So let's get the nameplates up. I always spell his name wrong, so my apologies. I'm trying my best here, bud. The Dawe. Our sub-faction champion of the day. Start when ready. Should be great, man. I know, this is like a lose-lose, this one, right? Because you have you have a sub-faction, which is really fun, with the Chevaliers. And then you have Dwarves, which like most people love, right? Tanomi, turn. Your content kept me sane through finals. Now I can relax and watch a stream. Hell yeah, man. You know what, Therian? People make fun of Beastmen a lot, but Beastmen were actually in the very first faction war we had. They got to the grand finals. Beastmen were doing really well, tearing through almost everyone. Flying Taco, I think, got there. Yeah, it was Flying Taco against Soothsayer in the grand finals with Beastmen versus Empire. It was really good. Yeah, that was, was a great match there. All right, let's load into this bad boy. Let's have some fun. Good luck to you, Mais, as well as Felcon. And here we are. So let us know. Who are you rooting for? Are you uh, a fan of the ancestor gods? You like grudges? You like Bugman's brew? Let us know in chat. Are you a true Dowie? Satisfy the grudge. Or guys, are you uh, here for the Chevaliers? Are, oh, is it gonna be Raponce? It's gotta be Raponce and Henri Lamassif. Look at this. Felcon, a true man of the people. He brought uh, Raponce. He brought Henri Lamassif on horseback. Now that's not terrible. He does actually have good AP values. So that should be quite interesting. Uh, so let us know, Bretonnier Dwarves, who are you rooting for in chat? Let's do it to it, man. So for the Dwarves, or the Bretonians, it's going to be peasant mobs in the front, as far as the cavalry goes. It's going to be a Knight's Errant, actually, so no questing Knights. Very, very interesting choice. Uh, perhaps just going for a wider army, because Knight's Errant aren't terrible against Dawi. I mean, they can cycle charge against the uh, squishier targets relatively effectively. And what planet are we on? Felcon coming in with Pegasus Knights against Dwarves? All right, this is like some next level... Some next level shit right now. I have no idea what's happening here on this battlefield. Now, Felcon does also have a couple foot squires. Looks like one, two kind of mixed in over here with some peasant bowmen and three trebuchets, which are completely spread out across the battlefield. Holy shit. This is either going to be like a really haggard build that doesn't work, or it's going to be like one of those things that's just like so big that the brain cannot process its complexity and just, oh my goodness. This is going to be very interesting. Holy shit. So... For Yumai's here, he's got a battle line of miners and dwarf warriors with uh, rangers or corlers and guns in the back. Very standard stuff. Corlers are, uh, you know, decent at killing peasant archers and chaff units, and then the thunderers kill the heavy cavalry. And it is going to be Ungram Iron Fist. I do think Grom Brindle is the best choice, but this should be a really good one. Plessy, thank you for the donation. Take back every grudge. <laughs> thank you for the tenor, man. This is 4D chess, for sure. This is like some next level stuff. Ah. Uh. Oh, okay. Flying Taco in chat with a very good point. You know, it's a little early in the morning. It didn't occur to me, but the Pegasus Knights, I suppose, could be a countermeasure against gyrocopters. Okay, that makes sense, Flying Taco. Thank you for illuminating my uh, my sight here in the early hours of the morning, but yeah, I don't know, man. This is pretty wild. You know, what I've seen done more often to deal with gyrocopters is double Paladin up on their mounts. So you could bring like Henri Le Massif. Uh, I guess, yeah, he wouldn't be enough, probably. Holy shit. Now, something that is pretty nasty is you have the triple trebuchet. So one here, one here, and one here. And that's going to force the dwarves to have to march in kind of one direction or split up. Um, Pegasus Knights could still do some good cycle charging with Falcon's Micro. I don't think uh, they'll be useless for sure. Yeah, it's a pretty wide Dawi army, but it's a good Dawi army. It's definitely very strong. We'll see. 
And the thing is, as far as the brackets go, if the Bretonians can defeat the Dwarves here in the beginning, I think the rest of the bracket probably will be relatively comfortable for them. I mean, facing Beastmen for Bretonia is, is a comfy matchup. It's a good matchup, um, but very doable. And then from there, it's Bretonia versus Elves, I believe. So it'd be Bretonia versus either Wood Elves or... Um, or uh, who's the other faction at the top? I can't quite remember, but... Yeah, so this is really the biggest challenge for Bretonia in the tournament so far, I think. Lack of artillery makes those trebs pretty good, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, guys. I'm very eager to see this. So the dwarves advance immediately, which is smart. <clears throat> because all three trebuchets are going to be opening up and uh, firing downtown. And I wonder what they'll target. Probably shooting the thunders would be my bet. I mean, because the other aspects, you know, the quarrelers can be juked. Um, Thunders pack some serious punch against the Bretonian Heavy Cavalry, so I think the Trebs are going to be going after the tightly packed uh, Thunder units here. A little bit of Corlear Fire tickling the pickle of those Knights Errant there, and now Felcon is going to be going for a bit of a flank overload here with his Knights Errant and his Pegasus Knights, and uh, trying to fo force the Dwarves into a more static position. A little bit of damage going down on those Knights Errant, Felcon definitely wants to pull back here. But the Trebs have made some decent contact here. You can see there are Slayers reinforcing. Felcon has to be really careful. Um, Definitely, I think, taking more of a patient approach here rather than charging in the Knight's Errand against Slayers. But, you know, he does get the couched charge right there. And if he's able to pull back before uh, saying it's sustained combat for too long, that could be worth it. I mean, Slayers are a little bit more expensive than the Knight's Errand there. And it's a lot of it's about kind of keeping the, uh, oh my god, those Knight's Errand getting pounded with firepower. But here comes Rapunce and Henri Le Massif. Pegasus Knights flying overhead, maybe looking to take some engagements here as the Foot Squires do overload the flanks. But the Pegasus Knights are going to be charging in and... They do get a nice charge here, but the Slayers are going to be hot on their tail. But yeah, not bad, really. The Pegasus Knights actually doing some huge damage on impact. But my concern is that um, Pegasus Knights are going to have some problems in sustained combat here if uh, the Slayers are able to catch up to them, especially the Dragonback Slayers. So more Knights pushing in, and Foot Squires are now enveloping here on the far side of the battlefield. And Falcon is going to be scattering to the wind with the Pegasus Knights. And I'm actually really impressed with the damage they did. Holy shit. That was pretty metal. And now the Slayers are busy fighting Henri Le Massif as well as uh, Rapunce. They have to be careful here. This could be a relatively tough engagement. Um, but again, I think Rapunce and uh, Henri do have healing. And, you know, if they're going to be distracting Dragonback Slayers, it opens up many other aspects of the battlefield. Now, there are some uh, pushes coming in. In the back, you can see some Dwarf Warriors are making their way towards the Trebuchets. But so far, the back line of the Dwarves has taken a pretty big pounding. But so too have the Knights Errant. The Knights Errant have really had their bread buttered pretty hard. But not before one unit of the Thunders is actually completely broken off right here, which is kind of interesting. Pegasus Knights might come back around and finish these guys off. We'll see. Foot Squares in sustained combat against Dwarf Warriors doing pretty well for themselves. They should out-trade them in that situation. And Rapunce and Henri La Massif are going to be jumping in and going after these Thunders here while the Trebuchets uh, continue to push off those Thunders. Man, they're a really, really wild game. This is incredibly close. I can't really say who's ahead here. Dwarves have gotten some really good damage against the Bretonian Cavalry, but there still are Pegasus Knights and Knights Errant kind of running rampant. And the Footsquire Blob is also going to be something else that needs to be respected as uh, Henri La Massif and the Bretonian uh, Tattered Cavalry here in the back continue to chase off the guns, man. And Rapunce uh, Cycle Charging against the uh, the Slayer King could be quite strong. Yumais definitely needs to get Ungram moving right now. Ungram needs to get involved in some engagements. Granted, uh, he probably can't catch anything anyway, so I suppose parking him next to something of value could be quite good. Uh, as far as the Dwarf... Exodus units go. Yeah, it looks like one of the trebuchets is going to be taken offline by the Dwarf Warriors. A little bit of a misplay by Falcon by not uh, dropping that and running and hiding in the corner. But um, Pegasus Knights are now coming back, trying to maybe liberate the backfield. But yeah, losing a trebuchet there definitely hurts. And now the Dwarf Warriors, I would imagine, are going to make their way across town and go after that other unit. This is a very, very scrappy game. But I can tell you guys, I've been in a million games with Falcon like this, and it might feel like you're in a good position. But, um, you know, he can make uh, pretty much anything work. Although I think he just has to make sure his Pegasus Knights don't get caught in bad situations and just kind of methodically pick apart Dwarven ranged units. Like here's a really big freebie um, that you could potentially get. Ungram's going to be a pain though. Um, you'll need some Foot Squires to kill Ungram in the fourth quarter of the game. But I do feel like Bretonia may be in a slightly better position. Although it's really, really close, man. The Slayers are going to be a huge pain in the ass to deal with in the late game. And Falcon needs to make sure his Trebuchet crews like run. Like, instead of standing here and letting the Dwarf Warriors kill them, he needs to drop the Trebuchet crew and start kiting the Dwarves. Because if he does that, then eventually, you know, the Dwarves will have to go elsewhere and he can run back to the Trebuchets. But if he just lets them get chased off the battlefield, that tactical option is pretty much out the window. Now, we do have Double Pegasus Knight over here. It looks like they're going to be hunting down the Quarrelers, which is definitely a very, very good call. We do also have some Knights Errant. Rapunce is in great shape, and uh, yeah, he's made Rapunce work pretty well so far this game. The Foot Squire Blob also performing quite well. Um, able to cut through all the Dwarven infantry here, and uh, Henri Le Massif is also lending his armor-piercing attacks and doing some great work as well. But Ungram being surrounded by 
bunch of cheap AP infantry, probably not where he wants to be. He's obviously more of a monster slayer character, and that's where he shines. Uh, and yeah, Felcon has done it. So now the dwarves are kiting the dwarf warriors, or excuse me, the peasants, and uh, are going to be able to, you know, at least make it harder for the uh, dwarves to get that free value. And you can see the peasants are still going. Might actually get caught by the dwarf warriors here. It looks like they do. Those dwarven legs were pumped pretty hard. And now the last of the field trebuchet is probably going to be falling here. I don't know if there's anything that Felcon can do to save it. Although that would be really nice for the Bretonians if you could save it. Um, Balance of Power is actually going in the favor of the dwarves a little bit here in this game. Some of them are being chased off the battlefield, but I think the trebuchet is going down is really giving the dwarves um, the edge they need here. Although Ungram might be able to get Cycle Charge here by Henri Le Massif. It's still a close-ish game, but yeah, the trebuchet is going offline like that really, really hurts. Maybe leaving the foot squires back there to actually defend the trebuchets could have been something. So Cycle Charging is coming in here from Henri Le Massif going for the kill here on uh, Ungram Iron Fist, but he's got to be careful. Ungram is certainly a raid boss, but with Rapunz nearby, maybe Rapunz could help out in that situation, but Henri is going to have to Cycle Charge to uh, get the best value out of that. Here comes some Knights Errant. Hammering into the Quarrelers. Uh, the Dwarves don't really have too much in the way of missiles. I'm trying to look around to see if there's any Pegasus Knights or anything like that kind of uh, going on here. And I wonder if Falcon's going to go for Ungram. Yeah, man, there's still so many Slayers too. Blasting Charge is coming down. We do have the Peasant Bowman in the back moving in. Peasant Mobs as well. Really going for that kill. I mean, Rapunzel hits really hard against uh, ground-based infantry. She's got huge damage. Short of Lioness is active. For some reason, she's kind of just waddling after Ungram here. But it looks like an attack should come in here in just a second. And Ungram, uh, his melee defense holds, man. Ungram is certainly a raid boss of a character. The Bretonians going for a bit of a desperate gooning here, which I certainly don't blame them. If they were able to kill Ungram and, you know, keep their characters functional, that could be a way for Bretonia to get back in this game. And you can see the balance of power is kind of ebbing and flowing a little bit. Nice cycle charging from Henri Le Massif. You know, whichever one Ungram attacks. Yeah. Oh my god, the balance of power is back in the middle. Holy shit, is Falcon going to do it? Oh my god. This is the thing, like, high-level players can do stuff like this. Henri plus Rapunz both have amazing AP values. So they can really cut through a character like Ungram. And Ungram is down! Holy shit! Ungram is down! Hot damn! So now you just need to deal with the Slayers. And honestly, I don't know if the Dwarves are going to be able to kill these characters. Do they have... Oh, actually, hold on. 45 Dragonback Slayers there. That is no joke. We still have a Trebuchet crew kind of hiding in the trees over here, which is pretty hilarious. And uh, some Peasant Archers are back as well. But now it looks like Falcon is going to be going in for the uh, for the Quarrelers and the, uh, the other units right here. Yep, he's going to shut those guys down. Now, it looks like these Slayers, the Damsel of Life, is probably going to have to run. The Foot Squires here are wavering. 36 of them still. Yeah, but these are Ekron's Miners. These are no mere Miners. These are the Ekron's Miners. Are the Bretonian characters going to be able to do this? I don't know, man. Holy shit. Chasing off the bows, definitely not a bad idea. He's got some Peasant Bowman kiting back here. The Damsel of Life is making her Valiant last stand. If she has any Winds of Magic, she definitely wants to get that off before this battle kind of uh, closes here. I don't know, man. Dragonback Slayers are going to be really, really tough to bring down. Falcon does have his Field Trebuchet tr crew hiding in the corner, which is, is kind of cool. <laughs> and Henri Le Massif <clears throat> is uh, chasing down these units. This is a great game. Holy shit. I'm really curious to see what kind of value those Pegasus Knights got, too. We have a couple of Foot Squires who've come back. It's definitely quite helpful, but losing that Damsel of Life definitely hurts quite a bit. But if Rapunz can carry this, oh my god, that would be insanity. No more healing for her. So what you see is what you get. Um, Rapunz's value so far, only 600. So it looks like Henri Le Massif did most of the damage in that fight. And uh, now he's going to be uh, chasing down the Quarrelers. Trebuchet crew from Falcon still scrapping into the edge of the map. And we do have some Foot Squires intercepting the Slayers here, which is definitely pretty cost effective. You want to stay away from the Dwarf Warriors until the late game when you have support from Rapunz. Uh, the trebuchet crew, I don't think, is going to be able to get back on. But just imagine if there was, like, one trebuchet shooting right now. Holy shit. That would be pretty next level. Rapunz getting in there. She's got a great weapon. Certainly pretty good against these dwarven troops. And uh, now the foot squires and the damsel of life is back. All right. So there's a little bit of stopping power up here. The damsel's got her cane out and some angry foot squires. Look at that. Even the field trebuchet crews are coming in. If um, Falcon could re-secure a trebuchet, that would be something that would be disastrous for the dwarves. I don't know if he's going to be able to. I think the dwarves have too much stuff over here to allow that to happen. Let's see what they're saying. My axe is ready. Yeah. Your axe has been doing great this game. Henri Le Massif is going to be on the run. Falcon continuing to scrap with Rapunz. And Rapunz will uh, be doing some good damage for sure against these infantry. Up to 47 kills. The Dragonback Slayers are really hunting down Henri Le Massif, which I suppose is good for Falcon. But yeah, I don't know if Rapunz can solo all this. Yeah, and look at this. The Trebuchet crew is making a run for it. They're hustling, man. And the foot squires are wavering. Three leadership, negative three, zero. Are they going to stabilize? <clears throat> Not quite. But the Damsel of Life trying to make her way back over. Man, what a close game this has been. Holy shit. 
Amazing stuff. Win or lose, Felcon has earned the admiration of the people for his glorious repons and Henri Le Massif plays. You know, this matchup, um, <clears throat> obviously if Felcon was normal Bretonia, he'd have access to some stronger tools, uh, like Fae Enchantress, things like that. In the Everchosen, we did actually see the Dwarves get defeated by Bretonia in the Grand Finals, which was partially inspiration for me um, setting up this matchup in the first round here. Uh, Rapunz with the Sword of Lioness is active, 660. That's going to be some big splash damage, and you can actually see her and Henry are putting some serious hurt on this unit. If they had a little bit of healing support, if this damsel has an Earth Blood in her back pocket, you know, they might be able to actually trade well into that blob. And the Field Trebuchet crew running downtown is... Uh, yeah, they're being hunted, what, by how many Slayers? There's one Slayer hunting them down. Holy shit, that guy's heavy metal. And there are some Dwarf Warriors that are pretty close to breaking. Dragonback Slayers are going to be too much to handle, I think. Yeah, Henri Le Massif is getting very low on leadership. Is there any healing, though? If there is, now's the time for it. Yeah, Henri's at 5 leadership. Dragonback Slayers are starting to get some really good attacks. We'll see how this goes. The Damsel of Life is hustling. Is there going to be an Earthblood? That would be very welcome right now for Henry. He's at 700. Or Ponce is... Must have gotten some pretty good value here. And the Trebuchet is about to get back online. Now, if the Trebuchet does come back online, the play is going to be to shoot into the Dragonback Slayers. Because the rest of the Dwarf Army isn't of great quality. You know, it's mostly like chaff type stuff. But here comes the Damsel of Life. The Pegasus Knights were an interesting pick. I I'm, they did some really good burst damage on the initial impact for sure. Oh my god, but those Dragonback Slayers are so meaty, man. Alright, the Trebuchets are back online. What are they going to shoot? The Damsel of Life, you know what? Maybe she's saving up. No, she doesn't even have regrowth, so it can't be regrowth. Henri Le Massif is uh, broken now. He might be able to come back. Rapunz, does she have her AoE explosion? It looks like she doesn't, because she does usually have an AoE explosion that can do some decent damage for sure. I know, this this Slayer over here is a legend. Look at him. Just these, these like, 14 noble warriors of Bretonia being chased off the battlefield by this one mighty Mohawk. <clears throat> Pretty epic stuff. The trebuchet is ripping a couple shots into the night before it goes. Bounce of power? How is this bounce of power so even? Like, it's insane. Does Felcon have any healing? He's got to have an earth blood. He's got to have one. Henri Le Massif is back as well. But Slayers are going to cut that damsel apart so hard, man. Oh, she's going to get massacred by Slayers. <laughs> Damsels have low melee defense and low armor. So, you know, no earth blood, man. No earth blood's coming down. Rapunz is having to do this the old fashioned way. And she must have gotten some good value by now. Yeah, Trebuchet crews are singing in there and doing some work. Um, Rapunz is up to 1,200 value, so the grindy combat has been pretty generous to her. But now the Dwarf Warriors of Yumayas here have gotten on top of the Trebuchet. This game is just giving me anxiety. It's so close. But um, I think that the Slayers are going to carry it. Without the Slayers, you know, there might be a chance, actually. But 38 Dragonback Slayers, you know, an amazing unit against Rapunz, mind you. Henri Le Massif, he needs to probably cycle charge. I mean, he's allowed to right now because the Trebuchet crew is in combat, so he could if he wants to. But no, Henri Le Massif is going to be falling for the lady. And I think Felcon knows it's over. It's a hard matchup, um, you know, not having all the tools that Bretonia has. But, you know, Felcon put on an amazing show. Big props to him, man. I'm very well played to Yumayus here, scrapping this game out. It's been an amazing battle. And look at this, Rapunzel is still freaking going, dude. What a hero. Here comes the Dragonback Slayers, getting ready to pile in there. I don't think Bretonia has any other supporting elements, but you know what? Rapunzel actually wasn't... Maybe if there was a couple of Questing Knights in there. If he could have protected his Trebuchets, I think he would have won. I think if he had had, like, left, like, a Foot Squire back there, or left one Questing Knight to defend his Trebuchets, I think Felcon would have won the game. It's just the Trebuchets being pushed off like that cost him too much. Rapunzel is just cleaving Dwarves with her great weapon as she goes down here. Very, very epic finale. Yeah, she's up to 176 right now. That is that is no joke. Let's see what the players are saying. At least Rapunz was great, yeah? Rapunz actually did pretty good. Rapunz and Henry just beat the brakes off of uh, the Slayer King. There you go! <laughs> just one dwarf just gets sent flying. Very well played to both players. I would imagine that must have been a very stressful game for Yumais, having to deal with four Knights Errant, two, tre uh, two Pegasus Knights, and Trebs also shooting. Hey, we have donations from Rando Howard. Merry Christmas turned. Amazing content. Loving the faction war. Please grab uh, the nettle and do a tabletop tourney someday. Perhaps I will. Thank you so much, Rando. Been watching your streams for years. Keep up the good work. Your streams are top quality. Ben B. Means a lot, man. I'll, uh... And the quality is actually going to be getting better. Because I'm going to be introducing a stream deck and kind of amping up the quality of the stream. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and Tihon Noin with the donation. Hey, Turin. During the last Everchosen, I made an oath to pay you and Italian Spartacus some oath gold if Dawi win the match, and they did. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. 
it, it sucks because you want Chevaliers to go on, but you also want Dawi to go on. It's like two factions, right, that don't get all the love. But Henry and Rapunz didn't do bad. Trebuchets did okay. It was a shame how quickly they went down. Um, Pegasus Knights didn't do bad. Foot Squires also did good. Yeah, I think having something to defend the Trebs would have probably grabbed the game for the uh, Bretonians there. Well played, man. Felcon scrapped so hard, and so did Demise. It was an amazing match. So very well played to those two players, man. So let's go to the Faction War bracket. Alrighty. So it's going to be Dwarves versus Beastmen. That's an interesting matchup. All right, one sec. And let's get this party started. Rapunz tried her best. Well played, Felcon. A tough matchup. But, you know, if you're going to win the tournament, you know, you got to win the tough matchup sometimes. It was a... Uh, it was a... Uh, it was something. All right, so next up, let me go ahead and take a look at the bracket. We have King of the Dead versus Hadrius. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. Skaven versus Coast. Two, um, you know, factions that have both won consistent faction wars um, facing each other here in round one, which is certainly going to be fun. All I want for Christmas is a Dowie Thunder Barge. That is a, certainly a very... Uh, a very cool gift idea. All right, so Hadris and King of the Dead. Two fan favorites, top tier players. Really excited to see this one uh, play out. Start when ready. Good luck, good luck. Hadris and I were getting some pretty cool uh, games in this week. We played a... Uh... So I'm starting a new series on my channel um, where... I find folks, other play, uh, other players who play in tournaments, and I do best of fives against them. So I, I have a new best of five series starting. So, so far I played one against Gobbo Slayer, I played one against Anticity, and I played one against Hadri's last night. So there's going to be a new best of size, uh, five series coming up on the channel, so you guys can see, you know, the, the tournament grit. Coast Coast is still really strong. Coast is still really strong. Um, Hadri's and I played this matchup a couple times this week and it was back and forth like it was very even so honestly either player could win this depending on the builds and the tactics and, and engagements and all that sort of good stuff so all right so let's minimize and switch on back to the battle Hadri's versus King of the Dead let's get this party started let's have some fun a flamethrower uh, Colossus yeah certainly not a bad idea by any stretch of the imagination now, this is a very unorthodox build for King of the Dead. Holy shit. Okay. Anyways, one sec. I just got to check. One of the players in the tournament pinged me. Uh, you're next. So, we're just making a quick switch to the schedule. We're going to have Flying Taco uh, playing against Valkanos next. All right. No problem. So, let us know in chat. Do you hail the mighty? Do you rise from the deep? You about them lizard trinkets? Let us know if you are a fan of the Vampire Coast and the dreaded Luther Harkin. Or are you a child of the Horned Rat? Did you fight your way out of that breeding pit and climb your way up to the position of grace here? If you did, the Skavener for you, my friends. So let us know in chat. Are you a fan of the Skavener Vampire Coast? Mike Amarillo, if Balthazar Gelt bops you with a steel chair, does it turn gold before impact? 100%. 100%. Or the chair might have been just been gold in the first place. Hey, Felcon, your game was super entertaining, man. Big props. That was super fun. Uh, Plessy, thank you for the tenor. Legs pumped, Wasa scrumped, grudges satisfied. I love it, man. Yeah, I know. I wanted to see Bretonia win, but I also wanted to see Dwarves win. It was quite quite a painful situation. So for um, Hadri's, going with Council Guard, Clan Vulcan Tail Slashers, Clan Rat Spears, a double Sensor Bear, which are actually pretty meta against Vampire Coast. Um, sensor Bears trade very well. They kill Morngulls one-on-one. They kill Sirens. They kill zombies incredibly quick. A little bit squishy. You need to protect him, but they can do some big lifting for sure. He does also have Deathmaster Snickich as well as an Assassin backed up by some Warp Grinders, and that is pretty much it. Now, something that's going to be really interesting here on this map is that the uh, the Poison Wind Mortars can sit behind this like rock face and shoot up and over at the Vampire Coast. However, Vampire Coast has Bats and Luther and various other tools. But I have to say, this build is very different than what King usually brings. Usually King goes for like Crabs and Slostra and things like that, but we will see. All right. A couple donations coming in from Dozer Roman. Holy shit. Guys, we just got a big chungus donation from Dozer Roman of $200. Council contract issued. Poison for no furs. Slay kill point. Ears yes, yes. Also, Merry Xmas. And thank you to all the players, fans, and hosts. Dozer Roman. Let's hear a round of applause for Dozer in chat, guys. Big thank you for that, man. That is super generous, Dozer. And then also from Damien. 
the fifteen dollar donation. Thanks for the great stream this year, Turin. They've lightened up my twenty twenty. More to come, by the way. Next month we're gonna have a faction war. We're gonna be starting a new tournament, which I'm working on with some uh, collaborative um, collaborative folks in the community. And also, there's gonna be the new legendary lords faction war style tournament, in which every single legendary lord is represented in a, a probably a, a two weekend type tournament situation. But it's gonna be epic for sure. All right, guys. So the battle is underway. This is very much like. I feel like I'm watching Anticity's King of the Dead right now. Like, not... This is so strange to see King using Luther Harkin and no bombers and cannons and, like, a defensive gun line, like, like caddy back into a defensive position. It's very, very strange, man. This does not feel like... Uh, this does not feel like a King of the Dead playing. Uh, you know, and Gunbats, too. Gunbats, obviously, are quite strong. They're really good at sniping many of the squishy targets. Luther Harkin, of course, can sit overhead here and just kind of uh, shoot with impunity here. Yeah, this is weird. This is real weird. And wouldn't it be funny if, like, both Skaven and uh, Wood Elves, like, you know, two factions that, uh, got, you know, got took some damage early. Oh, man, but that Mortar hurts. Nice value there from Hadrius. He's able to nail those deck droppers and hit both those guys. And the Skaven Slave Slingers, or the Night Runner Slingers, able to force those guys back. You know, perhaps King knew that um, people were expecting a certain style of play from him. Oh, hopefully there's no disconnect here. Oh, my God, that'd be so frustrating. If there is, we would just have them restart with the same armies, and, you know, it is what it is. Come on. Push it. Okay. We're good. King of the Lag staying true to his name as uh, the Poisonwind Mortars are broken there. So that's a pretty nice catch there for Luther Harkin. Um, Skaven have some assets, I guess, to kind of poke him out of the sky. They have these Slingers and other units like that. Um, you know, the issue for King's army is that even though he's killing the Mortars here, uh, his front line will die rather quickly, probably, to the Skaven Plague Monk Sensor Bearers and different units like that. And also Deathmaster plus the Plague Priest. I mean, that's some pretty good stopping power for sure. And so now it looks like King is going after the Plague Monk Sensor Bearers, and the Skaven Slave Slingers are going to be switching their fire onto the uh, Deck Droppers here and getting some good damage. Deck Droppers definitely getting peppered, for sure. You know, Felcon, I actually played this matchup versus um, Vampire Coast the other day. I played against Intensity with Skaven, and I was able to have some pretty good success with some of the new stuff. Throughout the Unclean was really nice. Uh, maneuverable, and was able to summon Rat Ogres on top of Luther and really get some good value. Oh, look at that, and the Mortars come back, too. So the Skaven Mortars have come back. That's a really nice boon for Hadrius. I'm sure King's a little bit frustrated by that. And in uh, the last, not the last faction war, but two faction wars ago, Hadrius defeated Anticity's Vampire Coast with Skaven. So clearly there is a precedent that Skaven can succeed in this matchup. Um, even though, you know, End Coast has also been nerfed. So a couple variables have changed there. Now, the gun line here for King of the Dead isn't super strong. I think it's just gunnery mobs. Um, he does have a Carronade. Carronades won't do too much against this army. There's not really great targets here. And Luther Harkin needs to be careful to make sure that um, he's not sitting back here with, you know, your boy Luther for too long. Because otherwise, the rest of his army is going to go more or less unsupported. So the clan rats have been sent in to fight the uh, deck end mobs, and the scrapping will begin. Something else that's really cool. Ooh, nice Scorch right there, actually. Yeah, look at that one. Able to tear through some of the deck end mobs. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, as long as he has enough Winds of Magic for both Scorches and all of his summons, I suppose it should be fine. But the Plague Monk Sensor Bears are moving in now. The Vampire Coast army is a little bit distracted and, you know, even trades across the board. And look at this. Despite Luther Harkin's best efforts, the freaking Poison Wind Mortar teams are back and Hadrius keeps moving them back. And you don't need a lot of Poison Wind Mortars to do big damage. So Hadrius is going to be going for a bit of a flank overload, coming here with uh, Vulcan Tail Slashers and all these different units. And now the battle is on. Um, definitely going to be important to get all of the, uh, the Slingers and have them start attacking the... Uh, deck droppers here now something that's really interesting about gutter runners and night runners is they actually are not bad in melee combat um they can fight these scurvy dogs with relative efficiency so we'll uh, we'll see how that goes clan vulcan tail slasher is able to get around the flank the slinger core doing some great damage and killing the gun bats the deck dropper bats are going to be taking some big damage luther harkin finally was able to kill those mortars but um yeah yeah he's he's trying his best there yeah and the night runner slings also can fight against the dogs relatively efficiently here skaven slaves are piling in to fight the doggos and now the Vampire Coast flank here is going to be getting overwhelmed by the Skaven, most likely. Although Council Guard really have taken some heavy damage this game. Very, very close battle. Um, currently, Hadrius clearly is waiting on the ground here with, with the Assassin and Deathmaster, which Deathmaster is like the Hadrius special. Um, he pretty much always brings Deathmaster and can usually make it work pretty damn well. So Clan Vulcan Sail Slasher is pushing in there. Sensor Bear is also grinding in with these guys. And the Slingers are being attacked by the Doggos, which is very important because it's buying time for the... Um, for the gun bats to freely shoot at like the sensor bears and the different high value targets like that. But here comes the goon squad. Luther Arkin definitely better be careful. I would imagine Deathmaster Sigil will be going down here. Otherwise, Luther's going to get away. Yeah, is he going to use it? I mean, 
kind of, yep, there it is. I was going to say, if he doesn't get that off right now, he's going to be paying the troll toll. So here comes the double attacks. And Luther Harkin might be in a little bit of trouble here, actually. Yeah, that's that's a lot of stopping power. Here we do have some scurvy dogs pushing in to try and save Luther as he's taking some uh, relatively sizable shanks there from Deathmaster's Nickage. Here we have Skaven Slaves working their way around the flank. And so far, the Clan Rat Spears getting ready to party. And uh, Council Guard's still in decent health. These are all just pistol mobs, but Skaven are fairly lightly armored. And the Sensor Bears are being peppered pretty badly by those units. And the Assassin and Deathmaster's Nickage trying their best. Now they're on the hunch. they got to push in once again. Having done some pretty good damage against Luther, here you can see some of the nerfs of Vampire Coast starting to come into play. Luther Harkin did have a massive nerf to his ammunition. Um, he used to have like almost twice his ammunition. Now he only has two shots left, and there's no gunnery white, so it's really going to add up here. Now Hadri's is a little bit behind in the game. I think going for a gooning attempt here is the right play. Like Killing the Vampire Fleet Captain would be really, really nice and would certainly take a lot of pressure. Ooh, but the Warp Grinders might be able to come in with the Clan Rat Spears piling in and get a big snare here. That could be really, really strong. Luther actually is going for the kill, though. He's going in trying to duel Deathmaster, which may or may not pay off. Now, Hadri is able to get some Slingers back online, is peppering up into the sky, and Skaven are also pushing into the artillery pieces. So, though Vampire Coast is a little bit ahead here, I think this is where <clears throat> the game might potentially change. Deathmaster Snickage getting some huge damage on Luther, who is afflicted by the Rival Hide Talisman. The Plague Priest is broken, definitely a pretty substantial loss, but the uh, Vampire Fleet Captain is also a little bit in the danger zone as well. Um, Deathmaster plus the Assassin might be able to kill that character, we'll see. However, Luther Harkin is nearby, so you also have to respect that. Gunbats are crumbling down, and the Skaven are very, very close to compromising the Carronades. Not that the Carronades are going to be terribly impactful here. So a lot of it's going to come down to this duel. Deathmaster does break, but he'll be able to get away. And it looks like the Vampire Fleet Captain for... The Vampire Coast is broken, and the balance of power is actually ebbing back towards the center here, as the Skaven are able to get some really nice picks. Uh, will the Plague Priest come back as well? Will Deathmaster get hunted down? These are variables that <clears throat> are going to be super important here, because if Deathmaster comes back, he's still kind of healthy. And I think he will, considering that Luther Harkin is going to be going after the Plague Priest. And, oh, the Plague Priest gets punted! Slon Gold's going down as well! You almost never see that get used. Oh, and Deathmaster Snickich is back on the menu, boys. Look at that. All the gun bats are getting very, very low. Some of them crumbling. Probably going to be dissipating into ash here. This is an amazing game, man. Really, really close scrap. Very, very tight one. Luther Harkin could carry. He's out of ammo. So, you know, old Luther Harkin would have been sitting up in the air and shooting these Skaven characters, and they would have been dead by now. But the nerfed Luther Harkin, who obviously uh, costs a little bit more as well, um, isn't going to be able to get the value quite as easily. Now, he is going for the kill on Deathmaster. Deathmaster does get knocked over. Um, the Assassin is nearby. And the Deathmaster Sigil is used. And the Assassin going in for the kill as well. Assassin's Trophy. Going to be quite nice. And the Assassin and Deathmaster might be able to get some good attacks. Although, I think Hadrius will be a little bit more careful with his rat here and just leave the Assassin to fight. A couple Skaven Slaves in the backfield could potentially come and compromise that Carronade, which somehow is still going. Clan Vulcan Tail Slashers definitely need to get over there as well and start pressing in. And, uh, yeah, you know, look at that. Luther Harkin taking some big damage. Man, neither player here wants to lose this game, dude. This is such a serious scrap. Oh, and Deathmaster comes in and gets a huge shank on Luther Harkin as he's trying to get away. And Luther, like I said, no more ammo. And Hadrius actually pulls ahead on the bounce of power. Holy shit, this is an amazing scrap. The gun bat's going for the snipe here on Deathmaster. A very, very good play. Um, he's definitely a prime target. But the Plague Priest is back, and it's able to drop some summons against the gunnery mobs as well as the Carronade. And Luther Harkin is on the run. Man, this is such a different build than I expected from King. I expected, like, Solastra and, you know, that type of pressure. But, um, yeah, this is this has been a back-and-forth just nail-biter. Because for some time, Hadrius was behind on the bouts of power. And still could potentially lose the game if Luther is able to go ape shit. Yeah, he gets a nice charge there in Deathmaster. But um, there's a lot of Skaven nearby. The Skaven Assassin is still a great tool against him. There's a Warp Grinder. A fair amount of Skaven Slave Nightrunner Slingers. You know, or Nightrunner Slingers. They'll be pretty good at poking Luther as well. And um, Vampire Coast, I think, is on death's bed. Um, if we look around, they have some halberds, they have some gunnery mobs. The two cannons are the only reason why they're in the balance of power still, more or less. And I think those things might get compromised here. Some really good cycle charging from Luther. So Deathmaster did get crumped. Um, now the Assassin might get crumped as well, which could actually turn the tide back into the favor of Vampire Coast here. But there are Council Guard. Yeah, Council Guard here is huge. Look at that. Nice Warp Quake. So it locks down Luther Harkin, but it doesn't only just lock him down. It locks him down amongst the Council Guard. And Council Guard with their halberds are going to be shanking Luther pretty well. And you can see he immediately takes a couple hundred damage. And uh, 
That was his attack animation, moving him in. Oh, Deathmaster's coming in. Will the contract be fulfilled? He comes in with the shank, and does he get the attack? It looks like they're in an epic duel of sorts. He's very, very low leadership. He's wavering, but before he goes, it looks like he does do a little bit of damage. And uh, Luther Harkin, man, he's, he's in trouble. The other assassin is coming as well. Both Karenades, though, have stabilized, and the Skaven army is looking very worse for wear back here as well. If Luther Harkin could maybe kill this assassin somehow, but still the Council Guard, there's no summons. Luther Harkin is taking pebbles to the face in every direction. The Haggard Slingers are just peppering him down. He does get back up in the sky, but every second he's inactive, he's going to be crumbling. I think his final uh, death thrust here is going to be to go after the Plague Priest, the Pedries. Holy shit, what a good game! What a good game! And down goes the dreaded Luther Harkin, and so with it, the hopes of the Vampire Coast. What a great game. Holy shit, guys. That was amazing. An outstanding scrap. I thought Hadrius was in trouble. He came back. He stayed in it. He didn't give up. That's what I like to see, man. That was such a good game. King Agisol. Thank you for the donation. Thanks for all the content. Wish I could give more. Dude, please. I really appreciate that. I, uh, I appreciate that quite a bit, man. Holy shit. What a game. Deathmaster with 2000. Assassin 1600. Sensor Bears. The Sensor Bears got shit on, but that's because King didn't bring a build they were good against. A lot of Vampire Coast players do, like, kind of Morngulls and Monsters and things like that. Um, but the Slingers, yeah, great value on them. They were able to kind of pepper across the board. That was a, that was a true scrap. Well played. Trays in the Infinite. My vaults are indeed infinite and filled with weird and wonderful artifacts and riches. My wallet sadly is not. Thank you for the 20, man. Trazen, yes, you and your uh, your Necron vaults. I really do appreciate that, man. Hopefully you enjoyed that game, because I certainly did. All right, so let's go ahead. Update the brackets. Hadrius is going to be advancing on after narrowly escaping King of the Dead here in round one. So let's go to the Faction War bracket. It's going to be Hadrius facing uh, the winner of Gabo Slayer and Faust. But we're going to be jumping ahead in our schedule and doing Flying Taco and Balkanos first because of some time constraints the players have. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, GG, well played. King says, that was a good game. Didn't think it would be that close because I haven't played Vampire Coast in a while. Yeah. It, it, it was a great game. A great game, man. Well played, King. I'm sure we'll be seeing you back as your beloved uh, Tomb Kings here at some point. All right. So now we have Flying Taco on Tomb Kings. Facing off against Valkanos on Norska. Should be a fun matchup. I always like watching Norska versus, uh, versus these lads. So it's uh, Flying Taco and Valkanos. Valkanos is like, time to bust some brackets, boys. I love it, man. Get the hype train going. All right. Let's do it. Let's have some fun. Let's party. Flying Taco, of course, the most recent ECL season champion. Also competed in the Ever Chosen and, uh, you know, had some really good games. All brackets guessed correctly so far. Ooh, Optimus Pine, you've guessed them all correctly. Very nice. So again, we do have the uh, Match Madness going right now, which is essentially a March Madness here in this game. So uh, folks in the Discord, and again, if any of you guys want to participate in the future, uh, we'll drop links to our Discord here in chat. But they are guessing the bracket and predicting. And if they get it right, the person who gets it the closest is going to be winning a $50 prize. So, um, yeah, just a little fun thing to kind of get people uh, hyped about it. Seeing King of the Dead and Falcon knocked out early. Yeah, you know, but they were playing. They were playing in... Uh, I mean, King of the Dead versus Hadrius could have gone either way. Um, I feel like Skaven versus Coast is a very even matchup now. But um, Falcon definitely had a hard matchup. Plus, he, he was forced to play with Rapunz. So, you know, that was uh, definitely going to be a scrappy one. Hey, Grim Soka, I've been very well. I hope you're doing well. Yes. Give me Tomb Kings next time instead of this levitating burrito or whatever he is called. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, King, uh, hang hang around for a minute, King. There was potentially a small chance that uh, Flying Taco might have some family stuff coming up. And if that's the case, we might need a substitute for the Tomb King. So hang around for a little bit if you don't mind. All right. And then you could potentially uh, go from there, but we'll see how this goes. It's match madness. Yes, levitating burrito. Yeah, a big a bigger map would have helped Felcon, but then the dwarves might have brought cannons too, although trebuchets and cannons, yeah, I think the trebs actually don't do badly there, which is funny. So for the build here of Flying Taco, oh, the double dreaded boner giant. Oh, dude, look at this. Holy shit. 
Double Bone Giant, High Queen Kalita, Ushapti, Ushapti Grapos, Double Screaming Skull Catapult, Triple, as well as a Light Wizard. But he doesn't even bring uh, Nets. He brought Faz Protection and Banishment. This feels like a meme build. I don't know if it is. Maybe it's something he schemed that works very well. But um, we will see. So for the Norskins, we got Marauders. We do also have more Marauders. A bunch of Javelins in the back for Valkanos. Berserkers on the flank. And Condom Wolves here to pressure in as well. With double Manticore. And Wolfric, who appears to be on horseback with a double Firecaster? So he's got Burning Head and Fireball. But it looks like he brings the Bale Fiends just to get some extra armor piercing. Yeah. We'll see. <coughs> I'm too weak head again. The water went down the wrong pipe. Give me a second, guys. All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I'm surviving. So the Boner Giants. Let's go ahead and take inventory of what they're going to be shooting. Now, one Bone Giant ripping a fat shot downtown going after the Bale Fiend, I would imagine. Looks like a miss. But the Screaming Skull Catapult's definitely doing some uh, tickling damage here against the Marauder Javelins of Valkanos. Kalita is going to be standing near the Bone Giants, obviously, to give some missile buffs. Now, it looks like he didn't even bring the missile buff, so no, just kind of standing there out of circumstance. Fireball going downtown. Going to be trying to snipe the Screaming Skull Catapult. And it looks like it does kill one of the Catapult pieces. Definitely a nice start. And, of course, Skeleton Spearman. Going to be a little bit uh, hard-pressed to defend. It. Not only the Skin Wolf flank, plus the Marauders. I feel like it's going to be hard. This, I, I guess this position probably is just going to be lost. Manticore is jumping in from Valkanos. Going to be going after the Screaming Skull Catapults and immediately kill one of those bad boys. But the Bone Giants. The Bone Giants have done some decent damage to Skin Wolves, and the Catapults are doing some okay damage against the Marauder Hunters in conjunction with a little bit of a Banishment attempt back there, but losing a Screaming Skull Catapult this early um, definitely hurts. And this other one's probably going to be shut down for now. Kalita does get freaking Faw's Protection and tries to fight a Manticore, but the Manticore is probably just going to dip out, but pulling Kalita to attack this Manticore here could certainly be a very, very good play, but... So far, it's looking pretty grim for the Tomb Kings, to be honest. Um, I feel like their positions are being compromised rather quickly. Maybe using this choke here and just having kind of a shield wall might have worked. But yeah, this catapult's going to die. These spearmen are going to die 100%. Although Kalita comes in and gets a really nice pick. Kalita actually countercharges that Feral Manticore. And um, yeah, neutralizes that threat really, really quickly with some of the spears. So Kalita really not messing about. And the Bone Giants are still good. You know, both Boner Giants are still ripping some shots. Picking off Skin Wolf models, it looks like there's only 13 left. Uh, I would imagine the Lich Priest and the Skeleton Spearman could probably head those guys off right now. Kalita continuing to try and take out the Manticores, but now a second Catapult's going to be going down. The Bone Giants are definitely ripping some fat ones. I guess get double Bone Giant and try and snipe the Manticore. Yeah, it looks like they're still going after the Skin Wolves, actually. We do have some Ushapti units falling back at this point. Ushapti going to be piling into the back of the Skin Wolves, which, uh, you know, it's just for a leadership break, really. And the Condom Wolves are broken. Might actually run off the edge of the battlefield. It is a pretty small map. Well, it's... We'll see. We'll see if they come back. Now, Bone Giants are still giants. Um, you still have to deal with those guys in the late game. So if there is, you know, a fair amount of spears and maybe some Ushapti and monstrous support, uh, it could be a bit of a problem. It looks like in the back, the Ushapti summoned from the Flying Taco was summoned here. And uh, they're probably going to be attacking into the Marauder Hunter Javelins, I would imagine. And this Bone Giant definitely wants to get back. He does not want to be standing in combat with a Bale Fiend. Screaming Skull Catapult, ripping a couple shots here into the fourth quarter of the game. Balance Fire is pretty even. Kalita might actually be able to carry this. Kalita now is going to duel Wolfric, and Kalita is beating the hell out of Wolfric, man. Now she's going to be surfing away on her snake as the Bone Giants have resumed firing onto Wolfric the Wanderer. Holy shit, this would be a crazy, crazy situation if High Queen Kalita were able to uh, carry this one into the sunset. Antonius, thank you for the donation. Loving the content? Hey, man. Appreciate you. Hopefully you're enjoying these glorious, glorious faction war battles as much as I am. So the double bone giant's a little bit obstructed. Wolfric is very low, as are both the Manticores. Oh my god, the Manticores are kind of lined up right now. Imagine if the Manticores got like two for one by the uh, the bone giant shots. Khalid is coming back here, trying to support the Skeleton Spears, and has been a really, really efficient assassin this entire game. You can see here, she's taking out the Bale Fiend. She's, you know, punished Wolfric. But, you know, the critical mass of just, of, uh, of Norskin units might be too much, despite the fact that there's been some beautiful sniping this game. I would have really liked to see Nets of Damage Hawk too on that Lich Priest. Oh, and the Bone Giant it misses. It looks like the double Manticores are going to be going after the Lich Priest here. Kalita able to just outright shatter that Bale Fiend. Man, Kalita has been a monster this game. She's just been on the hunt doing so much work. The Fireball going into the Bone Giant. Here comes one shot going downtown. Oh, oh, where's it going? And it misses. I think that was a miss. I'm not sure what it was shooting. Maybe it was shooting the Skin Wolves there. Can't quite tell. There are some Ushapti Great Bows as well. Ushapti Great Bows able to break off the Skin Wolves, it looks like. And Kalita is uh, very encompassed here in this blob fight. The Bone Giant's trying to shoot the Manticores, and it looks like one of the Manticores is nailed by the Bone Giant. 
and actually breaks almost immediately. So now there's just one Manticore going after the uh, the, the uh, Lich Priest here. Probably the best play for the Chaka would be to put the Bone Giants in uh, guard mode and force shoot them after the Manticores or some of those other threats. This game is actually really close. <clears throat> like so many of the monsters and characters are being sniped by the double Boner Giant. It almost makes me think that if he had just, like, cut the catapults and gotten something, like, durable in the front line with the two Bone Giants, <clears throat> that it would have done the trick, but who knows. And Kalita, once again, beating the brakes off Wolfric. Wolfric just getting dominated by the Snake Lady. And it looks like there's going to be a Banishment coming down here as well. Kalita is going Super Saiyan. I'm really eager to see her uh, value at the end of the game. Nice little Banishment going down there. Does get a decent rotation going through some of the Marauders. And now the Bone Giants are marauding across the battlefield trying to get on top of Wolfric while the other Ushapti create distance from the infantry uh, perhaps preparing to get some volley fire oh my god if the Tomb Kings win this game that's just going to be freaking absurd dude there's no way Kalita is just dominating and like Wolfric's on the run right now there are some javelins online for Valkanos which is quite nice Berserkers as well and a really really good pick here by Norska they're able to actually pick off that Lich Priest and the, the Manscore Pimp Closet right in the face uh, the Bone Giant's very low though Where's the other Bone Giant? Is one of the Bone Giants dead? Looks like it. Yeah, I think there's only one Boner Giant left. Norska is pulling ahead in the Bounce of Power, but I have to say Flying Taco giving us a really glorious uh, showcase here, despite the fact... Oh, and the Bone Giant! It looks like it got interrupted there in the fourth quarter. Kalita's very damaged. I mean, maybe Kalita can get away and go kill Wolfric, which I think would give us a very... Oh, and the Bone Giant! Oh, and Wolfric gets domed off his horse! Oh my god! So here comes the Manticore going in for the kill. Is Kalita going to be able to get in there and save it? Yeah, I don't think so. I think the uh, the Bone Giant's going to die. Negative 38. Probably going to start suffering some serious crumbling right now. There's still a lot of Norskin troops. They're shaken. Um, the Ushapti Grapos are kiting around the map, which is quite funny. I love this build from the Chaco, though. And obviously, he has the Bone Giant guard mode, and is just kind of ripping shots up into the Manticore when he can. It's actually wavering, mind you. If Kalita had her AoE explosion, the poison explosion, she might be able to win this, actually. But without that, I don't think... Uh... You know what, Arez? So Arez in chat asks, do you think Kalita could become viable? You know what was interesting is in the Everchosen, we saw Fistech use Kalita uh, to defeat the Vampire Counts pretty effectively. So, you know, apparently there's already some precedence for Kalita doing well. So uh, Army Loss is kicking in for the Tomb Kings, but I have to say, though the Flying Taco has fallen, he may have won the hearts and minds of the people with that glorious Bone Giant and triple Screaming Skull Catapult build. Boom headshot... But Valkanos is going to be advancing on. Holy shit. That was so good. I enjoyed that game. <laughs> Boom headshot. Kalita. 3,500 gold on Kalita. Dozer Roman. That one's for you, brother, and your generous donation. 3,500 on that. Hot damn. That's probably the most of anything in the game. Yeah, hands down. Kalita just went ape shit. Like, if he cut the catapults and just got, like, Ushapti and, like, and just camped with the Bone Giants and the Great Bows, he probably would have won the game, like, pretty easily. But, you know, he had to go balls deep in the meme, and, uh, you know, quite a platform to do it on here, guys. Holy shit. Ben? Ben the Barman is 6-0 and in his bracket. Very nice. <laughs> King of the Dead's all sad. He's like, I wanted to play Tomb Kings. Kalita was a monster. The Bone Giants did good, too, more or less. I mean, one of them did better than the other, but, um... Catapults didn't do so hot. They got crumped. Great Bows obviously did great. And Valkanos, you know, he weathered the storm, man. He took some sniping and uh, got in there and grinded it out. Well played to him. Faction War Bracket. It's going to be Valkanos here. Facing the winner of Guac and Tank. So next up we have Faust versus the Gabo Slayer. That's going to be Empire facing off against Lizardmen. So let's go ahead and get that party started. Dude, Kalita went ape that game. Like, ape. All right, so let's find the next match. And one, two, three. That was beautiful. Wolfric getting like pelted off his horse by that bone giant shaft was like one of the most glorious moments we've had. Yeah. All right, Faust is on the left. Falconos, well played, man. That was a really fun match to watch. Gabo Slayer. All right, perfect. I love bone giants. I used to use double bone giant against Gaven, actually. It was, it was, it was really fun. All right. Good luck, good luck. So next match is going to be the Sons of Sigmar. <laughs> and Gabo Slayer has changed his name to Gabarino Slayer Son. Oh my god, I love Faust's build so much. Holy shit, it looks fun. I can see him in the loading screen here, or in the uh, pregame screen. Yeah, I was really impressed by Kalita too. 
Is there an ETA for the Legendary Lord Tournament? Not yet. It'll be like mid-January. Maybe end of January. Yeah. It's a ways off. Oh my god. This is, uh, this is gonna be interesting. Sons of Sigmar versus the Lizard People. It's actually a DLC battle as well. Empire vs. Lizard Men is something that, uh, we've seen in the past. Alright, so let's go ahead and uh, jump into the battle. Alright, so we got Faust vs. Gobbo Slayer. Let me go ahead and fix Gobbo Slayer's name on the nameplate because it is quite long. Powerful. And then we're into the game. Alright, my friends. So here is the Armies of Sigmar. And I have one thing to say to you, my friends. Welcome to Astalia, gentlemen. Your chances of survival. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know the rest. It's Balthazar Gelt. So Gelt has come in. Looks like he's going to be using maybe some Plague of Rust to wear down some big dinos. Who the hell knows? But Balthazar Gelt is in the house, ladies and gentlemen. And he's going to be coming in with Final Transmutation as well as his uh, Arcane Conduit and his Staff of Valance. Which should be good. Empire Knights backed up by Double Demogriff Knight. We do have a great cannon on the hill here and one back here. And for the main battle line, it's going to be Spearmen and a couple with Shields. So, um, yeah. Pretty standard stuff in that respect. Double Demi Hammer, Balthazar Geltman, welcome to Astalia. Let's do it. Sons of Sigmar, raise up in chat. If you have access to the emojis, let us know. The Franz is here to represent. If you're an Empire fan, let us know. And for the Lizard people, the children of the Old Ones, we have Chameleon Skinks into the Sunset, three of those bad boys. We have a couple Skink Cohorts, Double Solar Engine, which I think the Double Cannons will trade pretty well against. But nonetheless, Double Solar Engine is pretty strong. We do have a couple cohorts in the back. Flyers up in the air. Pterodon Riders are the skirmish cav, basically, of the lizards and can certainly do some good rock drops and disruption. You have Cold One Riders, Cold One Riders, and more Cold One Riders. And for the lore choice, it is going to be a Croxgore Ancient, backed up by what caster? Looks like a Manticore Summoner. All right. Should be fun, guys. You're rooting for the lizards or the Empire. It's pretty hard to root against Balthazar Gelt. You know, you don't see him terribly often. But, uh... The train is, is fine for the cannons, to be honest. It, you just put the cannon up on the hill, and it can draw line of sight. Like, there's no... It's not going to have any obstruction issues, unless the target is, like, right here on the top of the hill. Other cannon also has pretty good line of sight, if you want to zoom down and check. And if you guys are new to the game in multiplayer, um, cannons have a little bit of an arc of fire. They shoot, like, up, but they can't go, like, super high. But this should be fine. They should be able to draw line of sight and get some... Uh, and get the business going. Yeah. Wesley uh, Chartrand. For Sotek, thanks for the high-quality streams during this crazy year turn. How's the hand? Hand's doing good. A little bit stiff, but I've been able to play in uh, Swiss tournaments lately and uh, also get a lot of good best-of-five games in, so it, it's doing good. Will the great plan prevail, or will Sigmar bless this battlefield? Will, Gol will Gelt's blessed golden hand rest upon the lizards? We shall find out. Wesley, again, thank you for the uh, donation, my friend. Turn the lizards to gold? Well, it could happen. Start when ready. No need to wait. I have no predictions, really. I think the Great Cannons are going to be a super useful tool against the Bastilodons. And if you're really looking at it in like a rock, paper, scissors perspective, I mean, Great Cannons will counter the Bastilodons. And I guess a lot of it will come down to the cavalry fights. Like, how well are the Demogriffs able to get good engagements on the Golden Riders and things like that? Are they going to be mucked up by Red Crescent Skinks? There's just so many variables. Allegeron, thank you for the tenor. Welcome to Astalia. We're here, man. I should have had them fight on the Astalian team. That would have been very thematic. I'm sure Faust would have still picked Gelt too. Which is pretty awesome. What I like too is Gelt is just so manly that he's he's riding on horseback here. He's like riding with his Demogriff Knights. So he's got double Demi. No Altar of Griffites. And these... Oh, he does have them triple Demi. Holy shit. Yeah, he's pretty heavy metal into the Demogriff Knights here, guys. This is no joke. I'm so excited. I gotta have some water. So... The Bastilodon with the solar engine getting blasted by the cannons as we kind of anticipated. Looks like this cannon is uh, still shooting. And holy shit, this is a big blob. I wonder if he's going to force a blob fight. Like try and bait the lizards into a big fight thinking they have a good engagement and then respond with like a final transmutation or something. You know, that could be the direction he's going here. A little bit hard to tell. Gelt Daddy himself, you know, not the most powerful combatant, but he actually has 38 melee defense, which is, you know, relatively high for kind of a caster wizard type. Here, the swordsman going to be taking the initial poke here from the lizards and the empire really pushing the envelope here in this flank. Looks like they're going to be trying to force the lizards into some sort of a, a pit fight here. 
Now the two Empire Great Cannons still shooting pretty effectively. There's not too much defending them back there, though. So maybe you're going to want to send, like, one Empire Knight back there or something. Just so the... Uh... Oh, look at that. Did you guys see that? The Bastilodon shot. The Croxagor Ancient in the back. Classic stuff. And yeah, honestly, um, the Solar Engines will do some pretty good damage against the Empire Cavalry. Here comes a little bit of a tickling pickle charge here on the skin cohorts. They get rode down pretty badly by the Empire Knights, which are now going to be countercharged and probably take some casualties from the Golden Riders and the Croxagor Ancient. With his uh, spinning attacks, they get terrified and broken almost instantly. But now the Demogriff Knights are going to be countercharging. Faust is going to be going in pretty hard here. And probably not a bad fight at all, especially considering... Oh, is he going to be... Oh, he canceled it. Okay. It looks like Gelt was going to be doing a final transmutation there, but I don't think he had everything he wanted in that range. Manticore Summon coming down, going to be attacking the Demogriff Knights in the back, but a big, thick, overcasted final transmutation is going to be nailing all of these units. It hits the Croxcore Ancient, it hits the Bastilodon, hits the Cohort, hits pretty much everything there, and you can see the Coldrum Riders are immediately broken by the Wrath of Balthazar Gelt. But just like we talked about in the backfield, there wasn't enough to defend the cannons, and losing two great cannons to just some haggard Pterodon Riders in the early game, definitely really, really painful. Because now, the Lizards have the ranged advantage. Yes, the Empire may have gotten a pretty good engagement there, but I think the cannons going down is a huge, huge misplay. All you really had to do is leave one, maybe, Demogriff Knight back here to kind of sweep and clean those guys up, and the great cannons would still be shooting and most likely killing that Bastilodon with the solar engine. And now the blob fight looks to be going better for the Lizards. They do counterpunch really effectively. The Colden Riders come in and uh, are able to get some huge damage. The Demogriff Knight Hammer is rotating about, but they're taking Solar Engine shots, and each shot is like killing one of the models. And now they re-engage into the blob fight with inferior numbers and probably very little magic support. So Empire Knights appear to be pushing in, trying to go after the Bastilodon with the Solar Engine, or maybe some Skinks in the backfield, Swordsmen and Spearmen moving in as well. And both players really, really leaning very heavily into this fight. Um, Staff of Valons, as well as Arcane Conduit, I think, going down there. Or maybe just Arcane Conduit. And Earthblood as well. I don't know about the Winds of Magic situation. I don't know if there's going to be enough to um, get another big final transmutation. And I think the Empire is in some huge, huge trouble, having lost both of their great cannons in the back. That is an extremely painful loss. All the while, you know, these uh, freaking laser dinos are just... <laughs> these sharks with lasers on their heads. That reminds me of uh, Austin Powers. Those are some, some fun times. Demogriff Knight Goon Squad, though, still could get back in this game. I mean, if they're able to kill these Solar Engines, they might be able to pull some Miracles off, especially with a late-game final transmutation from Gelt. But if they keep getting blasted by Solar Engines, this game's just going to be over. And, you know, the problem is, is even if the Empire Goon Squad is able to get on top of the Solar Engine, there's still, like, a ton of Skinks poking them, which it's not a ton of burst damage, but that shit adds up, man, and that's no joke. So, um, we will see. Balthazar Gelt moving in once again, trying to support his Empire Knights and his Royal Altar of Griffites. But uh, the Crocs were ancient, standing quite firm while the solar engines continue to cackle and just do some brutal, brutal damage. And yeah, I think the Lizards are in a pretty commanding position. Um, both Pterodons are going to be coming back here. The Empire very light in the way of troops in the battlefield. Um, many of their state troopers are getting worn down by just, you know, cycle charging from Colden Riders and also just these King Cohorts. Nice little uh, engagement here for the Empire, though. Able to get some Colden Spear Riders and now maybe able to bounce out and kill the solar engine. He needs to kill them, man. These things are just wrecking him. Every shot the Solar Engine does is more or less killing a Demogriff Knight model. And you can see also the Royal Altar of Griffites are getting peppered really, really badly by the Chameleon's Kings. And yep, another shot right there, right in the back. Another two Demogriff Knights go down there. Ouch, that hurts. But Faust is killing the mobility. Um, there's not much in the way of Lizard Cav left. If I look around the battlefield, I see some Empire Knights, maybe some Coldwind Riders, and I suppose some Pterodon Riders. But yeah, for the most part. Oh, Solar Engine, a little bit of friendly fire. Pretty uh, classic stuff. Now he appears to be riding down the skink cohorts, ignoring the uh, Bastilodon and the solar engine here, which maybe he could just leave like one Demogriff Knight to kind of work that guy down because that is so much damage. And a nice Manticore summon coming down from Goblet Slayer 2 is going to be uh, attacking into the uh, Empire boys here. It's time to leave Astalia, gentlemen. You know, there is another final transmutation here for sure. Um, I wonder if he's going to use it to try and kill the... Croxcore Ancient. Really nice Amulet of Itzel going down. No, but it looks like he's using Earthbloods instead of using them to uh, to do the final transmutation. It's really Winds of Magic intensive. Granted, Gelt does give you a shit ton of Winds of Magic, but yeah, look at that Croxcore Ancient just tanking like an absolute champion. Despite the fact that the Solar Engines have probably done a fair amount of friendly fire this game as well, that Croxcore Ancient is still tanking like a champion, and Gelt is going to be leaving Astalia. That is indeed true, as uh, I'm sure he'll be fleeing the battlefield, going back to the College of Magic and uh, blaming his cavalry for not defending his uh, Great Cannons, which the Great Cannons would have killed the Solar Engines, 100%. Um, that was what lost him the game, in my humble opinion. The Friendly Fire is hilarious. I know, Lizardmen are just so about that, man. They do so much Friendly Fire. So well played. The Gabo Slayer will be advancing on, sending Gelt packing back to Astalia. 
the Sons of Sigmar back to the drawing board, but Faust, truly a hero of the people, uh, an amazing game. Um, you know, he brought Gelt, he went out like a true man. And Gelt, you know, 1100 value, not bad, but yeah, losing the Great Cannons was just too much. Um, because then the Solar Engines just ravaged his army, and the Demis and Heavy Cavalry got dragged through Poison and Cohort of Sotek and just all this chaff and things like that. And um, that was the end of the road. Well played to both players. A salute to Faust, to those who have fallen. And now we can go to the bracket and update this bad boy. And next up, we have Vampire Counts versus Bretonia, the classic duel of duels, which uh, I always enjoy. Watching and casting, seeing those Blood Knights fighting Grail Knights is something that is uh, quite a magical experience. So let's go ahead and get this party started. GG, well played. Faust dropping the GGs to his opponent. Good stuff. The lizard people. Let's not have to go to Astalia. Tis a silly place. I know, it's pretty funny. All right. So we got Guac versus Tank. Let's do it. Skaven versus Lizardmen. Who can shoot themselves faster? I know. It's pretty funny. We have a donation coming in from Sean. Sean on my phone. Merry Xmas turn. Any thoughts on what Belagar needs to do to see more play? Um, honestly, the problem with Belagar is that he's cheap, and I think there might be a couple situations in which he's pretty good. Um, but Grom Brindle is just so much better, and so is Ungram. They're both like unbreakable, you know, much better against monsters. Grom Brindle has like an amazing AoE slow. It's just like he's just outclassed, sadly, um, in my humble opi humble opinion. Uh, let me see. So Guac is on the left-hand side. I'll update these scorecards here in just a second. So this is going to be Bretonia versus Vampire Counts. Um, in my opinion, a pretty even matchup. A very, very fun one. Um, so I'm curious to see what is going to be going down here. You're a lizard, Harry. Oh, did I move the Empire up? My apologies. Okay. It's just my subconscious, my Empire bias, because they're one of my main factions. Why did I do that? It's weird. For some reason, I thought Faust was like my brain just got it all backwards there. All right, so we have Guac and Tank. <laughs> I'm paid off by Faust. I love it, dudes. All right. Let's make sure we're loading into the proper battle screen now. Hiya! Got to make Tank's name a little bit bigger. There we go. Give him a little bit more oomph here on the uh, scoreboard. All right, my friends. <laughs> You're a Sith, Frodo. <laughs> Empire politics at play, for sure. Tournament is fixed. Confirmed. So for Guac, he's got a Peasant Mob front line. He's going to be coming in with the Peasant Bowman with the Pox Arrows to apply some, oh, a little bit of fire as well against, like, Vargolfs and monsters like that. And a big old erect cav course. It's going to be Grail Knights, baby, and Questing Knights. Elite cav with Grail Guardians mixed in. Talk dirty. This is what Bretonia is all about. And it's going to be Fae and Double Paladin. So let us know in chat, my friends. Are you here for the lady? If you are, let it be known. And now for the glorious Vampire Counts, who shall be led by Tank of Clan VM. Definitely a, a very well-known Vampire Count specialist. And, you know, not one to really meme. Oh my god. Helmand Gorst is here, baby. Oh, with Winds of Death. Oh man, that, that was almost enough to get quite a reaction out of me there. I, I'm half chub right now. This is uh, pretty awesome. So Helmand Gorst, double Vargulf, no Blood Knights, really, except I think just one in the back. No, is he still? Wow. How did he afford all this? Double Vargulf. Well, I guess his arm, his infantry is pretty crappy. Okay, double Blood Knight, Black Knights, Bats, Gorst, double White King with double Vargulf. Dude, this is a metal build. Oh, guys. It's Helmand Gorst against the Fane Chantress. Helmand Gorst. Dude. If you're a fan of the Gorst Man, if you're a Gorst Man like myself, let us know in chat. Who are you guys pulling for? Tank or Guac? Guac, of course, had a, a very good run in the Everchosen qualifiers and did end up playing in the Everchosen after qualifying in one of the big qualifiers. And uh, Tank, of course, is a veteran of many tournaments and has done very well in Faction Wars in the past with Vampire Counts and is probably known to be one of the better Vampire Count players in the community. So there you go. Dude, how can you not want Helm and Gorst to get in there and have some fun? Hey, Mike Coxmall, love the stream. <laughs> yeah, he got a nerf? No, he, he had to play Raponce is, is what it was. Thank you so much, Mike, for the donation. Uh, Nermi the Nerm, thank you for the $20 donation. He says, can we expect you to play King Chungus if he appears in Warhammer 3? I will always play Chungus characters, so yes, you can uh, you can expect that. Thank you so much, Nermi, for the uh, donation. Ghost. Yeah, he always says it like super, 
You know, you know, people make fun of Gorst, but he's actually a really cheap Mortis engine. And if the Bretonian do come into Blob fight, it's going to be Mortis on Mortis. Uh, and the Vampire Counts, I think, have the advantage in the Mortis fight. So, um, yeah, Gorst, Gorst costs like 900 gold. Elmin Gorst, everybody in chat's just yelling it. Oh, my God. Shetland Apache saying the lady wills it. She does. And Guac is an amazing Bretonian player, too. Ooh, look at that from Tank, though. Holy shit. The Scabscrath value, man. One Scabscrath getting one unit. But Guac, really good reaction by Guac. He sees it happen. He guesses which one it's going to go on. And he dodges the second one. That was a thing of beauty right there. Now, the White Kings are on foot. <clears throat> which is going to make them pretty durable against, like, the Paladins and the Unicorns and these different characters. But we'll see what kind of damage that White King ends up taking here. So... Bretonia just really posturing very conservatively with their heavy cavalry, now pulling back their uh, goon squad and letting the peasant mobs take the initial beating. Here we have Grail Knights. Ooh, this could hurt this Vargulf pretty bad. Grail Knights got their lances couched. Probably the first time in history that we've seen the Grail Knights come to the aid of uh, Bretonian peasants who are in distress. Usually the peasants would just get massacred and then the knights would come in and, uh, and clean up here. You are the one who makes fun of Helmand Gorst. Oh, for sure, get at me, 100%. Helmand Gorst. <laughs> He's here. So the battle is underway. The Mortis Engine effects going down from the Fey Enchantress. Going to be nailing this entire blob. But Helm and Gorst and his bros are going to be moving their way in here. And uh, yeah, we'll see what kind of stuff they can do. We'll see what kind of draining Helm and Gorst can get in this battle. The bad boy is going to be moving forward. And uh, that'll be really good against the elite Bretonian Knights. Yeah. Oh, did I fall for something? Yeah, I probably did. I always fall for like... Oh, Mike got me. Mike got me again. How dare you? Guys are out of control. <clears throat> now, Black Knights here are getting punished pretty badly. Blood Knights are a little bit safer, kind of behind spear lines and different things like this. But uh, for the most part, Fane Chancellor's Drain is doing quite well in this engagement. Now there's going to be the Companions coming in for a rear charge here. A very much Battle of the Bastards. The Vampire Counts, of course, being the ones uh, getting surrounded. So I suppose the forces of the Starks and their, their alliance of uh, wildlings in the north. But it's draining on draining, guys. Not much to say in terms of tactical analysis other than Helm and Gorse is draining this side of the battle and Fae Enchantress is draining this side. Keeping the archers alive is going to be quite important. If the uh, Peasant Bowmen and the Fire Arrows can come back and just sit and shoot at Helm and Gorse and the Vargulfs, that's going to be some pretty big value. Grail Knights are buffed up by favor of the Fae, and also uh, it looks like an Earthblood was going down as well to heal up those units. Fae Enchantress, of course, does have access to some dank healing Earthblood and regrowth. Would you? Peasant Bowmen are sa uh, salvaged here, so we have some Peasant Bowmen here. Looks like we have some fire arrows here, and honestly, this could be the deciding factor. These peasant bowmen shooting into Helm and Gorse in the blob, I think is going to be very strong. Fane Chantress also needs to make sure she gets into the blob fight, because by sitting out here, the Fane Chantress isn't draining anything, whereas the entire uh, Bretonian army is basically being drained by tanks Helm and Gorst. <clears throat> On the far side, peasant bowmen are nailed by another scab's grave, and those guys are going to be getting pushed off, but you know what, guys? It looks like the vampire counts are winning this blob fight. Um... Yeah, the, the Paladin here is getting beaten on by the double Vargulfs. Helm and Gorse is just going balls deep into this army. Like, he's draining everything, and the Grail Knights are getting trapped by the drain. And, uh, yeah, I guess the Bretonians still do have some ranged tools. They still have some Peasant Bowmen, but it looks like Tank is going to be sending in some Felbats he had in reserve and probably will be able to finish off those Peasant Bowmen. Now, the Blob Fight continues. Helm and Gorse, though, seems to be in a relatively dominant position in the Blob Fight, and I think the Vampire Counts are pulling ahead in this game. Uh, if you don't get Helmen with, like, Arrow Fire or... You know, can isolate him in open field, which it doesn't look like that's going to happen. If you have to fight him this way, with like blob situations, you're just going to have a really, really bad time. <laughs> the drain, the drain game, uh, drain gang. Yes, it is. Ozkirk, thank you for the tenor, man. Great to catch a live stream. Happy holidays. Hey, man, really appreciate that. Right back at you. Hope you and your family are doing well and or your partner, whatever your life situation is, and that you're su surviving this cursed outbreak. Now, this is a good chance for Guac to get back in the game. Helm and Gorst is kind of sitting on the edge of the formation here. So if the two Paladins can get Helm and Gorst, but it looks like he's got his Guard Gorillas. Yeah, look at that. Over, overcasted Von Hells right there on the Gorillas, giving them speed and melee attack. Definitely going to be very tough. And you can see Guac is starting to fall apart. With his Peasant Archers being dead, uh, I don't know if he has any efficient way to kill Helm and Gorst. Now, if you had someone like King Luan, maybe, but I still think Faye Double Paladin is the best bet. He needs to get some of the vampire monsters out of this blob. Like, in the blob, they're just dominating the engagements because of Helm and Gorst. Um, no, 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 I haven't hopped in. I haven't gotten any... That, you, can, you can definitely make That's What She Said jokes. I, I don't think YouTube has ever come after me for those. Yeah, those are, those are pretty tame, for sure. <laughs> Who's draining in chat? Yeah, it's drain on drain. Double Mortis Engine. 
I am really eager to see Helm and Gorse, like how much value. It must be a shit ton. Like I'm pretty sure his Mortis Engine effect is included in his Bounce of Power, but you know, Scab Scrapes have just been brutal this game. Tank has been doing so well with those, and it looks like the Bretonians are just starting to crumble and fall apart. Yeah, Vargulfs are really scary. I love the Gorst though, man. The Gorst is actually like really competitively punishing right now. Like a Mortis Engine is a bigger target. Helmand Gorst sits kind of low to the ground compared to a Mortis Engine, so he's like harder to snipe, and he just like sits <laughs> amongst all these like Vargulfs who absorb the arrows for him, and it's just like, oh my god. So Bretonia going in for like one last ditch final effort. Um, Blood Knights are getting crumbled down, as are the Chaff units. But the Vargolfs are still healthy. There's way too many Skeleton Spears here. And the Fate Enchanter is trying her best to drain them down, but I just don't think it's going to be working. Yeah, an Ikit Nuke would be very, very strong here. But however, Ikit Nukes don't actually do that much damage against uh, single entities and things like that. So um... <laughs> yeah, get out, Mule. Yet. Yeah, it's a very accurate assessment. I think that's going to be GG. Holy shit, the Helm and Gorse Blob, dude. Just going deep and dismantling this Bretonian army. Oh my god, the, and his build truly was like a tank. The scab straights killing the peasant archers, because that's how, that's how you kill Gorst normally, right? It's just using, like if there was like, you know, I don't know, yeah, three peasant archers is a fair amount. Maybe I guess like four or five would have done the trick, because there wouldn't have been enough scab straights. All right, Gorst got 2,000 value from drains, pretty good. Scab straights did great, Blood Knights did okay. The Blood Knights kind of, you know, didn't quite pay for themselves, but did fine. The Vargulfs, of course, lived, and yeah, it was it was a good build by both players, a solid, a solid duel. But Helm and Gorst is, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird to see two Bretonians here, I know, in this battle. But Bretonia has been officially eliminated from the tournament. And the Vampire Counts will go on to fight the Norskins here in the next round. Will Gorst make a reprisal? I sure hope so. I would love to see Helm and Gorst again. So now we go to the top side of the bracket. It's going to be Vicious Satsuma versus Zyphos. So it's going to be Greenskins versus Wood Elves. All right, so let's go ahead and see if they have their bracket up. GG, well played. GG, lads. Guac says this game is so much fun. <laughs> oh my god. I was expecting like a fat Blood Knight duel, but instead Helmand Gorse is just sitting there cackling. <laughs> oh, it's so good. So let's get this going. Also, if you guys are playing in the Faction War go and you're in the next round, go ahead and make your lobbies and get everything ready because we're going to get this going real quick. Like, I did show you. Goblet Slayer. Um, he got, Helmand Gorse got 2,000 gold value. All right, so we'll do Satsuma and Zyphos. I'm curious to see how Zyphos will play this. All right, start when ready. Okay, that's kind of in line with what I was thinking there. Yeah, it's a cool build from Satsuma. Now we got to see what Zotphos is bringing. Should be fun. It has been a mighty tournament so far. Oskirk, again, thank you for the donation. And Mike, you got me really good, Mike. That was a good one. The dwarves are still in the tournament. Yeah, so, I mean, how you beat that with um, Bretonia is ar the archers win it for you, but with the archers dying to the bats as well as the uh, scabs grace, there was, it was a pretty hard fight for Bretonia from that point out. Maybe you got to bring more. Maybe bring, like, five archers. You know? Because if vampires aren't going to contest open field, you might as well bring more. Dude, Gorst was the unholy terror that game, yeah. The Dawi are still here. They're ready to party. So guys, we're loading into the next battle. Let us know in chat. Who are you rooting for? Is it going to be the dreaded Greenskins or the new and improved Wood Elves? Should be quite a bit of fun. These are two factions that were recently updated. Uh, both of them have gotten DLCs, which have drastically changed their playstyles. Although Wood Elves can still kind of do the same thing. And I wonder if Zyphos is going to go for a rush. I think the rush is stronger against Greenskins, but um, yeah, we'll see. So let's get into this game here, guys. Everything is updated. Let's jump in. Let us party. Once more in the deep we go. Yeah, we see some people coming over from Legend Stream. Welcome to the stream, guys. Hope everything was fun over there. I believe he was doing a Helmand Gorse campaign. You guys just barely missed out on seeing Helmand Gorse in action in multiplayer, but uh, of course, if you want to go back, you're more than capable of doing so. Hello, hello. Welcome to the stream, guys. So now in this glorious battle here in the Faction War, we have Vicious Satsuma. Coming over to the front line of Orc Biggins. Kind of interesting. I'm curious to see how Biggins will trade against Dryads. Um, you know what I actually have been doing in this matchup is using a couple Black Orcs in the front line because they're immune to Psyche. And also they uh, have a ton of armor against Dryads, which is quite cool. So we got Orc Biggins into the sunset. We got Skarsnik. Skarsnik is a really good choice against Orion. Since he's an infantry-sized character, Orion doesn't skewer him quite as badly. And he also has anti-large. I think Skarsnik is really the way to go. A couple Goblins. A ton of Spider Riders. 
and Spider Rider archers, and that appears to be it. So you have to respect the kite of Xyphos. Xyphos is someone who likes to play really mobile, kite-centric builds. So having the uh, the Forest Goblin Spider Riders, I think, is a very, very strong pick here. And nonetheless, they're a pretty good disruption tool. So for Zodphos, aka Xyphos, the the French the French champion here, he does have the Dryads here in the front line, backed up by Orion with the Horn of the Wild Hunt. A Branch Wraith, so no Ariel coming in, just going a little bit more simplistic here with Orion. And Orion is still really good. He's he's just an unholy terror, and he does some serious work. So here we got Glade Riders, Great Stag Knights, Lost Sylvan Knights, Wild Hunters, Wild Riders, and Glade Riders. So a very much, this is like a Wild Hunt build. It's like push in, blow the horn once more in the deep, and Wild Riders and Great Stag Knights will massacre Spider Riders really badly. So it's really going to come down to the biggins, as well as Skarsnik and the various baits that he can uh, potentially draw here in this game. How are Dark Elves and Marathi for these kind of events? Uh, pretty good. They can be strong. You know, it depends on who's playing and what they're facing. Many different circumstances uh, will dictate that. No Zotes. Um, you know, I wouldn't bring Zotes against Greenskins anyways. I don't think Zotes are very good in this matchup. I think uh, I think Wild Riders are probably the best Cav pick in conjunction with the Great Stag Knights. So yeah, Xyphos, of course, going with a huge Vanguard. You pretty much have to Vanguard here. It's just too strong not to. Let us get that big wah. We got Raptor Jesus in chat, getting the Greenskins all hyped up. Uh, Clay, you did miss the Dwarves. The Dwarves were an early round matchup and they were able to win. So the Dwarves have advanced on and I believe the Dwarves will be the next game. I think it's Dwarves versus, I can't quite remember, but it, it's happening. They're going to be here. So Greenskins uh, do have Spirit Leech on the Giant River Troll Hag. So she's going to be spamming Spirit Leech on the Lost Sylvan Knights, I would imagine. Xyphos going for a bit of an offset engagement here. Obviously, neither of the players know where the other one is at this point. So it's just kind of the Wild West, but... The Greenskins don't really care. They have big ends. They have Spider Riders. They could just fall back. This Vanguard isn't really going to mean much of anything to them. So let's do it to it. Let's have some fun, baby. So immediately, Vicious Satsuma rotates his army, and Xyphos is going to be pressing on pretty aggressively. Um, Orc Biggins should have a good trade against Dryads and also potentially against the Cavalry. I like the Wild Riders and some of those other tools here. So we'll see how this engagement goes. Greenskins on the kite, which is uh, kind of funny. And now the Spider Riders going to be rotating. What I would probably do with these Spider Riders is maybe get them around the back and like rear charge some of these drads while they're in combat. But, you know, easier said than done. But Mel Gibson comes once more in the deep, yelling freedom as he takes a torrent of goblin fire, throwing his badass javelin as he charges. Oh, man, Orion has got to be one of the coolest characters in the game. Definitely a hard carry. Um, usually I save Orion for last. He's very, very difficult to kill. Um, so, yeah, he's someone you want to kind of save for the fourth quarter of the game there, in my opinion. So he's coming in pretty hard. Spider Riders are cutting him back. A Dryad's about to engage in the front line. It looks like these Spider Riders did kind of break the charge of the Dryads. And now the Biggins, they got their axes or cleavers out or whatever the hell they're using. And they're going to be getting into the Dryads and uh, doing some good damage. But nice play here by Xyphos, just kind of kiting back and trying to lure some of these Biggins into open field, it would appear. Spider Riders with a downhill charge going to be getting a, a righteous beating here from the Stag Knights, I would imagine especially the Lost Sylvan Knights. With the Horn of the Wild Hunt, the charge bonus on the Wild Hunters is 100. That is an erect fat charge bonus. Now here we do have the Hounds of Mel Gibson going down to the back against the Rusty Errors and doing a little bit of damage going through the Goblins and uh, some of the Rusty Errors here. Definitely not bad value. And Spirit Leech as well is being activated here on the Wild Hunters of Kurnus. Really able to do some pretty substantial damage against those guys as well. Now the big in fights are going relatively good. You can see the Dryads here are getting crumped. These ones are getting kind of worked down. But of course the uh, Greenskins are being overwhelmed here on the flank. No surprises really. Uh, the Forest Goblin Spider Rider Archers being hunted down by Glade Riders. Oh, but the Fanatics! Oh, it looks like they missed. The Fanatics can actually do a ton of damage against Lost Sylvan Knights if you're able to get that proper engagement, but it looks like they kind of went the wrong way, which is a little bit of a shame. Balance Fire is pretty even, though. Um, yeah, obviously, the Dryads are getting kind of worked on in the front line, and that means that Xyphos is going to be having to use uh, his Cavalry to eventually deal with the Orc Biggins, which, you know, are kind of a dual-purpose anti-large unit, so there is that going for it. But, yeah, the Master of the Wild Hunt strikes once again, and the Giant River Troll Hag going to be taking her sack of meat back to her uh, her den or her river or wherever the hell she lives and yeah she's getting hunted pretty good by the wild wild master here it's really going to be important though vicious satsuma needs to do his best to save the giant river troll hag if she dies to orion this early that means that there's not going to be spirit leeches for the lost sylvan knights in the later stages of the game you know what actually this high ground engagement is going a little bit better for the greenskins you can see the uh the wood elves are being forced back by scar's neck as well as the advance of some of these orc biggins but yeah he really needs to save that hag and very good play here. So he sends in some Spider Riders. They're going to get punished, mind you. But if it buys enough time for the Hag to come back and regenerate, or at the very least, cast like one or two more Spirit Leeches on the Lost Sylvan Knights, I think that could be very, very strong indeed. Because, yeah, the Greenskins have really cleaned up the low ground fight. The Orc Biggins 
no surprises. They're a much stronger unit than the uh, Dryads here and are able to get that win. Bounce Fire is dead even right now, guys. And here you can see the Giant River Troll Hag has come back. But the Wild Hunt continues, and we'll see if... Uh, if a Thrag, the Lunch Lady, as uh, she's been called, is going to be able to get away. Nice Spirit Leech on the Lost Sylvan Knights, going to be circumventing their physical resist. And a couple Sylvan Knights do fall. They go from, how many models do they have right now? They will go from, I think they had 21 down to 19. And look at this, guys. The Master of the Wild Hunt isn't quite able to catch his prey, and the Giant River Troll Hag is able to get away. Really beautiful play there by Satsuma. And Satsuma still has a ton of big ins and Scarsnake as well. Ooh, a nice rampage on those guys. So he rampages the great Stagnites who are now going to be rampaged into big ins. That is a scary fight, but a terror route could come in. The Lost Sylvan Knights do have great impact damage and also could terror out this play. So that could hurt pretty bad. Yeah, Greenskins definitely need to get some reinforcements in there. But rampaging the great Stagnites into anti-large units, that is uh, definitely uh, a very, very solid play. Orion, in the meantime, still continuing to hunt the giant river troll hag. I think Satsuma might be able to get his orc begins to intercept and save the hag, which I think would be quite strong. And honestly, Greenskin seemed to be in a pretty good position this game, guys. This is a very, very close scrap. And I've I've been saying that I think that this is an even matchup. I feel like Greenskins versus Wood Elves, now that the Wood Elves have been updated and Greenskins are still very fresh off an update and obviously are very strong, I feel like it's an even matchup. And uh, it's really showing to be here in this game as Xyphos and uh, Vicious Satsuma... <clears throat> Are just going fisticuffs and really, really uh, doing some work, man. So the Bob fight is underway. The Lost Sylvan Knights have engaged here. It looks like there's going to be a Hounds of Mel Gibson being dropped once more by Orion. Uh, Scar's Nick in the late game should be able to deal with Orion if he has support from a little bit of uh, infantry. So like some goblins or big incident. But it looks like Orion is going to be going after Scar's Nick right now. Who tanks it like a champion. Scar's Nick is pretty tanky by Greenskin standards. He does have a uh, 5,000 HP, which is more than Grimgore. Obviously because his HP pool is basically the combined HP of both uh, of Gobla plus Scars. There. So look at that. A couple Shanks. You know, he wins the duel with Orion, and then he just pulls back at that point. Very, very good stuff coming in from Skarsnik. The Lost Sylvan Knights. The fact that this Hag has come back is like the deciding factor. Without this Hag, man, these Lost Sylvan Knights would just be going ape shit. But now that you have the heels to kind of, uh, or not the heels, but the Spirit Leech to wear them down, you can see they're actually crumbling. Not crumbling, but breaking and running. And, uh... Orion, Orion's favorite band is Duran Duran. Yes, Hungry Like the Wolf. <laughs> I'm on the hunt, I'm after you. I love that song, man. Duran Duran is pretty great. They have some really good songs. Like, Coming Undone is solid. But anyways, Greenskin's pulling massively ahead in the bounce of power. Orion, the master of the wild hunt, being duped and out-schemed by Scarsneck, the warlord of eight peaks. The biggins able to hold their own in the front line and certainly do very well for themselves. But finally... Orion is able to finish the hunt and uh, take out that giant river troll hag. Rampage going down to the Branch Wraith is going to be rampaging her into a bunch of biggins who, of course, hit really hard against that light armor. But I don't think Xyphos can do it at this point. The fact that there's some archers online and there's biggins protecting them and Skarsnik is very healthy. Orion would have to go Super Saiyan, and he doesn't have his wife with him. I think if Ariel was here, maybe there could be like a big Soul Stealer kind of comeback, but... um. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. Yeah, Biggins will kill Orion very quickly. Um, Orion is not as impervious as people think. Uh, he's very, very strong, very tough to take down, but I've had a couple games where I've used like Goblin Big Bosses and Skarsnik and have been able to kill Orion extremely efficiently. So the Branch Wraith is shattered. That is army losses for the Wood Elves, and it looks like the Wa is going to be advancing on. Skarsnik, the Warlord of Eight Peaks, now is going to be surrounding Orion. This might take a while, but there's way, way too many Biggins left. Way too many biggins. Orion might be able to kill one, but all these biggins, there's no way in hell he's going to do that. Xypho saying GG. Very well played there. Enduring the rush. Holding on like a champion. And there you have it, guys. So all the elves have been eliminated from the tournament, I believe. Yeah, high elves and dark elves as well as the wood elves. And this is a this is a matchup, actually. I've seen a couple of players use the Sisters of Twilight pretty effectively here as well. But the Orion rush is always strong. Here he comes. Skarsnik might as well turn and fight. <laughs> Here's a couple shots going into Orion. Here comes the swarm of spider riders. Skarsnik does take a big blow. But now Orion is going to be surrounded and just dragged down. Look at this. It's just... <laughs> oh, the value he's getting still, though. <laughs> Freedom. Oh, my God. Look at Orion here. Yeah, we'll see. Orion got, you know, over 2,000 gold value. That's pretty good. Yeah, definitely get some biggins in there. But Orion is, is pretty worn down. He's still not healing, too. I, don't, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> Zyphos in chat saying, like, oh, uh, he's like effing Thrag. He couldn't catch Thrag, and then Thrag killed his Stagnites. That's so funny. Oh, my God. Yeah. A man can't go Super Saiyan without his wife. Very true. I know. 
And now he's just being, oh my god, Orion is just being blasted by the goblin, like, shaman here, and also being nuked by the archers. Yeah, I mean, for anyone who said Orion can't be killed, here you go. This is this is a prime example of just, like, how you kill him, right? He's just being tormented by the greenskins. It's like they're just, like, playing with their toy. Oh my god, he's so low. Well, Orion's gonna make his last stand. Yep, there he goes, Spear Leech. And down he goes. The master of the wild hunts is dragged down by the goblins. Down, down to goblin, down. Oh my god, that was so good. T. Carter, thank you for the $40 donation, brother. He says, Christmas is here, and I want to send some beer money to all the YouTubers who have kept me sane and entertained this crazy year. Keep up the good work. Hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday. Love from Lockdown London. Hey, right back at you from Lockdown LA, man. That was amazing. Well played, Divicious Satsuma and Zotfos, and the Greenskins, the Wa is going to be moving on. So now the Skaven are the remaining champions of the DLC. So let's go to the Faction War bracket. Let's move it up. We'll take a look at the values here in just a second. Don't you worry. Vicious Satsuma moves to the uh, round of four, which should be quite a bit of fun. So back here, if we take a look at the value. Skarsnik did fine. Thrag, 1,800, because those Spirit Leeches were just so damn good on the uh, on the, the big stags. The Biggins, yeah, look at that. 1,600 on those guys. 1,000 there, 800 here. The Biggins proved to be the real champions. Holy shit. Yeah, that was really nice. A bunch of spider riders obviously did their piece as well. Mel Gibson did awesome. Stag Knights uh, didn't quite pay for themselves. They cost 2,000 gold, so it seems like Satsuma was able to mitigate their effectiveness. And the Wild Riders also got crumped really good. Well played. Yeah, Dryads get wrecked by Biggins. Pretty hard in combat. No surprise there. No surprise there. All right. So back to the bracket. Here is the current standings of the day. So now we have Dwarves versus Beastmen. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. I love this matchup. GG, well played. Mass Biggins are just too good against Wood Elf Rush. Yeah, they're really strong. If you had had a couple, like, archers, he could have counterplayed that a little bit. <clears throat> but we will see. Sophie Shaw, thank you for becoming a member here on the channel. Welcome to the Dukes of Haggard and Dukettes. And, uh, yeah, enjoy the new emojis and uh, really appreciate your support. Welcome, Sophie Shaw. Thomas Green, extending the welcoming hand. So next up, we have... Let me go ahead and find it. Yumais versus Tesla. One, two, three. That was a really cool build by Satsuma. I might have to steal that one. <laughs> or at least you know, take some inspiration from it, because that was really, really nice. All right. Yumais versus Tesla. Perfect. The scoreboards are updated. We can let the players know they can start now. Start when ready. So it's going to be Dwarves against Beastmen. This is a matchup that used to be terrible for Dwarves, but Dwarves have since gotten mass changes and have had some changes to their Lords, and I really feel like Dwarves can do just fine here now, so... Should be good. You know, if the Dwarves win this, the Dwarves will go to the round of four, which might be the furthest they've ever gotten, or at least, or at least tied, and then they'll um, be fighting the Greenskins in a grudge match, which actually I feel like Greenskins versus Dwarves is, in the hands of a Dwarf Specialist, is pretty even nowadays. Yeah. Satisfy the grudge. They've wronged us. All right, so let's move on over. And uh, there we go. Cool. Welcome to the Dukes of Haggard. All right, here we go. Time to party. Let's take a look at these armies. And now for the Dowie. It's going to be a front battle line of Dwarf Warriors mixed with some elite Warriors of Dragonfire Pass and Longbeards. And he is going to be going for a triple cannon. Holy shit. Look at this. The throng is mustard. Yeah, that's always funny. And uh, yeah, it looks like we got cannons. We got cannons and more cannons. And then on the backside here, we have miners with blasting charges. It's going to be dwarf warriors. And I think that is more or less it. And a rune lord as well. Pretty cool army. So one sec, guys. Let me minimize here. Double check my settings. And uh, I think we're good. Yeah. All is, all is solid here in the realm. The Rune Lord is definitely not a bad choice. Rune of Wrath and Rune is pretty good. Although, honestly, I think that the... Um, I think that Grom Brindle is the way to go now. The AoE slow is just so good. Because you can use it so often. You get a slow, and also he's pretty good in combat, too. So that's, like, something else to uh, consider. Yeah, so Triple Cannon, more or less, is kind of be the way the Dwarves are going. And just defending that with the Rune Lord and uh, some other assets there. Now for the Bray Herd! The Beast People! It's going to be Ungors mixed with a couple Bestigors in the rear. So the Ungors will be taking the beating with the Gore Herds while the Bestigors push in there. 
Harpies to shut down Gyrocopters and a bit of a Chariot Core. So we have a Bray Shaman of Beasts right here using Manticore Summons and also the Razor Gore Chariots down on the low ground. Where it's going to be Morker, we have a Gorble as well, which I think is quite cool. And that is pretty much it. So let us know in chat. You got your horns and hooves out for the Beast People, let us know. Or are you uh, a descendant of Grungni, the great ancestor gods? Are they your people? Do let us know. Should be quite a bit of fun. Uh, so before this battle starts, I will minimize and get you guys a Discord link because I can see some of you guys are looking for that. So one second. This is the multiplayer Discord. Rune Lord is a must in your opinion. Yeah, I guess it depends on your playstyle. Personally, I think Grom Brindle is, is a way to go, but um, you know, it's each their own. It just really depends on your playstyle and whatnot. Beast people, best people versus beast people. This is Raptor Jesus. Yeah, the great cannons are, you know, going to be pretty good against the chariots and other pieces like that. Bestigors might actually be a little bit of a problem. Um, Bestigors will put a big dent in that front line if they get the proper charge and aren't focused down on the approach. But it uh, should be a good fight. And dwarves, you know, versus beastmen is very thematic too. I think it's a very fun battle. So um, it's one that I suppose happens in lore from time to time. All right. Somebody just yells Christian Martinez. Yes, for Carl. Are you talking about Carl the Llama or Carl Franz? <clears throat> They've wronged us for rock and stone. Yeah, dwarves are so badass. You know, part of me wants to see the beastmen do well too, though, just because the beastmen are so neglected. Like, they just never get DLCs, they never get any love. So part of me is like, oh, you know, I want to see the beastmen like, do well. But then again, dwarves are like my favorite from a lore perspective with the Empire. So, you know, it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough place to be put in, you know? It's a tough place. Yes, yes, yes. So let's do it to it. And the battle is underway. The great cannons are going to be shooting downtown, going after the Bestigore herds, which is definitely not a bad target. You know, putting two cannons on one herd and then one on the far side is uh, something to think about. Matt Hardy, thank you for the $20 donation. Longtime subscriber here. Dude, keep up the great work. I watch every video. Merry Christmas, guys. Hey, right back at you. I hope you and yours are having a good old holidays. We're going to be dressing our Christmas uh, tree here soon. It should be fun. Thanks again, Matt. Really appreciate you and uh, hope all is well, brother, and you're staying safe in Nurgle's Great Plague. I just dropped a link to the Discord uh, a little bit further up if you scroll up in chat. And uh, here we go. So the Beastmen are uh, getting a big swarming position, no surprises there. The Harpies on a very wide descent vector <laughs> coming over from this side of the battlefield probably will collapse across and maybe just sit on a cannon. Harpies are uh, kind of a cool thing against Slayers because Harpies are infantry sized, which means the Slayers do not get a bonus for large there. So yeah, I think that's kind of a cool uh, application. Bestigors in the front, no surprises, are uh, massacring the standard Dwarf Warriors. They have a huge charge bonus of 35, great AP values and just better stats. So the uh, Dwarf Warriors are going to be having a pretty bad time. Blasting charges though from the Dawi, tearing into the Ungor herds on the advance. It's funny because so many people are like not used, like almost no one plays Beastmen these days. So you kind of have to like rethink things when you play against them, which is pretty funny. Oh no, what a disaster here for Tesla. The Bray Shaman of Beasts just gets blasted by the triple cannons. Now, if that Bray Shaman comes back and is able to get its Manticore summons off, you know, its second one, that's not going to be a big deal, but definitely a very painful start to lose that, uh, this, this early in the game there. This, this, yes, yes. I'm just becoming a Skaven here in this uh, particular game. So Blasting Charges seem to be proving very efficient, but the Bestigors have broken through the front line, and now the Bestigors have gotten a surround on these Dwarf Warriors, which means that's going to be a massacre. And there still is a unit of Bestigors which have been left in the dreaded tactical reserves back here, which definitely need to make their way in. Harpies are going after the cannons, which is a very good play. Like I said, Slayers will kill Harpies, but it'll take some time. Harpies have relatively high melee defense at 38. And Slayers, you know, have 38 melee attack. So, you know, it'll take some time to get the Harpies off the cannon, and they do not get their bonus for Slayers there. Now, the Bray Shaman of Beast <clears throat> is back. Something he could opt to do is hide the Bray Shaman down in that kind of little ravine right there and just use the Manticore summons. Maybe bring it out in the late game. Nice blasting charges coming in there from the miners, wrecking those Bestigore herds. But Gorbel is pissed. He has something to say about this, and uh, he's going to be trying to disrupt those Ekrans miners while the uh, Bestigore herds do advance right there. So the Bray Shaman is moving fast. It's on its way back. The Harpies have been able to disrupt some of the cannons, and now Morker the Shadow Gave may be able to make his way over here and actually shut down this cannon, or at least cause some disruption. I don't know if he used his Staff of Corruption. I think he did. It looks like right here we do have the uh, Chaos Spawn fighting in the front. A very, very even battle right now. But the problem for the Beastmen is that if it's, you know, favored for the Dwarves at this point in the game, it's a little bit tricky. But again, we have a second Manticore Summon, which is going to be coming out. But oh no, the Bray Shaman breaks, I think, before the Manticore Summon goes off. Nope, he gets it. Very clutch. That Manticore Summon is going to be incredibly useful. Um, you could use it to kill this cannon. You can use it just to disrupt so many angles of this game. 
Very, very solid play indeed. Now, the Great Cannons do need to be taken down, though. They're certainly accruing a ton of value, shooting at Gorbel, number one. Gorbel is a huge target, but his Bestigor Herd could be the game changer. Bestigor Herd is coming in here, battling the Dwarf Warriors, or excuse me, the Slayers, and should be able to beat the Slayers down pretty badly. Oh, and there it is, the Spirit Essence of Chaos from Warker, and suddenly the Bounce of Power is even once again. So, the question is, can the Beastmen capitalize on the Chaos Spawn Summon and the Manticore Summon right now. They need to make some plays. They need to break some formations, get onto the cannons. Otherwise, you know, if the summons just disappear and he doesn't accomplish anything big like that, he could just lose the game. Although this is quite nice. This uh, cannon crew is broken and the Harpies did disrupt this cannon for quite some time. Now, Dwarves still have a fair amount of Miners, some pockets of Slayers, Longbeards running around the battlefield. The Gorbel is very low and oh, Gorbel takes a cannonball right to the face. He's wavering. Seven leadership, 13 leadership. A second cannon hits him. And it looks like he's at negative eight. Gorbel is broken. Really, really beautiful pick there from the Dawi. Fire, reload, fire. I know, this must be a very stressful battle for both players. The spawner going. About to be hitting their second tier of uh, disintegration here. More could the Shadow gave in his best of wars. Certainly getting some good value. And those damn Harpies, man, they're getting some great value. Breaking that cannon crew again is really, really important. If the Harpies could actually come over here and shut down this other cannon, I think that could give the Beastmen a way back in. However, as it currently stands, I think the Dwarves are going to be very, very tough to break. Um, Longbeards are still healthy. There's a fair amount of miners around the battlefield mixed in with, you know, Warriors of Dragonfire Pass. And the Rune Lord is also still here in good health with yeah, 28 Slayers here and more Slayers. I think the Beastmen probably are going to be dropping this game, which will send the Dwarves into the quarterfinals. Um, a very valiant effort by Tesla. Definitely losing his caster hurts pretty bad. Um, maybe a couple of Poison Hounds too, or some sort of hound action to like get on those cannons. Just not being able to shut down the cannons definitely hurt pretty bad. Those things just pounded and dropped to the base. And the Grudge has been satisfied once more. Advancing on, go the Jawi. There you go, my friends. Those cannons did some work. So let's take a look here at the value train. 1,600, 1,000, and 800. All those cannons, really beautiful stuff. Killing the Razor Gore Chariot, almost instantly killing the Bray Shaman and killing the Gore Pool. Like, just value city. Quad Slayers did an awesome job, Longbeards did fine, and the Rune Lord just, you know, cast slow on things, and that was pretty much it. That was a really, really good game. Well played for Mountain and Home. The Dawi will be advancing. I'm sure the uh, I'm sure the Skaven on the other side of the bracket are rubbing their little Skaven paws together, hoping that the Dwarves make it to the finals. <laughs> oh my god, Faction War bracket, let's go. All right, so we have the Dwarves facing off against Greenskins, another grudge match coming up. Strike it from the book, boys. I know. Well played to Tesla, though. You know, always awesome to see the Beastmen in action. Um, but alas, the Dwarves were able to claim the day. One grudge satisfied, a million more to go. Very true. So now we have the Skaven versus the Lizardmen. This should be fun. I always enjoy this matchup. It's a very thematic matchup as well, right? The, the Lustrian battle. All right, let's find it. And uh, where are they at? All right. Get in the lobby. Yeah, Morker versus the world. It's the, it's the classic conundrum. Yeah, pretty much always happens. All right, so we got Hadrius in here. Hadrius versus Gabo Slayer. Should be good. Yeah, the best scores did pretty good. Best score is definitely solid. But they're very squishy as well, so they can take a big beating. Start whenever ready. All right, well played, Tesla. Thank you again for joining in today's tournament. There are no more elves. No, all the elves have been killed, so. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Shelton's a happy boy. Let's see here. And while we're uh, chilling in between games, we have a little bit of downtime, guys. If you have any questions about the meta or faction wars or upcoming events, do let me know. And I will make sure to fish you guys another uh, Discord link here. So for anyone who wants to get involved, in uh, multiplayer action, maybe someday playing Faction Wars, ECLs, all that sort of good stuff, this is the place to do it. We also have links to other Warhammer communities that run tournaments. So you can find my son Herbert Walker's uh, tournaments here, all sorts of good stuff. So, um, you know, now is a good time. While we have a little bit of a, a, a quick interlude while the players pick their armies, what do you guys, or how are you guys doing with your brackets? That's what I want to know. So we're doing the Faction War Match Madness right now. Has anybody kept a perfect bracket? What are your scores? How many have you gotten right? How many have you gotten wrong? I'd be curious to actually see that right now. I think it'd be quite interesting. 
so we are loading into the game here. So it's going to be starting here in a minute. But do let me know. How are you guys doing on your brackets? Because after the tournament's over, I'll be reviewing those and seeing who wins the, the big fat $50 prize. A dwarf win would be pretty crazy. The dwarves will have no chance if Hadrius makes it to the finals. So the dwarves pretty much have to watch and pray and hope that they can... Uh, the Skaven get eliminated at some point. Because that is a horrible matchup, dude. Horrible, horrible matchup. Cabo Slayer always got to adjust his name. All right, there we go. I dropped a Discord link just above. Do you have any schedule so I know when... Uh, you know, my schedule is kind of all over the place, Eric. I got to be better about that. Personally, um, when I have a schedule, it kind of gives me anxiety. It's just a weird thing. Like, I like to just be kind of impromptu, but I'll do better about announcing faction wars and bigger events, like, ahead of time. Yeah, I'll have to do that. I, I usually announce it in my Discord, too, but... Yeah. I've actually gotten all of them so far. Oh, gee, nice. Very well played. Well, you're you're certainly you got two right so far, Wesley. <laughs> oh boy, man. Yeah. Mine is the Dawi at the top. All right. Well, you're you're still on it. All right, guys. So for the build of Hadrius, Hadrius is going to be going for triple Warplock Gazelle, triple Rat Ogre with Night Runner support to deal with Pterodons, and it looks like it's going to be Skaven Slaves and Clan Rats. Backed up by a Plague Priest, Throt the Unclean on his Brood Horror. Oh, dude, Big Chungus Throt is here, baby. Let's go. And uh, it looks like it's going to be some basic Clan Rats and Scape and Slaves in the front. So it's mainly going to be the Gisales trying to trade against the uh, Solar Engines as well as the Stegodon. So both players are kind of having like a Wild West shootout. Neither player wants to advance. They both want, you know, the opponent to come to them, right? The Lizards want the Skaven to advance into Chameleons and Solar Engine Fire, and the Skaven want to kill the range of the Lizards and force them to come into, a, like, a Plague Furnace. It's going to be really, really interesting, actually. My links are not showing up? That's very strange. I have no idea why that would be the case. Uh, Vampire Coast has been eliminated. Yes, they lost to the Skaven in the first round. It was a super close game. Super close. So let us know! You here for the Horned Rat? You a child of the Old Ones? Let us know your allegiance in chat. And uh, we'll go from there. Yes, yes. This is going to be very interesting. The Gisales, uh versus the uh, double solar engine plus the Sagadon sniper. So many rats in the same place. Well, that's quite normal. The giant rat which makes all the rules has emerged. <laughs> I love that meme, dude. It's so good. Yeah. Well, both players deploying very heavily right here, which is very, very funny. Uh, why do you take Hives against Greenskins? Um... You know, honestly, I feel like that's a pretty bad matchup for High Elves, but um, somebody in chat could explain better. There's two factions I'm not very good at, and it's High Elves and Dark Elves. Everyone else I can give you answers for, but those two are my weaknesses. So what are the Gisales going to be shooting? Uh, they have to scoot up a little bit. It looks like they might be line of sighted or maybe out of range or something, but... Oh man, those Gisales are going to tear, tear into that solar engine. Yeah, three of them. Plague Priest going down, going to be dropping some summons on top of the Chameleon Skinks. Oh, and Throt the Unclean, he's moving forward. Where's he going, man? Is he going to go for the kill? A little bit of lag, unfortunately. Hopefully nobody disconnects. If they do, um, I guess we just restart the game and have them in the same spot. It's always a stressful thing in Warhammer, because, like, you can never tell. Like, it sucks to punish someone just because of an internet DC, but I think it's fine. I think it's passing right now, so it should be okay. All right, we're back in business. The Gisales are shooting into the Solar Engine. The lag appears to have subsided. Uh, the Skaven Summons are doing some really good damage against those Chameleons, actually. Definitely a thing of beauty. And yeah, the Gisales are just shooting, man. They're ripping some shots. They're getting that Solar Engine down a little, a little relatively low. You know what would be really nice would be to summon Rat Ogres on top of the Bastilodon and then attack it with Throt. Throt is so good. Yeah, look at that. That's Oh, what a beautiful play. And now he can use Creature Killer if he has it. Does he? He does. He's got to use it. And then surround that Solar Engine, beat it down with Throt. Oh, Throt is so good. Yeah, so all these Rat Ogres have Anti-Large now, and they're just clubbing on that Bastilodon, man. They're taking it to the club. And the Basilodon can't escape. It's surrounded by Rat Ogres. It's taking huge damage. That is Value City. And so far, the Solar Engines really aren't getting too much damage back. The Creature Killer Rat Ogre combo is very strong. Now, he has used it early in the game. So he's not going to have it later for, like, you know, other sniping attempts. But even if he doesn't kill this thing right here, like, getting this much damage on the Solar Engine is definitely very, very good value, in my uh, humble opinion. Now, Throt needs to get out at this point. There are a bunch of Sora Spears nearby. There's a Skink Chief shooting him. I think Throt has done his job. He forced an Overcasted Regrowth. He forced a ton of abilities to try and save that Bastilodon. And uh, I think he's gotten his value and it's time to go home and uh, do his thing. 
It was a slow-mo cinematic shot. Yes, of course. That's the, the classic way to uh, to blame, <laughs> blame something else. I feel like the Gisales are kind of obstructed. Because um, three Gisales in open field would normally kill that Bastilodon way quicker. But it would appear Hadris probably wants to get up on the hill a little bit. Because, yeah, these Gisales seem to be obstructed. They're not able to shoot as well. Uh, but nonetheless, I still feel like the Skaven are in a good position. Having damaged that solar engine. And it goes both ways. You can see the solar engines are kind of struggling to get line of sight on good targets as well. And are ultimately paying a little bit of a troll toll. Yeah, this uh, solar engine getting quite low. The shield of the old ones is going down. Getting popped pretty good. Waddling away right now. And yeah, let's look at line of sight. Okay, it's... Yeah, there's a little bit of a hill here. If Hadris managed to get his Gisales up on the high ground, um, he would definitely have killed this thing already. But, you know, easier said than done. The Skaven are very fast. So the Bastilodon with the solar engine is broken. Really nice focus fire from the three Gisales. It seems like he was really anticipating a build like this. And the Bastilodon is going to be running for the hills, probably shattering, if not dying right here in just a second. 14 HP, down it goes. So Throthia Unclean, really an unholy terror right now. And now he's going to be moving after the Slon. And that thick Slon, definitely not going to be very good at getting away from Thra. Um, Thra is going to be waddling after this guy with no vengeance. 95 speed, poison. This Toad is definitely in big trouble. Uh, there are some chameleons nearby that can help. But even if Thra takes some big damage, he still has a heal and... Also does have the uh, the remoldered ability and all that sort of good stuff. So, so far it looks like these Skaven are in a pretty commanding position. Hadris appears to be very intent on reclaiming his his faction war crown after the last faction war, in which was won by Anticity. The Gisales, pretty much unimpeded, firing happily. The Lizardmen are going to be losing the infantry fight too, simply because the Sara Spears are just going to get killed by the Plague Priest and the Mortis Engine effect. And the Gisales are uh, out trading here. I mean, both players had a similar game plan. But Hadri's game plan pulled off. It worked. Uh, he was able to outtrade the range of the Dinos. Whereas had the Dinos gone for like a rush with a ton of skinks and width, I think Hadri's might have been in some trouble. But in this case, the Gisele build worked very, very well. And now you can see the Lizards are very much falling apart here in this game. Throt, he is very hungry. And he is massacring these freaking uh, Bastilodons. Throt is so good. Creature killer and remoldered active. Able to give him a, a Walmart regrowth, basically. It's like 1100, so I think regrowth is like 1300. And as far as the Lizardman pressure goes, there still are some skink cohorts pushing up, and here we do have the Legion of Chiqua as well, but I think the Plague Priest should be able to deal with them no problem. And now the Stegodon's trying to juke, and Goblet Slayer doing his best. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any way he could get back in this game. I simply don't think so. I think just the fact that the guns are still alive, it's going to be very, very tough. The Rat Boys have done it, it would appear. And they'll be going on to the round of four to face... Uh, be interesting to see the Skaven against Vampire Counts. Yeah, that's probably something Hadris doesn't want. He probably doesn't want to see Vampire Counts. I think when I play Skaven, my bands are usually Wood Elves and, and uh, Vampire Counts. Those are my two bands when I play in tournaments with them. Um, so yeah, Vampire Counts, you can win it with Skaven. It's just a very stressful matchup. Whereas, like, you know, more or less everything with the exception of Wood Elves and, uh, and Vampire Counts, I think is pretty comfortable for Skaven. Or at least even, you know. Throt that rat over there. <laughs> that, that's really good. I like that wicked. That was that was solid, man. So the Skink Chief is certainly in some trouble. Throughout the Unclean is going to be coming for blood. The Haggard Rat's going to be jumping over, I would imagine, and giving that uh, Skink Chief the business. And the Gisales just massive sniper fire going down on the Stegodon, which is probably going to be triggering army losses if this thing breaks. And the inexorable Legion of Skaven are just pushing forward. If only he had brought the Shredder of Lustria, he would have lost worse. He would have he would have probably lost faster if he had brought the Shredder of Lustria against Triple Gisale and Throughout the Unclean. Throck could just roadblock it while the Gisales killed it, and that would have been all she wrote. All right. Here you go. The Stegodon is in some big trouble here. Being beaten on by the Rat Ogres, running back, I have to say. Despite uh, it being a losing effort, a very valiant effort here by Gobbo Slayer. I think his build, he was outbuilt. Out, what would be even the proper term for that? Outbuilded, or, you know, his opponent basically beat him in the building phase uh, to a large extent. But he still put up a very good fight. <clears throat> and uh, Throck the Unclean. Going to be crumping the Slon and the Skaven. Advance to the top four. Hadris once again threatening for the crown of the faction wars. Yes. Pretty glorious indeed. Maybe trip Gisele to take down Blood Knights now. Because they'll, they'll summon zombies on top of your weapons teams. You have to play like more monster mashy against vampire counts in my experience. All right. Let's take a look at the uh, value train. Throt. Pretty good as always. Ogres did fine, but the Gisales were the winners. Like, 1,300, 1,400, 1,300. Like, that's that's where it's at. And for the Lizard Army, like, not much got too much. They tried, but the Solar Engines got outvalued. 165 here and 290. 
Outdrafted, yeah. Outdrafted would be the proper term. <clears throat> it would be indeed. All right, well played. Congratulations to Hadries. He's going on to the top four. I was talking to Hadries last night and he was doubting himself. And I was like, dude, you're, you're going to do well, dude. All right, Tank and Valkanos. Norska, for his Vampire Counts, is our next game. Let's get this party started. All right. Mr. Tamashu, Arigato for the donation. I love it, man. I love the, I love the samurai dog waving the flag. It's pretty glorious. Falconos first tank. Let's do it. Oh, uh, yes. Lincoln, I do do this full-time. It's my full-time job. Nani? I know. Arigato. Oh, stretching out the old arms here. One second, guys. I'm going to be back in just a second. Firstly, let's update the nameplates. So we have Valkanos on that side. Valkanos and Tank. Tank, of course, coming off a glorious Helm and Gorse victory. Um, Aerocrastic, you are just in time for Tank versus Valkanos. Holy shit, man. Aero, we've had some crazy-ass games today. Crazy. We had, we had like, Helm and Gorse games. We had Rapunz going apeshit on the Dwarves, which was super fun. Um... Some some great matches. Yeah, it's been really fun. <clears throat> and now we are here for our next match of the day. Well, that's still a hundred percent accurate bracket. Gene, honestly, you might be winning the prize, dude. Yeah. Thank you again for that donation, man. I'm sorry I can't quite remember how to read your name, but I'm giving it my all. Norse covers vampire counts. This is a matchup I haven't seen in quite some time. Should be quite a bit of fun. The Dawi are in the top four also. Yeah, we had some great dwarf games, man. So now let us go ahead and load into the battle and see how this glorious one shall unfold. I'm going to have a sip of water real quick, man. <clears throat> Gorst is also viable against Norska. Are we going to get a Gorst run here in the uh, in the tournament? Oh, Hadris. Hadris with the, the hint here. So for Norska, it's going to be a Marauder Berserker box. So it looks like five Berserkers in total with double War Shrine Mammoth. Holy shit. So he's going to be giving the leadership buffs from the uh, favor of the Ruinous Powers, making Berserkers have 90 base leadership. And then from there, he can also uh, buff them with the Giver of Glory, which I believe gives melee attack and fire damage. I think it's something like that. Yeah, melee attack, fire damage, and leadership. We have a Femir Bale Fiend of Fire. We have <clears throat> a Skin Wolf Werekin, so the Master Condom Wolf. And then we do also have Throg. So yeah, very much a box. I'm really curious to see if this works against like someone like Tank. Yeah, it's going to be good. I think the Bretonian versus Dwarf game should definitely be worth a highlight. Yeah, that was really good. I enjoyed that one, man. So now for the forces of Tank, he's going to be utilizing some new tools. The Vargeist, who of course have gotten improved AP damage. Not that you really needed against Norska, but still pretty cool. Double Vargeist to mix with some zombies and skeletons up in the sky. We do have the Blood Dragon Vampire Lord. Double Blood Knight mixed with double Vargulf, and that is pretty much it. Although there is a Necromancer on a corpse card back here who's just cackling and doing his thing, which should be fun. <clears throat> I don't know, my voice is getting a little scratchy. Hold on a sec, guys. <clears throat> Damn. This is a tank build, says Gadat Mule, yeah, is it? Yeah, well. So Lady Turin and I actually found um, a Polish deli here in Los Angeles. That, like, is pretty authentic. <clears throat> so I've been eating, <clears throat> like, herring and kielbasa and pashtet and just, and biggest and so much good food. It's been awesome, man. It's been awesome indeed. <clears throat> Damn. Got something caught there. All right. I think we're good. I think it's all clear enough. So Vargas is going to be Tokyo drifting around the backside of this formation. Definitely wanting to keep an eye here on the Marauder Berserkers. And Tank, of course, being a classic Vampire Count player, just going to be biding his time trying to get breath attacks and what he'll do. He's going to trickle in zombies. He's going to send in like one zombie, get a breath attack, send in another zombie, get another breath attack. And then when he's softened up the army to his liking, he's going to go in for the alpha strike. That's pretty much how vampire counts play. Yeah, Throg can definitely put some hurt here. So he does drop a zombie summon, mainly just to disrupt the formation. And then the Vargeists are going to be coming in for a rear charge and then pulling back instantly. Now, will any of the Vargeists get caught? No, it looks like a not really good control by tank. So yeah, basically just sacrifices a zombie summon for a little bit of DPS, but... Honestly, the Norskan army does take it relatively well and doesn't take too much damage in the process, so uh, we'll see. I don't think that tank has any really quality infantry. I think he mainly just has skeletons and zombies. But um, yeah, it's going to be a grindy fight. We'll see if any of the uh, 
far guys do get picked off in the process so far really really good harassing these guys just buying time with the zombie summons to uh, get some freebies where he can and it's been good so far although here on the, the retreat it looks like some of the var guys do kind of get punished by the uh, the warshine mammoth yeah the warshine mammoth not able to kill any which is unfortunate well, granted, they can still uh, resurrect them with Invocation. So that is really, really good for Valkanos. Valkanos was able to dodge that Breath Attack. And dodging Breath Attacks is um, is honestly, they're one of the deciding factors here in this matchup. So being able to avoid that, I think, is incredibly strong. Oh, dude, I've been eating. So we had three kill bosses in the fridge, like three full um, holiday kill bosses. And I just like over the past two days, I've eaten them all. I've become such a sausage. Oh, my God. So yeah, the uh, vampire's just doing a little bit of hitting and running. So the Norskins will basically just stay together and just kind of, you know, push around in a blob and just, you know, kill a skeleton here, kill a skeleton here, and just keep moving until tank has to fight, which will come in time. And, you know, every resource you're able to bait out, like breath attacks or summons, things like that, is one less that the vamps are going to have for the late game. So definitely quite nice if you can get that going. Vargai's thinking about attacking here, but basically tank is just going to be sacrificing zombies. He really wants to line up that really, really juicy um, breath attack. And a oh, nice fireball right there. Wow, that fireball killed two Var guys. Beautiful fireball. I think the breath attack might be coming here in a second. Tank is really sitting in that position that's kind of like asking for it. Or, well, he's not asking for it. Norska doesn't really have a choice is what I'm essentially trying to say. But, um, like, he's in that side angle where he can go, like, right down the pipe and nail a bunch of berserkers. And now the zombies are going to be collapsing in. It looks like Blood Knights might be thinking about engaging here. The mammoth body blocks <laughs> the breath. Yeah, that's one way to do it, Arrow. So the Warshine Mammoths uh, giving massive leadership buffs. Like most of the Berserkers are sitting at like 99 leadership here. We have like 94 on these other ones. So it's going to take like everything to break those down. Another fireball right there, killing another couple of Vargeists. So the Vargeists are falling pretty hard. And a breath attack coming in. That was all right. It wasn't that punishing of a breath attack. So far, I would say Norska has gotten off pretty good with the breath attacks and is probably relatively comfy. So Vargeists coming in once again. The uh, Skin Wolf Werekin should be able to respond there and take out a couple of those guys, although he's kind of standing idle right now, so Valkanos definitely needs to give the attack order. And the Skin Wolf Werekin does capture its prey. It knocks down one of the Vargeists, which probably will die to the Berserkers right now. You can see this guy's having a really bad time, and down it goes. So both players kind of chipping away at each other's armies. Tank going to be dropping another zombie summon on top of the Marauder Berserkers here. And uh, it's on, man. It's on indeed, baby. And the, the big old Chungus Mammoths are uh, they're rolling on. And Throg is still in good shape, too. You know, we got Frostbite from Throg. So if anybody, you know, goes after Throg and gets caught in a bad situation, uh, could be something. Oh, a big Alpha Strike coming in, it looks like. The Vampire is actually committing to a fight because Valkanos is able to beat down that Vargulf and force the hand of the Vampire Counts, which, honestly, Norska is getting some really good trades right now. Man, thank you for the uh, 5,000 yen. Eh, arigato. Uh, I I wish I remembered more Japanese, but um, Genki Desuka, my friend. Hope you're doing good. Um, I am Genki. Demo boku no tamagai tain nazanada. I didn't get much sleep last night, but thank you so much for the very generous donation. I, I remember a little Japanese, but it's, it's been a while. Thank you so much, man, and uh, hopefully you're enjoying the, the glorious haggard double war shrine game because I most certainly am. Oh yeah, this is going to be a long fight. It always is. Um, Norska versus Vampires is typically long, unless Norska just screws up and gets like some things isolated and terror routed and things like that. But I love the double war shrine. I think that's so cool. And you know, the Vampires are taking some damage. Um, one Vargulf took some you know pretty serious work, and now the last breath attack is gone for Tank. So what you see is what you got here. And the balance of power is still very even. Um, the Vargeists are also quite beat up. I feel like Vargeists are a trap. Like every time I bring them, I find I find I just struggle with them. Uh, Tihan, do you think that the last patch made Dawi more competitive? Yes, I do, 100%. Um, the mass changes were a huge buff to the dwarves. Berserkers are rampaging, which is a little bit unfortunate. They might be running into open field where they could be rode down, and it looks like there's going to be some sort of a, a breath attack or a burning head coming down here. Yeah, it looks like a burning head on those skeleton warriors. In the meantime, the Vargai's charging in once again, down to eight models and nine respectively. I would imagine Tank is probably going to be coming for an oh, invocation right now, but oh no, one of the mammoths is isolated. Is it going to be able to get away? It looks like Valkanos does escape the clutches of the dreaded uh, Vargeist stack here. Berserkers rampaging into Skeleton Warriors, able to engage there and uh, should be able to cut them to pieces. Norska doing pretty well staying together considering the rampages, but now the Black Knight's going to be cleaving into those Berserkers in conjunction with the Vargulf. But the Skinwolf Werekin's coming in, the Bale Fiend's coming in. That is a lot of stopping power for sure, and uh, we will see how this goes. Uh, Justice Sponge, thank you for the 999. He says, let's go, Norska. Norska, getting your energy, man. You're hyping him up. Tank doing a really good job hitting and running, though. He's, like, bouncing around, just isolating whatever he can. 
classic vampire count play 101 man and uh yeah, the Berserkers, though, are getting, you know, picks, and also the Skin Wolf Werekin's getting picks, and, you know, if, if Frostbite were able to get off on a Blood Dragon Lord, that could uh, be huge, and Tank is slowly running out of chaff units, right? Um, he's got some zombies here, some skeletons, I think he's got, like, a Haggard Corpse Guard over here, and also does have some skeleton warriors hiding in the trees, which I would imagine Tank will bring out in the fourth quarter of the game, but there's a lot of damage going down in this Vampire Count army, but so too are the Norskins. Um, Berserkers are all more or less at like half health, give or take. I'm surprised we didn't see Brutes of the Hound in this build. I feel like that's kind of the direction it wanted to go, but... But the Burning Head did hit those skeletons, was able to burn through some of those guys. Vampire Counts are uh, going to be continuing to grind here with their Skeleton Warriors, and uh, Norsko just going to be taking what it can and uh, picking those guys off. Like I told you guys in the beginning of the game, the way that the Vampires usually play this matchup is they just drop a summon, throw in one unit at a time, cycle charge, harass while that's happening, and just methodically do that over the course of like a 10 or 15 minute period. It is a, it is a grindy matchup for sure. Now one Mammoth does overextend a little bit. It is able to kill a Vargeist, but at what cost? Those aren't Blood Knights, so it's not that big of a deal. And it looks like it is going to be able to get back to its ranks. Although it's about to be attacked. Honestly, I would, I would commit to this fight with Norska. I would leave the Mammoth here. Like, the Vampires are not going to want to stay in this fight. Um, the Mammoth took barely any damage, and uh, yeah, you should be able to kill a couple Black Knights and things like that here. So the Vampires are going to be moving out of the trees now. The Skeleton Warriors are coming. The Blood Knights are moving in. Both Mammoths are in good shape, and Norska still has a really scary single entity blob. Um, one unit of Argeist is in Dire Straits at six models and eight models here. Very, very damaged. Now the Mammoth is going to be bouncing out, going after the Vargeist. Might be able to tusk that bad boy, and it looks like he does get him with the Mooba Kill charge right there one zerker down four to go yeah that is a lot of berserkers to get i mean they they are meaty especially with the war shrine holy shit that is that is some serious leadership to break now a charge is coming in throg probably could turn around at this point and start clubbing on some of the blood knights definitely wouldn't be a bad idea this war shrine mammoth does get the giver of glory giving it fire damage and leadership which is definitely quite nice and this mammoth is a little bit isolated too Valkanos needs to make sure to keep everything together it's a very easy mistake to overextend to chase things you know all these units have different speeds and things like that um, but that's going to be the deciding factor. If you can stay together, I think Norska might be in decent shape. They've done a lot of damage to this little air force here, and uh, now they're able to come over here and get that Vargulf, and you know what? I would honestly just grab this whole Norskan army and start waddling towards this Necromancer. You know, the Corpse Guard's still pertinent in the late game fight, and um, I, I mean, that thing's too slow to run away from the Mammoths and the Werekin and stuff. As long as you move your whole army as one force, I know it's a little bit annoying because of the zombies to move past those guys, but yeah, we will see. Looks like some Invocation Resurrections going down. The Vargeists are getting a couple models back. Mammoths are in okay shape. A little bit tattered. Blood Knights coming in for a charge here. A little bit of a risky one, actually. They could take some damage if they don't decommit there. And it looks like they did pull back there at the last second, which is definitely smart. And the Vampire Counts just sending in their zombies and their chaff. And uh, and yeah, that's it, it's doing the trick, man. It's buying some time. Ooh, that Mammoth overextended. Oh, he's got to be careful. Hopefully he doesn't get surrounded by the Flying Goon Squad. Another Fireball going down from the Bale Fiend is able to pick off more of those Vargeist, man. They're having a hard time. And now the Blood Knights are going to be countercharging, and this Mammoth is going to be getting punished pretty bad here from Valkanos. Ouchies, ouchies, that sucks. Helm of Discord coming in. The Vampire Alpha Strike is upon us. Will Norska be able to survive this nice Wintertooth Crown? Really, really good stuff. From Throg, that gives Unbreakable to pretty much the entire Norskan army. And uh, now they could respond relatively well. These Vargeist are going to be going down here. The Vargulf taking a little bit of work as well. And the Warshine Mammoth... Though he responded well, I think he took a fair amount of damage. I don't know. The Blood Knights are still very healthy, too. And here comes another charge. Vampire Counts are a pretty micro-intensive faction. You have to be really good at cycle charging and really, really good at getting in there. So, yeah, we'll see if those Mammoths can hold the day. Now, Throg a little bit isolated in open field. But honestly, if, if I were Norsk, I wouldn't be upset about this, per se. I mean, Throg should be able to fight against the Blood Dragon Lord, especially if the Skin Wolf Ware can, can dart over here. But it looks like it's just going to be a little bit of charging as the Vargeist are being sacrificed and Berserkers are rotating their way out. And a couple of the Blood Knights uh, do take some damage. It looks like they lost three models there. A little bit of crumbling going down. Still a shit ton of Berserkers, though. And yeah, you got to be careful about getting down and dirty with Throg. Throg does have that Frostbite, and the last of those Vargeists is, is kind of crumped down now. And Frostbite should be coming in here on the Blood Dragon Lord. No, it looks like he gets away, but it does force out a summon, which is good for the Norskins, right? Because, um, you know, having to use a summon in retreat means you're not using it in an offensive sense. It's Warshine Mammoth. Definitely needs some support. Looks like it's going to be attacked here, but the other Mammoth is going to be turning around with the Berserkers. And now the Skin Wolf Werekin and company are going after that Necromancer. But this is probably what the Vampires want. Um, Norse going to be split up on two fronts. Um, here, obviously, we'll see if they can kill it quickly. The Necromancer probably should die pretty fast against the Werekin and Orthrog. 
This really is a good proper scrap. I'm gonna drink some water. I'm having some allergies lately. Yeah, the crown was a really good call. I, I definitely like that. Um, Giver of Glory could perhaps save the Warshine Mammoth from breaking. It's uh, it's really low on leadership. It's at 19 right now. Still 2,000 HP, mind you. And the Black Knights took a ton of damage, and the Blood Knights even took some casualties as well. Berserker is still wearing things down, but you gotta make sure that Warshine Mammoth doesn't overextend. Oh, I guess having it do some damage before it goes. Yeah, Giver of Glory, man. Look at the, the leadership. Must be getting so many augmentations here. Wavering, probably broken. So basically, Valkanos traded his beat-up mammoth here for that Necromancer, as well as the you know, remnants of Skeleton Warriors here, which isn't necessarily bad. The other Warshine Mammoth is still functional. Berserkers are still grinding that good grind, but now the Norskin Hero Core needs to come in and try and carry this, which they might be able to. That Warshine Mammoth is broken. It's going to take some time to you know get that guy off the battlefield to escort him. 21 leadership, 6 leadership. If this mammoth breaks, that would be really bad. Ooh, if this is overcasted, that could be pretty good. Let's see if it hits the Blood Knights. Blood Knights are down to 34 models, and it did some okay damage. Nothing beautiful, per se, but the Warshine Mammoth definitely very, very beat up right now. But Throg is here. Um, he's got a relatively good surround on many of these monsters, actually. Norska might be able to pull something back. The Wintertooth Crown, once again, a huge saving grace. Giving Unbreakable to this Mammoth is very, very strong. And the Blood Knights, uh, down to 32 models. Yeah, this is a close fight, man. This is a really, really close fight. Because the Vampire Counts... They have, what, 30 Skeleton Warriors left? Tank, I think, has... Uh, yeah, he's almost just down to single entities, which if he runs down to just single entities, he'll have to stay in combat. Um, he can use Zombie Summons to buffer that, and most really good Vampire Count players will account for that. But, um, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Yeah, there's a couple Skeletons fighting here. This could be the final battle for the Fate of Middle-Earth. We will see. So it looks like the Skeleton Warriors are going to be crumbling down here. And now the Blood Knights are saying it's the same combat. I think both players are committing to this fight pretty heavily. Berserker's rampaging here in the fourth quarter, though. is really good. And Norska is kind of pulling the balance of power back. Yeah, look at this. And the Vargulf is getting clubbed by Throg. He's being taken to the candy shop, man. A lot of damage coming in. But the Warshine Mammoth is also being ganked by Tank's Blood Dragon Lord here. The Blood Knights take some big casualties. Now they're going to be pulling back. But it looks like this uh, Vargulf probably is going to be crumbling down. I can imagine Tank not having the best wins of magic at this point in the game. He's been casting a lot of invocations and raised deads, and it looks like there's going to be some sort of witchcraft going down here. I'm not sure what. Maybe a fireball from the Veil Fiend or something? Yeah, I don't know if he has any summons left. This Vargulf, of course, is uh, staying in combat and fighting, as are the Blood Knights. And the Skin Wolf, Werken, and Throg might be able to carry this. Holy shit. This is a game. Throg getting in there with the big old steel club. The Berserker is still fighting, too, at this point in the game. is so strong. No Warshine Mammoth to uh, keep him going, although this one might come back. It, it still, you know, has some 500 HP, give or take. Throg being isolated a little bit in open fields, but the Blood Knights are grinding. But Norska is actually pulling ahead in the bounce of power. Holy shit. Blood Knights. The Blood Knights can cycle charge, yes, if, the, uh, if there's something else in combat. The Blood Knights are going after Throg. Certainly a very good choice. I'm trying to take down the, the head of the Norskin Snake here. And it looks like Throg is a little bit isolated here. This could actually be really bad for him. Invocation of the heck going down on Blood Knights. Oh, but he gets knocked over. That's actually really fortunate for Norska. If he had kept standing and getting punished there, that could have been, you know, pretty bad. But instead, Throg took a knee, and uh, it definitely bought him some time. So Blood Knights here are being grinded down, and there's no escape for them. They're frostbitten here, so they, they are going to stay the course. Here comes the Blood Dragon Lord. The Warshine Mammoth not coming back, but Throg of the Troll King is going hard, baby. I think he's going to be able to beat that Blood Dragon Lord, too, with the, uh, with the help of the Werekin. No problem. Vargulf is getting pretty low. Blood Knights are gone. Everything is gone. So now Tank uh, will need to stay in combat here, if I'm not mistaken. And he's going to be jumping in. Unless he has a zombie summon. If he gets a zombie summon, he can, you know, do a little bit of witchcraft there. It's still pretty close. But the Werekin, I think, can help carry it. Oh no, but Throg is broken! He's terrified though. Okay, it's just a terror route. It's just a terror route. There's Berserkers and the, uh, the Vargulf's going in there trying to get Throg. But Throg should be able to get away. Oh, could this be a Vampire Count comeback? Oh my god, it might be. Holy shit. Throg needs to not break. Oh, that's so painful for Valkanos. Oh my god. And Throg is being chased down by the freaking dude here. Will the Skin Wolf Werken carry this? This whole game is being put on the back of the Skin Wolf Werken. So, if he can kill the Blood Dragon Lord with the help of some Berserkers, and if the Balefiend Caster comes back and drops a Fireball, I think Throg shattered. Oh my god, Throg is shattered. But the uh, Skin Wolf Werekin is doing really well. He's taking almost no damage. Throg is actually, I think, yeah, Tank needs to pull Vargulf back. 
Oh my god, that's so close! The Werekin with the Pimp Claws. He's immune to psychology too right now. So he's not going to be terror routing to the Blood Dragon Lord. Negative three. What was... It? Oh my god. Oh my god! And the Werekin does it! The freaking Werekin slaps down the Blood Dragon Lord. Holy shit! And now he's going to be going in to fight the Vargulf. Oh my god. So Valkanos has the Werekin and the Bale Fiend. There's no way the Vargulf can win. Like, no way. <laughs> the Condom Wolf, baby. And a Fireball going down as well. Oh, he gets tagged with the Fireball too. Yep, there it goes. And the Werekin roars in triumph! <laughs> Regardless if he's allowed to chase, I mean, I would have had to evaluate that. But since Norska won anyways, like, whatever. Like, Dude, holy shit. And there you have it, guys. Let's look at the value on those units. That that where that where can win in uh, raw dog baby. <laughs> oh, three thousand two hundred value on that where can. Holy shit! Look at that. Throg with twenty eight hundred. Berserkers obviously just kind of took the punishment, but they did pretty well, and the mammoths, uh, you know, did their thing. Oh my god, that Werekin, dude. Tank played well. 4,200 on that Blood Dragon Lord. Damn, son. I feel like the Var guys are always a weak link. Like, if he had just cut these and brought other stuff, he probably would have been better off. Damn, dude. Jacob, greater than Edward confirmed. I love it. All right. So now we will go to the bracket. It's going to be Vamp or Norska against Skaven. Which used to be a bad matchup for Skaven, but I think it's much better now. So now on the top side, we're in the top four. It's Greenskins, Dwarves, Skaven, and Norska. Let me try the Discord link again. I don't know why it didn't show up in chat. Hold on. Uh, I will tell you in lobby. For you, one second here. And all right, so looks good. We're checking a couple messages here. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. Let's get this party started. I know Helmand Gorse would have carried that game for sure. No, no problem. All right, one, two, three. Oh my God, what a game, dude. That was just, I'm coming down off the high right now. Jack Daniels, thank you for the uh, 20, man. Means a lot. Uh, dude, I know there's so many games. I hope these guys are saving the replays. Like, they've been so good. All right, let's do this. Nice. Where's Satsuma? And uh, we're all set. Ephraim Va by Sigmar. That battle between Vampire Counts and Norska was a nail biter. Cheers to the players and your great casting. Thank you, man. Yeah, I mean, they, they, their great play made that great. Yeah, that was insane. That Werekin went apeshit, dude. Should probably have helped versus the Werekin. GG. Tank, well played, man. That was super good. Holy shit. You know, what's funny now is, like, if the Dwarves make it to the finals and Skaven make it to the finals, holy shit, that's going to suck so bad for the Dawi. The one time they make it, the Skaven are just waiting for them. Like, their hardest counter. Dude, Valkanos, that were you were you nervous in that game? Were you bite were you biting your nails there, man? Oh, that was a nail biter. Yeah. All right. Let's load into the game, guys. It's Greenskins versus Dwarves. Hiya. Presser, sleepy time, ASMR. Valkanos couldn't have lost. The Skin Wolves win 100% of the time, 60% of the time. Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah, they do. Yeah, that Werekin did some work. <clears throat> all right guys so we got the grudge match we got the dwarves versus greenskins i love this matchup it's always quite a bit of fun we have a donation from mike e as well he donated 39 dollars and 10 cents he said um shout out to lady turn for all her support to the channel and your recovery she'll appreciate that i'll make sure to relay your message when she uh, arrives and sorry about the uh the conversion oh dude please 
Thank you so much for the donation. That was amazing. Jack Daniels, also, give me a hell yeah, brother. My voice has been so raw today. I don't know what it is. Samuel Christensen, jumping in now. Hadri's going to do it again. Merry early Christmas, everyone. Samuel Christensen, pulling for Hadri's. That's so weird. Let me try the Discord link one more time before this game starts. Hold on. I like some... Okay. I mean, that should be showing, right? You guys see that message here. Okay, I just dropped a Discord link like 10 times. Let me know if that appears. <clears throat> Thank you guys again for your donations and your support. It makes the uh, paying the prize pull out of pocket much easier. So appreciate that one quite a bit, guys. And now let us take a look at the build. Here we go. So for the Dowie, it's going to be a defensive formation, of course. Um, we do have a mixture of Coilers and, and Thunders to you know, deal with Trolls and Goblin Archers and all sorts of good stuff. <clears throat> and we do also have all Thirds Raiders. Man, pretty cool. The Lord is going to be Belagar Ironhammer, the King of Carrick Eight Peaks. Oh yeah, dude. Check this shit out. Belagar, the true king, is returned. Such a cool looking character. So Belagar has pretty good stats and is like dirt cheap. So uh, you do see Dwarf players bring him from time to time. I have to say, it's very exciting to... Yeah, that's weird. Okay. I'll have to take a look at my chat restrictions. Am I not, like, logged in with my account or something? What the hell? Um, if anyone who's a mod in my multiplayer Discord could drop a link to the Discord in chat. Let's see if that works, or if it's on my end. It seems you can't see my messages. Yeah, I don't know why. That's so strange. Anyways. For the forces of the greenskins here, if, if it doesn't work, what I'll do is, at, when the stream goes live or the video goes up after the fact, I'll put a link to the Discord there so you guys can find your way. N regardless, you guys will get it. Galahan, thank you for the $5 donation. Save your voice with some fine Earl Grey tea. I will after the stream. So for the green skins, we got a Night Goblin Shaman. We have Night Goblins. What the hell? Goblin Rock Lobber, one, two, three. And it looks like there's going to be some Black Orcs kind of chilling in the Shadow Realm here. Yeah, so the Greenskin's baiting the Dwarves to come forward, which is very interesting. The Rock Lobber is going to be dropping some huge blows. And the Dwarves are just going to have to advance through Rock Lobbers and, you know, Cav harassing them and different things like that. So, uh, yeah, Hadrian's even posting links. I don't know what it is. Oh, you know what? Maybe it's a YouTube thing. Maybe YouTube made it. Oh, you know what? YouTube was having problems recently with people, like, dropping links to, like, haggard sites and streams. I think YouTube may have disabled links on streams. Yeah, I don't know why they're being blocked. It might have been a YouTube change. I'll take a look afterwards. So the Dowie are advancing. They're moving up fast and furious. And uh, not taking too much damage, honestly. The Grudge Throwers haven't really, or the Rock Lobbers haven't done too much damage. Uh, the Dwarves also have Quad Slayers. So yeah, there's going to be four Slayers in the back. That's a lot of meat to get through. Um, the big problem for the Dwarves is going to be Black Orcs, but... He does have Thunders. He does have Ulthar's Raiders. You know, he's got plenty of tools to deal with Black Orcs as well. So a very nice well-rounded um well-rounded uh build here in my opinion yeah gojira just tried nobody can see links okay so it might just be a youtube thing but if for anyone who's looking to join uh check in with the video after the fact when it's uploaded as a video there should be a discord link in the description or in a pinned comment so we'll do that all right guys so the dwarf horde advances taking very minimal damage you know some dwarf warriors took some rock lobber damage it's really not too bad because uh, the dwarves don't have a static army, really. I mean, it's an army that's designed to kind of move forward and have this, like, really, you know, high gun pressure and, uh, you know, coiler pressure as well. And they also have tools for dealing with skirmishing. They do, of course, have the coilers and the thunders, which are able to return fire on the Meiji Marauders. Oh, and the fanatics have been loose in the front, going through the Eckerd's Miners. <laughs> Doing a little bit of damage. That was pretty fun. And then they burn out there at the end. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's free damage, man. It's free real estate. So the Grudge Thurs, or the Goblobbers, I always get those confused, damn. They should be switched onto the Thunderers, and it looks like they have been, and they're doing some solid damage. Basically, with this green skin build... Oh, it's Scars... Oh my god, it's Scarsnick versus Belagar! Classic! You basically want to kill anything that can kill the Black Orcs. If the Black Orcs, you know, don't have AP opposition, they can pretty much just eviscerate anything and really cause some uh, serious problems. Imai says he forgot his mage. <laughs> That's pretty funny, as if the dwarves have mages. So here comes the Dwarf Warriors with Great Weapons getting ready to get crumped by some Black Orcs. We do have Slayers on the flanks. Slayers, I would imagine, will be engaging against the Dirkits Squake Hoppers. We'll see what kind of work they can get done there. 
And the Dwarf Warriors are now fighting the Squig Hoppers. Obviously a losing fight for them, but with Slayers nearby, as long as the Slayers do pile in, they should be able to kill a fair amount of these uh, Squig Hoppers, no problem. And in the front, the Fermented Fungi going down on the uh, Ekron's Miners. Interesting choice. Lowering their melee defense, maybe canceling the Blasting Charges, I suppose. Now the Black Orcs are going to be moving in. However, the Black Orcs are getting Shreks pretty hard by a combination of Blasting Charges, as well as the Marks by Ulthar uh, Raiders here, who seem to be doing some really, really good DPS. However, on this side, Black Orcs performing well and uh, kind of winning all of their respective engagements. The Rock Lobber is still shooting into the Dwarven Formation. And in the center mass, Belagar is in a little bit of trouble. His Dwarf Warriors have abandoned him, and now he's standing alone versus the Warlord of Eight Peaks, the King and the Warlord. A classic DLC. And the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass are now engaging to fight the Black Orcs, who have identified the threat. They're like, oh shit, yeah, we've got to kill these Ulthard Raiders. And for Yamais, he needs to get these guys back. It's one of the few things in his army that he has left that is still very efficient against the Black Orcs. So definitely a good idea to send the Slayers in there. Now Slayers, you know, aren't going to kill Black Orcs super efficiently, but they can get there. Their melee attack is still pretty high, and they should be able to perform well in that uh, circumstance here. Now Bounce of Power is a little bit Greenskin favored, um, but again, they have Rock Lobbers, they have Archers. If the Dwarves are able to bunker bust the Greenskin front line, which is something you don't hear terribly often, and get into the squishy parts of the Greenskin back line with the Savage Orc Arrow Boys, and, I mean, the Black Horse are holding, but yeah, I mean, that many Slayers is probably going to be enough to wear them down. And now the Dwarves have realized the threat truly lies in the back line here and are going to be bunker busting through. This rushing with all the Slayers, going in there deep and trying to hunt down Scar's Neck. And, you know, the Greenskins are kind of getting caddied into a corner here. Um, dwarves still have their Altars Raiders, really well played by Yumais here, able to keep these guys functional and alive and is getting some nice crossfire here against the Black Orcs. You can see beautiful throwing weapons. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of damage against those Black Orcs. Let's go and check the value. So far, they've accrued only 400. Interesting. I feel like they would have been much more. Anyways, Slayers are in the backfield on top of the Archers. Some of them are on top of the Rock Loppers here in just a hot moment. And these other Slayers are going to be coming in to rear charge these Black Orcs. So the Dwarves having to deal with the Black Orcs in a very, very um, aggressive fashion. But they still have the Ulthar's Raider support, which is very nice. And both units of Black Orcs are uh, kind of getting worn down a little bit. Nice play here, though, by Vicious Satsuma here in the backfield using the Dirk and Squig Hoppers to clean up the remnants of the Dwarven Missile Lines and just cause some disruption. Definitely very cost-effective. And uh, honestly, this is a pretty hard battle to call. Even though the Bounce Power does uh, pull for the Dwar or for the uh, Greenskins here, I still feel like it's a very close fight. As soon as the Slayers get on top of any of these bow units, I mean, that could be a huge problem. Warriors of Dragonfire Pass, I guess they're no mere bow units. These are Savage Orc era boys, so they're pretty good in combat. Low melee defense at 8, mind you, but um, you know, pretty good at uh, that good old scrap. So we got some Black Orcs moving in. It looks like they're being peppered by some guns that have come back. Ooh, yeah. Vicious Satsuma definitely needs to shut down these guns here. Um, those guys shooting into the Black Orcs with the marks by Ulthar potentially coming on them would be really, really bad for sure. And now you can see the Greenskins are running. They're having to pull back their Arrow Boys while the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass and the Slayers pursue them into the depths of the map. On the flank, we have Slayers chewing apart the Goblin Rock Lobber crew. And, uh, oh my god, how epic would this be if it came down to a Belagar versus Skarsnik duel? I'd be all about that. Black Orcs are surrounded. Miners do have some AP values. I mean, you know, a mass of Miners, like having like eight Miner models beating on one Black Orc, you can see they can kill it right there. And with the Slayers collapsing, Black Orcs, you know, pretty good leadership by Greenskin standards, but they're, uh, they're gonna run for the hills, man. That is a shit ton of Slayers. That is a lot. And Skarsnik is isolated. Oh, no. You know, guys... The Dwarves might be able to bounce over here. I would probably send some Slayers after Skarsnik. He only has 50 armor. Um, Slayers plus Belagar, you know, just hunting Skarsnik. He could be dead here. Um, it looks like we do have... Oh, oh, this could be something too. The Night Goblins are coming in. We could see some Fanatics loosed here. That would be really cost-effective against the, uh, the Slayers. So they're piling into fight. Slayers will obviously massacre them, but if there's a really good Fanatic ball and chain, that could make all the difference. And I think this could actually get the Dwarves back in the game. Yumai is coming in hard with the Karate Kick. Belagar with the... Uh, Using some karate here on uh, Skarsnik. Also able to get a shield bash. Skarsnik has 35 speed. Belagar is quite a bit slower when he's poisoned here. But the duel of duels. The warlord is being chased by the king. Oh, the dwarven headbutt. Dude, it's, ha it's happening. It's happening. We got Belagar versus Skarsnik in the duel of duels. We'll see how this goes. I wonder if they have any sync animations for one another. So the dwarves do have some gun support. So it's certainly not going to be a fair fight, which is pretty funny. Because usually the goblins cheat. But in this case, the dwarves are cheating and interrupting the duel with, um, you know, slayers and guns and things like that. So, we'll see how that goes. Holy shit, this is a scrappy-ass game. So, Savage Orc Air Boys probably will beat those Dwarf Warriors. Black Orcs here should beat these Miners, and uh, the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass should be able to push those Savage Orc Air Boys off the map. But the Wah has resounded in the valley once more. 
And Skarsnik is really doing very well considering he's being attacked by Slayers also. You gotta give him some big props for this, man. Gotta give him some big props. How's he doing? Alright, so it looks like he's at 3,000 HP. Belagar appears to be 3,400. Uh, you know, Skarsnik's HP pool is quite a bit bigger, so... You have to take that into account with uh, him and Gobla. For the Ancestors, indeed, it looks like some Wolfrider archers coming in, but they are shattered by some gunfire on the approach. The Fanatics were able to actually fight off the Slayers and win, apparently, but there's only two of them left. So the Miners of Blasting Charges should be able to win that fight. But Skarsnik going down here is a pretty painful loss. However, there still are Black Orcs rallying on the edge of the map. It looks like we do have a, a battalion of Black Orcs, or I guess just 17 of them. And the Savage Orc Arrow Boys are putting some hurt on the Slayers here. The Rock Lobber crew with a little bit of ammunition can come in, and uh, it looks like the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass were able to push off the Savage Orc Arrow Boys before falling to the Night Goblin Squid Copper. So, very well played there. So now back here, we do have Belagar Iron Hammer. <coughs> Getting that big, fat Iron Hammer. And Skarsnik is shattered, and the Dwarves pull ahead in the Bounce of Power for the first time in the game. Holy shit, this is a scrap. We've had some really, really solid stuff. <laughs> Cheating is an, honor uh, an honorable minor grudge compared to letting Skarsnik live. Mike E, I agree with your assessment 110%. We have a donation from the Melee Slon during the game saying, Run those <laughs> run those dwarven legs. Dude, thank you for the $40, Melee Slon. This shit is getting heated. But it looks like the dwarves. King Belagar, for some reason fighting in the desert, has reclaimed Carrick Eight Peaks from Skarsnik. The warlord has been slain. Do you guys know what this means? This means a Dawi Finals. This means we're going to have the Dwarves in the Grand Finals. They've never been there in the history of Faction Wars. You know? Holy shit. Now, they just got to pray that the Skaven do not win on that other side. They got to pray, dude, to any Ancestor God they can find. So here comes Miners with Blasting Charges chasing here. Obviously, this little Goblin Shaman is still hidden, which is uh, pretty cool. But, yeah, the Greenskins I don't think have any chance. There's... There's still, you know, Quarrelers. We got guns over here. Belagar is still functional here on the battlefield. And, um, and yeah. That's looking to be it, man. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of chasing shit down at this point. I, I don't think there's, uh, I don't think there's any chance the Greenskins have. I don't know why these Thunders are, are wavering here. They should be able to tear into that, uh, Hammer of Gore crew. And the last of the Savage Orc Arrow Boys in the corner of the map are going to be hunted down by the Slayers of Umais. And here they come. Tihan Anoin, thank you for becoming a member here on the channel. Welcome to the Dukes and Dukettes of Haggard. Appreciate having you here. And thank you again for your support, man. Dozer Roman says, uh, thank you, Dozer, again, for your huge donation earlier. Um, shaping up to be your favorite uh, Faction War by Turin. Really exciting games across the board. Yeah, it's been amazing. The players, we, we really have some solid players here today that are doing very, very well. Probably a more even matchup for the Dawi in the finals would be Norska. So, yeah, the Dwarves are going to have to pray for, uh, for a Norskin victory. And the dwarves have done it! The Groge has been satisfied! Wiped out of the book! Belagar, paying for himself more or less. Slayers did great. It was just an awesome game, man. I like the build by Satsuma too. I think the Rock Lobber builds can work pretty well. Skarsnik is the only thing I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence about. I feel like Grom the Paunch is just so much better. Um, Skarsnik's anti-large and, you know, his snares aren't that good against dwarves. That's the only thing I don't like about this build, but aside from that, I think it's pretty solid. Hadrius is like, let's let's see. All right. Yes, the grudge has been satisfied. And the dwarves are in the grand finals to face the winner of Hadrius and Valkanos. So let's get that party started. GG, well played. Satsuma says, should have brought a simpler build. Most likely so, my friend. It's sometimes when you overthink it is when you lose those games, you know? Dude, the Werken victory might have been the best. Yeah, so far. I am part Irish, so that makes sense. That I would sound Irish when I do the dwarves. Um, all right. Valkanos versus Hadris. Here we go. Let's get in that lobby. Spectate this bad boy. I pray to Grungi that the Dawi will win the faction war. That would be pretty epic for sure. That would be pretty epic. It would be a first. It would be a first. All right. Good luck, have fun. Let's minimize, update the nameplates, and we're good to go, guys. Oh, who's on what side? Okay, Valkanos is on the left. Perfect. Valkanos. Hadris. 
the battle of battles. One sec, guys. I'll be back in just a second. Going to get some water and uh, we'll get this party started in just a moment. All right, guys, I'm back. Needed to get some water. I was struggling. And it looks like we have loaded into the game, so let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at the armies that these two championship players have brought. So let's go. Now, before the DLC, this used to be a matchup that many Skaven players did not like because of Skin Wolves. However, I think the meta has changed quite a bit, and the Skaven have some new toys to uh, fight with here. Throt, you know, they can use Wolf Rats to chase down Skin Wolves. It's changed quite a bit. Oh, I'm ready for this finals, guys. It's time. I'm going on four hours of sleep right now. No mercy. After this, I'm just going to lay down and eat some uh, some good old Polish food, and we'll call it a day. All right, guys. So for the forces here of Valkanos, it's going to be a Marauder front line backed up by Berserkers and Javelins with a couple Skin Wolves with armor, actually. So Armored Skin Wolves is a nice tech against the Wolf Rats because Wolf Rats have pretty poor AP unless you bring the AP variant, which they usually don't. So having the extra armor could actually help them uh, fight off the wolf rats a little bit better. We got Throg, we got a Firecaster, and more Skin Wolves on the far side. I like this build by Valkanos. It's, it's nice. He also has the Mistalkers here in the middle for a little bit of uh, terror and also punch. So for Hadries, Hadries has got Night Runners. He does have a Packmaster on a Brood Horror and a Grey Seer of Plague on a Bell. So he's going to be getting the Unholy Clamor to give leadership to his whole army. Storm Vermin with the Sword and Shield, Poison Wind Mortars, Hell Pit Abomination, Arwar pit fighters and wolf rats in the back to chase down skin wolves and things like that. So as far as new tools, he's got the pack master, wolf rats, as well as the pit fighter ROWRs. But aside from that, more or less old school in many ways. And uh, let's see how this goes. So you follow a certain schedule when you're doing faction wars, uh, mainly just once a month, Dustin Daniels. I have, I try to have one for every month. Uh, although I think I missed a month before because of uh, 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 Everchosen was happening and also I was a little bit under the weather, so. Why doesn't stuff like that, that show up on your, your YouTube feed? Oh, I have no idea. Karatekin, any tips for painting Plague Surgeons? Um, yeah. So, you're painting a Plague Surgeon, right? Uh, spray prime that, that dude, you know, Death Guard Green, and then do a base coat of Death Guard Green, just, or you don't even need to, you could just spray prime it. Balthazar Gold for his trim. For his cloak, you want to use a Screecher or, or Screamer Pink or whatever. Um, for his flesh, I just use Rackarth with a wash of uh, Caribou Crimson, and then over that you use um, a Pallid Wish Flesh to do some layering. For the metallics, you know, you just use Lead Belcher, wash the freaking metallics and his green armor with uh, with uh, Agrax Earthshade, and then from there you want to edge highlight with um, Ogre and Camo and all the green armor pieces, and then any you know fleshy parts, just Caribou wash, you know. That's, that's more or less the direction I go. I could, I could go on about it, but it would take me another like couple minutes to give you all the details I do. But hopefully that helps, man. Thank you for the donation. All right, guys, so the battle is underway. Looks like there's going to be some summons going down here from the Clan Rats, and now the Poison Wind Mortars are going to begin, be going to begin their orbital bombardment here of the uh, Chaos Marauders and getting some good damage right out of the gates. Norska pulling back very wisely. You don't want to take that engagement out with the Wolf Rats there. If Hadri's got all those Wolf Rats like, swarming, uh, with the Packmaster, that could be a very, very ugly situation. Skaven Summons, of course, being used as a bit of a roadblock, so you just use the Clan Rat Summons to uh, buy some time and kind of hold things back. But Hadrius is going hard for this engagement. Does Norska have any support? Oh, this could actually be really, really bad for Norska. Oh, uh, that pains my soul. So what's happening over here, guys, and we, you know, the lag actually gives us a little bit of a time to, to discuss this, is that the Armored Skin Wolves are now isolated by Wolf Rats, by a Packmaster, if the Wolf Rats can, if the Warhounds, or excuse me, the Skin Wolves can hold 
until the Berserker support gets there, they could be okay. But man, oh man, that's actually a pretty scary situation. Now, aside from that, the Norskin Horde is going to be advancing on the main Skaven army. Berserkers being peppered. Javelins advancing over here with the support of the Skin Wolves. But really, this is what we want to keep an eye on here. Berserkers are going to be coming in. If the Skin Wolves can maintain here, this might actually end up being a good trade for Valkanos. The Armored Skin Wolves really showing how much more durable they are here. But the big problem is, is if the Skin Wolves do break to the Wolf Rats, then they're gone. They're out of the battle. They're not coming back because the Wolf Rats are going to be able to hunt them down with no mercy. Unless maybe these Norskin Warhounds are able to pile in and get some good value and uh, push back the Wolf Rats. We'll see. So Norska's main force has now reached the Skaven lines. We got some Skin Wolves in the back line getting ready to try and penetrate in. Miststalkers with Throg going to be fighting the Storm Vermin, which is actually a fair amount of AP. And where, where are the Javelins going to go? Javelins probably want to go after the Hellpit Abomination. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty tense fight. Honestly, Skaven pretty far ahead after having won that engagement. Um, the Norskin army should have stayed tighter together because it allowed the Skaven mobility, which is a brand new thing to go after the Marauder Berserkers here. Those guys got picked. Um, these Skin Wolves are off the battlefield, and suddenly, you know, it looks like a pretty disastrous fight here for Norska. You know, just, and I'm telling you guys, it's what I've been saying, like, this matchup became good because of Wolf Rats. They just are so annoying for Norska. Now, in the backfield, we have Armored Skin Wolves being hunted by the Pit Fighters. Uh, they do take the charge, which sucks for them. However, uh, the Skin Wolves should probably still have a chance of winning that engagement. Norska's going to have to make some huge, huge progress here to have any chance. Like, they're going to have to really penetrate into these lines. And, you know, these Skin Wolves will have to win this fight. Granted, Unholy Clamor giving the entire Skaven army some fat leadership is uh, very, very nice. Yeah, Berserker is getting worn down. Miststalker is being dragged down just by Skaven bodies. Hellpit Abomination is here as well with its anti-large against Miststalkers. And I just don't think there's any chance for Norska. I know it might seem a little bit early to call the game, but... um. I guess some of the Skin Wolves did come back. Clinton Morgan, thank you for the $20 donation. I've always felt that Clinton is a very epic name. Thank you so much. It looks like the Dawi are in trouble. <laughs> yeah, Yumais, if you're in chat, I want to know, Yumais, in this very moment, how are you feeling? <laughs> what, what are the emotions that are running through your head? That's not to say it's, I don't know, maybe Throg. If Throg could, like, kill this freaking Hellpit Abomination, that could be a really nice start. And also, you know... Valkanos has done a really good job getting on top of the uh, the Poison Wind Mortars with these Berserkers. So maybe, just maybe, there's a sliver of hope here for the Norskins. I want there to be some hope. I want there to be a good proper scrap. And that's a nice pick, actually. The Skin Wolves were able to break the Pit Fighters in a very decisive manner. And um, yeah, now they could potentially come back around and cause some disruption. And Throg is doing some great work here. Yeah, he's, he's getting in there. He's killing this Hellpit Abomination. You know what? If the Hellpit Abomination dies, I think it'll be safe to say that Norska might actually have a chance of getting back into this game. Uh, that'll give the Miststalkers pretty good pressure, uh, but the Mortars are back online, which is pretty painful. The Mortars could shoot into this blob and really, really nuke the Norskin forces. He definitely needs to use his Armored Skin Wolves and really, really get around and uh, shut down those Mortars, because those things are just going to kill like everything that he loves and holds dear. Hellbit Abomination is on Death's Bed. All right, all right, we're working with something here. But look at this, the Wolf Rats piling in with spears. That's going to be so much stopping power, man. Those Armored Skin Wolves, though, were a really good tech choice. Oh, and too horrible to die, Prox. And with that, the uh, hopes and dreams, perhaps, of this Norskin army may also be dying. Not sure. Storm Vermin actually holding pretty well, which is quite cool. And it looks like the Skaven are going to be dropping a summon. Could this be the dreaded Norskin comeback? I mean, Valkanos has come back from worse. He does have a Shaman Sorcerer Fire. A Fireball and the Hellpit Abomination might continue to keep it breaking off the battlefield. He really needs to get on that border team, though. Man, they're doing so much work, just shrekking all the infantry. However, they're also friendly firing these Skaven troops nearby. And, um, yeah, I mean, some of them are breaking, too. Storm Vermin with the Sword and Shield are starting to break. But there's still a freaking Packmaster and a Grey Seer here, and the Mortars are still going. If the Hellpit Abomination breaks, I'm willing to say Norsk has a chance. But if this thing comes back, I'd, I'd be very hesitant. You could see here he's trying to rally it, but the Hellpit just does not want to come back. I'm surprised it hasn't. Okay, this could get interesting. If this Hellpit goes off the battlefield, Hadrius could be in some trouble. It's broken. Nothing else really matters too much. A fat burning head going down. Oh my god, that hell pit just does not want to come back, man. And look at the bounce power as it goes. It's probably going to add back towards the middle a little bit. Look at that. And the what did the Skaven Slaves come out of it when it runs off the edge of the map? I've never seen that. Wow. All right. So now Throg might be able to carry this. If Throg can now kill the Grey Seer, you know, that's something, man. Because then, I don't know, but there's like nothing left for Norska except for Throg. 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 Is there a Throg chant going on in chat? It looks like there might be. That's really unfortunate for Hadrius, though. The fact that it didn't come back, that's really, really rough. 
Is he gonna get the Grace here? Unholy Clamor is keeping this bad boy fighting. Throg is even kicking this thing at this point. He's, he's desperate. But now the Wolf Rats are gonna pile in with the Packmaster. Um, Norska does have some Skin Wolves back, I think, and some Norskin Hounds. But the Mortars are out of ammo now at this point. Balance of Power is very even. I mean, if Throg can go Super Saiyan and, like, you know, kill the Packmaster in this blob, maybe. Looks like a Fireball is gonna be coming from the Shaman Sorcerer to hit this guy. And it hits him. Only does about 200 damage, but Throg is, he's making his last stand, um, but he's being attacked by quite a bit. Yep, two leadership, negative four, negative 18, negative four. Throg is broken and terrified. That is very, very rough. A beautiful scrap though, man. It That actually ended up being a really, really cool game. Like I, I thought Valkanos was gonna be out of it early with the engagements, but he's really showing that he's a tenacious player and did a great job getting back into this match here. Looking forward to having you back in future tournaments, Valkanos. Very well played. He also does have a YouTube channel, but since links aren't working, you will have to link it after the fact. But it's going to be Dwarves and Skaven in the finals. Oh, boy. This is going to be something. A tiny Mouse with a donation of $5. Thank you so much. He says, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Dark Tide? Oh, uh, I have no idea. I'm going to play it. That's all I can tell you. I'm going to cover it. Yeah, he wishes he had his crown. Yeah, for sure. What a great scrap. Um, that engagement early definitely cost him being a little bit split up like that, but um, he still almost came back. It was great. Armored Skin Wolves are really good tech. I love that from Valkanos. He's kind of taught me that lesson. Um, and yeah, Hadri's build was solid. You know, Wolf Rats, they, they're what win you the engagements. Wolf Rats are just super beast. A thousand value on that one, a thousand and five hundred. I mean, come on. They, this Wolf Rat did more val gold value than the Helped Abomination. But the Mortars being alive for so long was also very painful. Yep, GG well played. GG, well played. Um, all host finals. All right. So finals is a best of three. So uh, faction war finals. It's fine. That'll, that'll do the trick. Very good. Um, faction war finals. Let me tell the players. And Hadri's. Very good. So the first map we're going to be on is going to be the Ogham Shard. <laughs> Congrats to Hadri's for winning. We'll see, guys. We'll see. Don't count the Dowie out. Dozer Roman, thank you for the tenor. New contract issued. The shameful hell pit abomination. I know the Wolf Rats showed him who was boss. It's an FBI password, I know. It's super, super next level. So we'll get in here for the grand finals. And uh, for now, we can go and chill on the uh, the bracket. And update it. So Hadris has advanced on. And it is here. The grand finals are upon us. It's going to be dwarves against these bad boys. All right, perfect. Everything looks good. Just got to make sure they can see my lobby for some reason. So I always switchcraft with that. Okay. I'm gonna do this, do this. Thank you guys all for joining on this journey. It's been amazing. It's a, it's a pleasure to be hanging with you guys in this glorious holiday season. 2020 coming to an end, the cursed year. No longer shall we suffer. All right, looks good. So let's go ahead and find these guys on my friends list, get them all invited to the games and uh, We'll get the finals underway. Now, if Dwarves were to beat Skaven, that would be the upset of the ages. That would be some seriously heavy metal shit. All right. Um, Hadris is here. Let's invite him to the lobby. And Yamais should be on my friends list as well. The Dwarves are coming. If semifinals were best of three, the tournament would take like over five hours. Yeah, all right. So the first map is going to be Ogham uh, Shard. 
Oh, where is that? Is it the Ogham Shard? I think it is. The Ogham Shard. Where the hell is that? There it is. Perfect. All right. Good luck. Have fun. So they're going to pick their armies now, and we can uh, hang out and just enjoy the scenery while they do that. It might take a little bit of time, obviously, for the other matchups. Players are able to select all their armies in uh, a rapid succession, but here it uh, you know takes a little bit of time in the finals. So Hadri's versus Yumais. Carrot Shell, great games today. Let's go, Dowie. Well, we'll see what they can do, man. Perhaps the mass change has helped. Yumai says this dark monstrosity of a map. Yeah, dark mood lighting. <laughs> um, so remember, this is best of three. Just reminding the players that the grand finals of Faction War are indeed best of three. So, you know, if, if your first build fails, you can switch things up. You can do it to it. Uh yeah, I have no idea how that help at Abomination didn't rally. Like, it it had a lot of time. So Shetland Apache, who is a Dawi specialist in chat, says Dawi have some options. They can Slayer Rush with Ranger support. They can go with Artillery play if Line of Sight is nice. Um, they can also go Air Force. Okay, very cool. Uh, yeah, there was a time when Rune of Wrath and Rune did magic damage. That was Those, those were the days. I used to love using that. You'd have a rune lord and double rune smith and just have three runes of wrath and rune just nuking everything. Yumais didn't know it was best of three. But now he does. So he can he can build build accordingly and be a little bit experimental if he wants to. Dwarven Air Force is good here too. Yeah, I, I think the steam cannons are really nice. If you go with like five gyros and just fly over, you can usually kill the Skaven weapons teams. The problem is killing Death Runners. Those those mothers do so much work against uh, the Dowie. Too horrible to rally, I know. I know. Well, honestly, I think the Rune of Wrath and Rune that has a slowing effect would probably be better against Skaven anyways. Were there some Skin Wolves chasing big NACL? If there were, then perhaps that, that explains the help it not coming back. Flying Rats, oh my god. Yeah, Valkanos, great games, man. You, I thought you might actually come back there with Throg when the Hell Pit broke off the battlefield. I was like, man, oh, Val I thought you were doomed, man. When that first like engagement with the Wolf Rats happened, I was like, oh, that's trouble. And the Berserkers died, but then you uh, you scrapped back really well, man. <clears throat> Thomas Green in chat saying, next DLC Skaven can build scrap TIE Fighters. <laughs> Just do like bombardment runs with lasers over the battlefield. Oh, so Valkanos was pathing his skin wolves after him. All right, that explains it. Yeah, I was surprised it didn't come back. It had like 60 leadership. Yeah. Pick Tretch? Oh my god, no. So yeah, players, uh, we'll give them like 5-10 minutes to pick their armies. Do you think, uh, do you agree with the Sunfang nerf? Did it get nerfed? <laughs> I mean, nobody ever uses it anyways. I don't think it needed to be nerfed. Are, we, are you talking about Tyrion's sword? Yeah, I, I don't know. That didn't need to be nerfed, in my opinion. You needed two more wins for a burning head. Oh, that hurts the soul, man. Oh, you mean Sea Fang? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's still good. I think. I don't know why they nerfed it. I don't think it needed to be nerfed. Yeah. Yeah. If you had gotten a burning head on that blob, it would have broken the rats, and Throg might have been able to carry the game. That's actually that actually could have happened. Yeah. Norska versus dwarves in the final would have been much better for the dwarves for sure. I mean, I think Norska and Dowie have a good matchup. I think it's fun. I <clears throat> uh, can't wait for the next patch when the Skaven shoves some slaves into a gyrocopter and make a ratocopter. Oh my god, a ratrocopter. We better have a lore battle. So a lore battle would be Thorgrim versus Deathmaster, Thorgrim versus Queek. Um, those are all lore battles with the existing lords. Because Thorgrim kills Queek. In the lore, and then Deathmaster assassinates Thorgrim in the end times, which is end times just doesn't count. It's stupid, but um, I mean, it still is a lore friendly battle. Yeah, Deathmaster is pretty good against dwarves. I actually like him with an assassin. Queek, you know, if there is a matchup where Queek is good, it is dwarves. Queek can pretty much outduel most of the dwarven lords, or at least do very well against them for his cost. Uh, let's see. Seems okay. Let's hope for the best.
All right, and it's on. Game one, Hadris versus Umayis, Skaven versus Dwarves. A classic Warhammer fantasy duel. Hadris bring a jank build. We know you can... Uh... You know, you don't want to under underestimate the Dwarves, though, because if you meme against them and then, like, Umayis has this really awesome, you know, big brain build. Also, mass changes will potentially help Dwarves here if the Skaven go with, like, Doom Players and Do Doom Wheels and things like that. So, you, you, I wouldn't mess around here, you know. I would, I, I would definitely go for the throat. It's the Grand Finals. Richard Long, always watching the content. First time Super Chat. Hey, man, I appreciate that, Richard Long. You have a little panda bear as your picture or something, it looks like. Awesome, awesome stuff. I appreciate your work. Hey, thank you, man. Appreciate you. So Hadri's going with the Old Faithful. This is like the old bread and butter. Oh, Queek Headtaker! You guys asked for him, and he's here. So it's Queek with a Dwarf Gouger, an Assassin, and a Plague Priest. Aside from that, we do have triple Warplock Gisele, double Clan Rat, and in the backfield, we do have a, a million Death Runners, no surprise, a couple Skaven Slave Slingers against Gyrocopters, and that is it. So basically, Gisele's Death Runners, Hero Goon Squad, call it a day. Yeah. And let's look at the Dwarf Army. For the Dwarves, they've opted to go with uh, a cannon, another cannon here. His battle line is going to be Dwarf Warriors made with great weapons and basic Dwarf Warriors with the Grudge Thrower. Um, he has Gotrek, no, he has Belagar, a Thane, as well as Felix, and he does have the Dawi Royal Air Force, which is going to be the gyrocopters with these steam cannons, which is a good choice. Pretty cool build. Yeah, I think this, if, if you come in with a Slayer Ranger Vanguard against like a build like this, I think actually the dwarves might win. But I don't know if Yumais plays that way. Yeah. Yep. No mortars. Gisales can do the trick and Death Runners can kill the infantry. I'm really curious how this is going to go. I mean, I honestly think the Dwarves have a pretty good chance here. Their army is uh, pretty good. Thane, Felix, I mean, that's a nice little hero squad too. They can certainly fight the Dwarf characters. Although Belagar gets massacred by Queek. Like, in a straight duel, Belagar will just get annihilated by Queek. So, um, a little concerning in that respect. <clears throat> it's not a cannon. So we have a Grudge Thrower. We have a Great Cannon back here. And we have another Grudge Thrower. Okay. No, two and two. So two cannons, two Grudge Throwers. And aside from that, the dwarves are going to be boxing up, which is no surprise. One of the biggest things is getting the gyrocopters to kill the death runners, because those guys are going to be an unholy pain in the ass. There's no blasting charges in this army either, so that's another good way of killing death runners. Yeah. A dreaded grudge thrower, I know. Grudge throwers will do some decent work. I mean, they can. If you can get vision of the death runners, you know, scout them out real quick. Hadris has one right here. Um, it looks like a couple on the far side as well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a hard matchup. It's eating my bit rate for breakfast. What is this map? Are you guys saying there's a little bit of lag? The lighting is pretty bad on this map, yeah, but it's a cool map. I think it's like has some really neat terrain. It's pretty well balanced in my opinion. It has like forests on the side to work with. <clears throat> I really like this map. I think it's quite cool. Poorly lit, yes, but quite neat looking. Yumai says, satisfy the grudge in chat. Good luck, have fun. The grand finals are upon us. For Hearth and Home, for the Horned Rat, let us know in chat, where do your allegiances lie? The Dowie or the Skaven. I think their deployments are all set. Gyrocopters have taken a relatively spread formation across the board. One of, wanting to cover and check for vanguards. Skaven, you know, could potentially do some nasty vanguards on you also. So, Miners with Blasting Charges can do some good work here. Absolutely. They're uh, pretty cost-effective. There is one Blasting Charge. Is there? Yes, there is. And it looks like it's going to be Miners, uh, just basic Miners. So no Ekron's Miners or anything fancy like that. The Gyrocopters, immediately going to be looking for uh, rats on the flanks. Hadris, though, is a very cunning Skaven Warlord. And here you can see he's going to be advancing with his horde and uh, flanking with the Death Runners, trying to stay out of sight of the Gyrocopters. That is the big thing. If the Death Runners can engage... If the Death Runners can engage, sorry, all the Dwarf and Skaven hype in chat is get, getting me hyped as well. But if you can, you know, minimize damage on the approach with the Death Runners, you're going to be uh, more or less in very, very good shape. And the Gyrocopters still haven't found them. Concealment bombs make them very, very hard to see. Looks like the first wave of Death Runners have been discovered here. But they use Concealment bombs again. Oh, but they're still visible. This is the Vixtrin's Death Squad too. So I'd probably switch Grudge Throwers onto this. Like, you really, really need to kill that Vixen's Death Squad. Those guys are no joke. Now, the Dwarven Cannons and Artillery are doing pretty well against the Warplock Gisales. They're able to shoot back and, uh, yeah, they're doing some good damage. One Gisale probably going to be breaking. And honestly, they haven't been able to draw a line of sight yet, which is uh, quite nice. 
And now this is uh, what Steam Cannons are all about. Just getting good crossfire on the Vixen's Death Squad here, although they're not taking much damage at all. Yeah, looks like they're more or less in good shape. Oh, there's actually a Brimstone Gun here too, so they're not all Steam Cannons, but... Yeah, you guys are going to see. The Vixen's Death Squad will massacre these Dwarf Warriors so fast um, if they don't get some support. Death Runners have engaged in the front line. The Dwarves are uh, trying to hold them back. And here on the backside, though, really good engagement for the Dowie. He actually got Belagar and his Hero Squad and was able to push back those Death Runners, which is an incredibly strong start for the Dwarves. On top of that, the Vixen's Death Squad is going to be getting put in the can here pretty good by the Steam Cannons. And the Dwarf Warriors are steady and they're holding. They are getting properly supported by the Steam Cannons, and they might actually be breaking here. Now, front line, a bit of a scrap. You can see the Death Runners have engaged with the Clan Rats, and I would imagine Queek Headtakers in there somewhere as well. And, you know, what another issue for the Skaven is, is if the Death Runners get neutralized and the Gyrocopters can go kill the Gisales, that's going to give the Dwarves complete aerial dominance. Now, as far as this bounce of power goes, it's relatively even at this point, I suppose. Although, it looks like the Dwarves are a little bit ahead, actually, which is uh, certainly a rare sighting here. Plague Monks being summoned by Hadris. A really nice play to shut down the Grudge Thrower and the Artillery pieces, which are really dominating the range game. And yeah, it seems like the Dwarves are in pretty good shape. The, the Grudges are, are definitely being satisfied. I would imagine Yumais has probably prepared for this matchup, um, knowing that it's it's very likely the Skaven will do very well here in this uh, this tournament, as they have been in the past. Hadris has always performed very well. But you still got to watch out for the Goon Squad. Queek Headtaker, Plague Priest, Assassin. Doing a really good job bunker busting through. Death Runners have engaged once again, and those dwarf warriors are going to be getting put down pretty bad. And, you know, if the dwarves start to lose artillery pieces in the back to the summons and the different pressure pieces, that is going to be a really, really rough day at the uh, office. It's one gyrocopter, the brimstone gun, trying its best to uh, chase down the Gisales back here, but it is being peppered by Skaven Slave Slingers. Bounce of power is uh, pretty damn even. Hadri's with a really nice compromise here. He's able to take out the cannons, and now, yeah, the cannon crew should just run at this point. Because um, ideally, at some point, they can come back. And these are just summons. These are Plague Monk summons and Clan Rat summons. But that does pull the balance of power back. Now, this is going to be probably the deciding factor in this battle to some extent. Um, the Dwarven Lords and characters are all together, but the Skaven are coming for them. Now, if the Dwarven Hero Squad is able to beat the Skaven Hero Squad, I think that the Dwarves might be able to win this game. But yes. it's really going to come down to this. Um, Steam Cannons blasting into the Skaven uh, support with the Clan Rats. And uh, honestly, the hero squad for the dwarves is doing okay, but it looks like the Skaven are focusing down Felix Jaeger, which is definitely the right play. Uh, getting rid of the healing, he has the lowest leadership, he's the easiest to break, but, you know, Queek could also take some big damage back. Um, you know, Queek is relatively tanky, he's got pretty good armor against the Thane, but yeah, killing the Assassin is a much easier pick, so... Trading the Assassin for Felix, I think, is definitely worth it. Um, Bounce of Power is still a little bit favored for the Dawi, as we do have Dwarf Warriors piling in here, and the Assassin... Did take a, a righteous hammering, but um, Felix is in big trouble. The Assassin and a Queek. Oh, the one-two punch! And Felix is going to be going down for the count here, most likely. He's broken. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Queek coming for his head for sure and uh, definitely getting it. And the Assassin is, I think, still alive as well. Felix is still running around somewhere. Yeah, he's still going. That Skaven Assassin is shaken. And Felix is now broken. The Skaven Summons should be disappearing soon. Gyrocopters are now back. Um, the Gyrocopters... Could be relatively useful at killing the Assassin. But yeah, yeah. Queek versus Belagar. Oh, that's a rough one. Although the Thane should be relatively tanky. I mean, Queek is at half health too. Felix is completely shattered. But now we have three Skaven characters, including a Plague Priest here. Yeah, the Gyrocopters are really going to have to do some heavy lifting. So the Grudge Thrower crew could be coming back. Cannon crew coming back as well. Um, Skaven are pretty much out of the picture as it pertains to the Gisales. So really, this whole game is going to fall onto the back of Belagar, who gets a flying jump kick into the face of Queek. Queek is probably going to want to disengage here. Um, Skaven are also relying relatively heavily on summons here. So if the summons do disappear, um, that could be a big variable as well. Thane and Belagar able to punch back the Assassin. The Assassin taking some big damage. Hadri is pulling the game back, though. Balance of power is pretty damn even right now. But yeah, again, like I said, it's all going to come down to the hero fighting. And the Skaven support, the Plague Monks are all going to be wavering off, but the Thane is getting... Punished so badly. Queek Headtaker just doing so much damage. And Belagar not quite able to keep up with the DPS of Queek. Queek has much better AP. Belagar has to work against Queek's armor, which is relatively decent at 110. Or not relatively decent, which is really good. Um, and now Queek is just hunting Belagar. Trophy Heads is active. I think Belagar is going to be dying here. The Dwarves still do have some artillery pieces coming back. But Death Runners are sweeping back in in the fourth quarter here. Man, what a close game. What a close game indeed. But I just don't think the Dwarves did well enough in the hero fight. Um, 
Because Queek is just so good at killing dwarf characters. Like, he's designed for that. That's the one... That's his one purpose in all of this game, is killing dwarf characters. He's good at nothing else. Gyrocopter interference, definitely nice. But Belagar is still um, really suffering here. 1500 against Queek's 1500. So more or less the same leadership. If by some Christmas miracle, um, Belagar could defeat Queek, that would give the dwarves a chance in this game. But I don't think that's going to happen. Bombing runs coming down here. Because Belagar was brought to be cheap. He has nothing. He has no items. He doesn't have his rune stone. He doesn't have his revenge incarnate. If he had those, maybe he could fight back. But without that, like, you know, Queek brought all his gear. Dwarf gouger, you know, the armor, like all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's go and take a big look around the battlefield. We got some dwarves on the periphery. And it looks like a dwarven cannon crew might be getting back online here in a second. But there are some Skaven slaves who should be able to chase him down. And now Belagar has been slain by Queek Headtaker. Belagar does have items. You can bring them. But um, you might have opted not to, which... I understand, because he's going for a cheap option, trying to get more forces. Um, also, having Felix die so quickly was um, a really, really tough situation. But just goes to show that even though it is a bad matchup for the dwarves, they can still win it. Like, if a little bit of micro had been slightly different in the hero fight, could have gone the other way. 100%. Um, but Felix dying so quickly was definitely very painful. So Gyrocopter's flying overhead. Belagar being pebbled, pebbled by the Skaven Slave Slingers. Dwarf Warriors making their last stand here, but the Skaven Slaves able to shut down the Cannon Crews. Okay, the Thane is actually back. I mean, maybe a Cannon? Like, maybe if a Cannon can get back online and just start blasting Queek? Yeah. Grombrindle would probably beat Queek in combat. Uh, I don't know, actually. It's hard to say. With Dwarf Gouger plus um, Trophy Heads, maybe not. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. So the Gyrocopter is going to be chasing down the Plague Crease here, which is a very good play. This game isn't over yet. There's still a Thane. There's still a fair amount of Dwarven infantry left. The Skaven are a little bit light on the ground. They do have some Death Runners coming back, which is certainly nice. But Belagar dying. <clears throat> definitely uh, definitely hurts pretty bad. So these Dwarf Warriors making their Valiant last stand. Here are these guys who are about to be ganked by the uh, Death Runners, which is going to be super painful. Death Runners will, of course, finish them off. The Thane is going to be unifying the remnants of the Dwarven forces up here on the high ground. Gyrocopter Cycle Charging could be something else to consider as well. Um, maybe just, you know, hammering back and forth with those guys. It might be um, impactful. We'll see. Yeah, Plague Priest getting chased down. 670 here on him. No way he's coming back. Not with the gyros on his tail. And it looks like there's another gyrocopter coming from the other side of the battlefield. But Queek Headtaker is uh, not going to let the dwarves rally too much. You know, he's moving in. <clears throat> and he's got Vermin as Valor too. So he can push away the other dwarves and then go for the Thane, which is definitely the right play. And uh, here he comes, man. Skaven Slave Slingers, too. Give him a little bit of poke against the Gyrocopters. Uh, I definitely think running is the right play for the Dwarves. Buy some time for your Gyros to come in. He still has... He has, you know, a lot of ammo on this Brimstone gun. Yeah, he's got eight, eight volleys. Get that bad boy over here and start shooting Queek. I mean, that's pretty much your best bet. These brave Dwarf Warriors are going to be sacrificed uh, to buy time for the Gyrocopters to get in position. Steam Cannons shooting into the back of the Skaven Slaves and Death Runners, which is definitely smart. And the Thane is looking for some help where there is none. Um, how much HP does he have? 1,000. Queek is rocking 1,200, so Queek's relatively low too. But again, if the Brimstone Gun can snipe Queek, you know, that, that, gives, that gives the Dwarves a chance. It's a slim one, but it's certainly here. It's certainly possible. So here comes another volley from the Brimstone Gun. Seven volleys. He's down to 1,000. You know what? Every time they shoot, Queek is taking about 100 damage. Maybe Queek should hide behind the tree right here. You know? I don't know, man. This is this is really, really close. More shots coming in. Queek is able to dodge those using the terrain, which is nice. Gyrocopters with some very desperate cycle charging at this point. And uh, they're more or less out of ammunition, but... Yeah, we have another gyro over there on the far side. Queek getting blasted once again, but dodging that volley. There's four volleys left now in this gyro. And these dwarf warriors are going to be attacking the death runners. Yeah, doing a little bit of damage, though, before they go quietly into the night. Queek Headtaker, though, yeah. These gyros need to get, like, on top of Queek and really hit him because they've been missing, like, all their pass volleys. Yumaiz is just fighting so hard to get back in this game. And the Gyrocopter, the Brimstone Gun, is wavering. I mean, there's nothing... I guess the Skaven Slaves can attack it. Yeah, they might be able to kill it. All right, Queek gets popped in the face once again. Ammunition. There's two volleys left on the Gyrocopter. If there's any chance for the Dwarves... Any chance. Queek needs to be, like, eating every single shot they have left. 
And also, these gyrocopters need to be, like, cycle charging them. Cycle charging Queek, I think. Yeah, a little bit of cycle charging there. The Thane is now in combat with Skaven Slaves. You know, Queek's actually wavering. He was wavering there for a second, guys. If Queek breaks and the gyrocopters get him off, holy shit. That's going to be insane. All right, Queek takes... Queek's at eight leadership. Oh, my God. Stand your ground is the only thing keeping him fighting. And now the gyros are going in for the kill against Queek. Can the Thane carry, though? He's wavering against Skaven Slaves, which is always a bad sign. And Queek is able to stabilize at 17 leadership. Death Runners intercept here. The Thane is in combat. And, um... Yeah, how is this Thane wavering? I guess they're clan rats. They're not just Skaven Slaves. Oh, my God. The bounce of power is so close right now. The dreaded Gyrocopter Goon Squad. Look at this bounce of power. Oh, my God. This this is it. If Queek... If Queek uh, dies to this Thane... Oh, the final charge, dude. Who got who? It looks like the Thane got tagged and Queek dodged his attack. Oh my god, Queek's broken too. And the Thane is dead, but Queek is also broken. So now the Gyrocopter can chase him off. Wait, Belagar's back? No way. Where was he this whole time? So the Gyrocopters are going to be attacking Queek here. Oh my god, Queek is gone. And Belagar is back. There's still Death Runners though, so... If the dwarves are able to get their gyrocopters, you can see he's chasing off some Skaven slaves right now. But if the gyrocopters can rear charge the Death Runners and like help, help out, and you can see, oh my God, look at this! This freaking haggard gyrocopter has been trying to kill this plague priest for like ten minutes. I would honestly just let him come back, and you, you need to get over here and help because Belagar is your only hope. Although the Skaven slave slingers might be able to get him. This isn't a meme game for anyone who's saying this is a meme. Both players are playing serious builds. There are this; these are not memes. Queek is is good against dwarves. Holy shit. Belagar's, like, trying here. This gyrocopter's, like, rolling all over Queek here. Oh, Queek's dead! The gyrocopter's bladed him in the back! So now Belagar needs some help from the gyrocopters to make his valiant last stand. He does have a silver shield. Holy shit, man. <laughs> and the... Oh my god, the gyros! Yeah, you gotta fight here. You gotta fight. The gyrocopters have to fight with King Belagar. You have to break him. Oh my god, the Death Runners are being broken. The Gyrocopter in the back is attacking the Plague Priest. So for anyone who's wondering about the attacking rules, the Plague Priest has been getting attacked the entire time. Oh my god, the Gyrocopters are shaken. Got... <laughs> oh my god, and the Dwarves! The Dwarves freaking won it! Oh my god! Jesus Christ, I can't believe they freaking won that! The dwarves did it! The King of Eight Peaks, dude. Holy shit. Now, it is best of three. So, there's still more games to be played. I cannot believe it. What a what a great game. GG, well played. Alright, so for the next map, we will do the Tower of Hoeth. Damn, son. Yeah, for sure. Get out, mule. Oh, my God. The, gy the gyrocopters. The melee copters, dude. That was that was a pretty legendary game. If you guys haven't already liked the stream, make sure to do it now. Because uh, shit's getting real, man. Holy shit. Talk about some dwarven tenacity, man. <laughs> really really well played yeah absolutely oh my god uh should load soon it's uh tower of hoth damn guys hopefully you enjoyed that one i sure did that was a lot of stuff to micro you know i think that that replay has its place here in the grand finals i think it's i think it's in the proper place it's a Christmas miracle. Dude, the Thane... <clears throat> the Thane sacrificed himself. He died, but he injured Queek enough for the gyrocopters to come in and finish him, which was pretty epic for sure. Yeah. I didn't even know where Belagar was the whole time. Like, he just came back. Like, the king marched back, dude. You know? Okay. Let's see if this works. One-man boy band. 
Hey man, thank you for the donation. He says, hi friend. How you doing, man? You've been you've been here forever, man. Hope you're doing well. Let's see if they can see the map now. Dude, that, that game was dramatic, dude. We've had so many like that, like the Skin Wolf game earlier. Holy shit. The ancestors are proud, yeah, I know. The Chad Thane. All right, I need some water. I'm like too hyped from that game there. Oh my God. Ah, delicious. <clears throat> what the hell, I left assuming it was over. You gotta go back and watch it, Pepe. Do you have like a Patreon or PayPal or something? Uh, yeah, you can. I do have either of those. They should be linked in the description. So whatever whatever your preference is, man. And don't feel any pressure, please. If you're enjoying the content, just hang out and that's all you got to do, man. This tournament has been insane. Now, I'm curious how they're going to change their builds because it becomes very interesting. It's almost like a, like a StarCraft best of five or best of three, whereas like you're playing the same faction over and over, but you do two different builds, right? Is your opponent going to use the build they used in game one? Um it really becomes quite a mind game. So I'm curious what Yumaiz is going to do. Is he just going to come with the same exact build and be like, come at me, bro? Or is he going to change things up? Yeah. Yumaiz is ready. The Tower of Hoeth is, uh, is upon us. <clears throat> this, is now, this is now a lore-friendly faction war for uh, Eight Peaks. It is. We had Queek, we had Belagar, and we had Skarsnik. And Yumaiz killed Skarsnik, and he also killed um, your boy here, uh, Queek, in that game. Yeah, that was that was some crazy shit. Yamais is the new legendary lord for Dowie. Press, presser sleepy time ASMR. Well, it looks like this game is over, and wait, by God, it's Belagar with the steel chair. By God, it's Belagar with the steel chair. Dude, I know. That was like the most WWE moment ever. Like you think it's all lost and then Belagar just emerges like from the shadows of the edge of the map. Oh my God. That was insane shit. That one gyrocopter that had like eight volleys left that blasted Queek for like 700 HP. That guy was the true hero. <clears throat> all Slayers? I'm really curious what Yumaiz is gonna do different. You know, I think Hadri's. How would Hadri's adapt to that? I guess just bring. Um, I mean, you know what I've used against arrows pretty well is Rattling Gunner. So I'll go like double Gisele Rattling Gunner and then just have the Rattling Gunners guarding the Gisele. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was more the artillery. So I guess if Hadri's with, went with like a rush, like Death Runner Vanguard with like Doom Flares and like a, you know, Doom Wheel, like kind of really aggressive, that would do the trick against an artillery build like that. But. You never know, like, is he going to switch it up? You never know. <laughs> By God, King, that rat had a family. <laughs> yeah, Skaven have a lot of family members, that's for sure. <laughs> the dwarves are fast-paced. I didn't hear no bell. Why would you bring the great weapons in this matchup? Yeah, you know, I think he brought great weapon dwarves just because he wanted more dwarf warriors for a cheaper cost. Because there's limits on how many shielded ones you can bring. So, um, yeah, after this, I'm going to be watching the UFC for the rest of the night. That's my; Those are my plans. Matthias, been loving the stream. Hey, man, I'm glad to hear you're enjoying the stream. Happy holidays to you and uh, your family and friends and everyone. And uh, here you are in the grand finals, enjoying this glorious duel. Belgar's Belgar be like at dawn look to the east <laughs> yeah the rattling gunners would get wrecked by the artillery too so yeah yeah Val Valnir with some Skaven tech here Hadri's is really scheming a build here I wonder if Deathmaster no, you know what Queek's probably bet Queek is probably better than Deathmaster because he's tankier Deathmaster can get smashed by the dwarf heroes pretty hard granted he can kill them as well but um yeah why is my name blue with a little wrench next to it? It's because you're a mod. <laughs> I think I made you a mod like two years ago in chat. It's nothing new. A drinking bird. Your enthusiasm and passion when casting is very wholesome and makes these battles 100 times better. 
Thank you for the content. Keep on trucking. I will, man. Thank you, Drinking Bird. I haven't had a beer in like probably six months. I think I'm going to have one after stream today to celebrate this this glorious, glorious round of events. Chael Sonnen has never, lost, never lost a round. It's true. The Undisputed. It's got the meanest guns in Westland, Oregon. <laughs> Chael Sonnen is so awesome. Yeah, he's a fun guy. Are you excited for uh, Games Workshop rebooting, rebooting Warhammer Fantasy? Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm going to be all over that. I'll be doing battle reports on the channel. I'll be going deep into the old world when they release that. I'll probably have two armies. I'm thinking about having... Uh, well, I'm going to have an Empire army, and then I'll probably buy one new army as well. <laughs> you never notice that, boy band? Yeah, that's funny. Dwarf Legendary Lords airdrop from Gyrocopters. That would be so goddamn cool. If a gyrocopter like lowered a rope and like you know ungram could like grab onto it and like just be like dropped into the enemy lines oh that'd be so metal that'd be so metal yeah why can't dwarves like para drop i feel like they could figure that shit out like get a gyro bomber and they like are like dangling from it and like i don't know they have like a drop pods or something uh i don't know uh, looks good, yeah. I think they're just scheming their builds, and, you know, I'm not going to rush them here. We've, we've had such an epic journey. They can take as long as they need. When's the reboot expected to come out? I would probably say, tw like, so sometime in 2022. Or, um, 2023. I'm sure Rona kind of set everything back, so... Oh my god, imagine dwarves with like 40k drop pods just like dropping iron breakers in your lines and shit. <laughs> yeah, carrot. Yeah, I mean, all right. So here's the thing. In Age of Sigmar, they do obviously have the the techno dwarves, right? Um but it, there is a precedent for it in Warhammer Fantasy. If you've read the book, uh if you've read the Gotrek and Felix books, there's several parts in that series where they meet a, a dwarf called Malachi Mikeson. He's a slayer, but he's also a master engineer, basically. So uh, Malachi Mikeson creates a giant dwarven battle barge ship thing. I forget what it's called. So in, in, it, it carries passengers who he then lands and drops off. So in theory, they could have like a giant sky ship that could land and like drop troops off, then go back up. Like this, it happens in the books, you know. Uh Iron Drake's coming out of drop pods would be pretty epic. Yeah. All right, guys. Hadries, and you might round two. Oh, look at this. He's he's not backing down. You might comes with the exact same build. The exact same build. Felix, Thane, Belagar, Battle Line, Gyrocopters, Artillery, exact same business. The Spirit of Grungni. Yeah, it's a Thunder Barge. All right, guys. Dwarves have the same build. Hadries, any adjustments? Skaven Slaves. Uh, forges Ales this time instead of three. He also brings a Poison Wind Mortar this time, which he didn't bring before. And it looks like it's going to be Quad Death Runner. And as far as the Skaven leadership goes, it's going to be Queek, a Plague Priest, and an Assassin. So very minor changes. Um, adding one more Gisele and the Mortars. And uh, pretty much the same in terms of leadership. <clears throat> Both players kind of doing the same thing, which is kind of cool. I like it. Not second guessing themselves, going in with the uh, the builds they had before and really making a statement. Yeah. It could be like a help at abomination. When it dies, it drops off dwarves. Yeah, that's true. It could be like, do like a crash landing. <clears throat> Slayers jump off mid flight. Yeah, that'd be pretty epic. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I know. It's the age-old uh, adage there. I like the changes Hadri's made, though. I think the Poison Wind Mortars will be very nice. You know, potentially against... Especially with the Dwarves deploying in the way they're deploying there. Yeah. <laughs> Scotland the Brave intensifies. <laughs> the gloves are off! Yeah, we got some, some Poison Wind Mortars. Yeah, more or less the same builds. Same hero combo, I think. Assassin, Queek, plus Plague Priest, versus Felix, Belagar, and Thane. One more Gisele. I think Hadri's really wants to make sure that the uh, the gyrocopters don't mess with him again. So he's just going to go and really try and put those guys down. And for the dwarves, they're just going to be shooting against the Gisales. I think Hadri's has got to expect the dwarves to use this terrain here. 
<laughs> Dozer Roman in chat saying this is almost giving me anxiety. Me too. I'm like a little nervous. You know, I'm like, shit, man. It is best of three. We got a, a $50 donation from Dozer Roman. Such an awesome pre-Christmas gift this turned out to be. Thank you so much, Turin, players and fans. What a great way to close out the year of uh, the Rona. Cheers. May your pleasant uh, presence encumber you all. And stay healthy, everyone. Hey, Dozer, man, that's a very wholesome message. Thank you, man. And, uh, you know, hope all's well with you. Thank you for the donations and the membership today, dude. You're, you're going going ham. For the High King! Adrian says, ready to lose again. And Yumai says, for the High King, good luck, have fun. Hadrian's man, you gotta believe in yourself. You're, you're, you're an unholy terror on the Skaven. Yumai's played very well last game. There's no shame in that. Was really hoping for the Skaven Slave Slinger meta. Yeah, just like 20 Skaven Slave Slingers. So, Poison Wind Globideers. Uh, so, Death Globes cost 900 Lincoln compared to Poison Winds, which are 550. And the Poison Damage typically just gets you more value, whereas the Death Globes are only really good against Elite Troops, which are very niche. Most most people will never bring Elite Troops against Gaven, so it's kind of like, it just isn't often that good. Yeah. We will see. The dreaded Dowie box. Yeah, now they're truly going back to their, their natural habitat, which is a box with some terrain. And uh, Hadris will immediately move his army over to intercept. Now, Skaven aren't going for any vanguards, but Yumais is a, a very careful Dwarven King. He is going to be scouting here. Um, obviously, no fruit will be born of this uh, venture here, but he's still going to be looking. And now, the same thing as before. Going to be using the Grudge Throwers as well as the Cannons to shoot at the uh, the Gisales, which are getting punished pretty badly. You know, maybe maybe a rush, yeah, with like Doom Players would, would just be better. Who knows? I mean, the Death Runners will still obviously do massive damage. And, you know, the Dwarves are more tightly packed here, so that there is a chance that they could lose their position a little bit quicker than the other game where they were a little bit more spread out. So one Gisale is broken. The other um, three seem to be in okay shape. And Yumais is apparently keeping the Gyrocopters out of range. I think that's actually what he's doing. I think he's keeping the gyrocopters out of range of the Gisales until they get softened up. Because now there's only three Gisales, and four gyrocopters should easily be able to overwhelm three Gisales. So I think he just move in here, honestly. The rest of the Dwarven army will have to hold. Oh god, we just had a, a power flicker in my, my home. Hopefully the stream doesn't crash. Well, the lights were just flickering, so hopefully the uh, apocalypse isn't upon us. The Gisales are killing the Dwarven cannon pretty effectively. Kind of wearing this guy down. You know, I'm going to turn the lights off just to be safe there. Mortar teams, that's actually pretty unfortunate. You know, the Poison Wind Mortar is actually hurting the Skaven more than the Dwarves. Uh, the Poison Wind Mortar hit the Death Runners and really did a ton of damage against them. In the back, we do have a Gyrocopter with the Brimstone Gun. It's actually in melee attacking the Poison Wind Mortar. Uh, you know, maybe just let that thing shoot if it's going to keep shooting at uh, Death Runner positions. Two of the Gisales have opened up here on one of the Gyrocopters up in the sky, and the Dwarven Battle Line, as expected, is completely collapsed in the front. Dwarf Warriors are no match for Death Runners. One of the cannons probably is going to be going down. Granted, the other cannon plus the two grudge throwers are still functional. And the Skaven gun line is actually holding relatively firm. We still have three Gisales fighting relatively efficiently. So Belagar and the boys have committed to the front line. Obviously, the Death Runners are running pretty rampant. Um, we do have two of them here, which are relatively healthy. And they appear to be pulling back, which is actually really nice for the dwarves. I definitely think a Death Runner maybe should have pressed in and tried to get on the artillery position. Also, if Hadrius can get um, a Skaven Summon, like one or two Skaven Summons right here would be an absolute disaster here. <laughs> kind of lore accurate. The Skaven are sabotaging the power in my home. That's really funny. I think that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, the Mortars are now raining in, and this is good. They're hitting the cannon. They're hitting some Dwarf Warriors, but uh, this could be really bad for Yumais here. This could just be game ending. Like one Death Runner just cutting through like all the Dwarven artillery back here is such a painful thing. And I think Yumais knows this. He pulls back his Dwarf Warriors here, and also his Gyrocopters with the Steam Cannons are shooting into the back of the Death Runners. He needs to preserve his artillery position, or this game is pretty much 100% over. Now, back in the mainline engagements, it looks like Belagar the King. I'm getting a little, little bit of frame rate lag here. Bubba's Big Blast, thank you for becoming a member, man. I think you were a member before, but maybe it just expired. Thank you so much, Bubba. Appreciate that. But the King and his, uh, his cohort of Felix and the Thane are holding well, but... It seems like this is deja vu all over again. Is now the Skavener collapsing with their heroes. The heroes clash on the battlefield. A clash of rats and uh, humans and dwarves. And it's going to get super crazy. I mean, Felix, of course, is included. But the Skavener are opting to pull back this time instead of uh, really pressing in. And 
Man, those mortar teams are doing some big damage, hitting the cannons and the defending troops. The Death Rounders were pushed off, which is a pretty big win for the Dwarves. Um, but the Gyrocopters are still taking quite a bit of damage. Um, they're still... All four Gisales are functional. That is a huge, huge win for the Skaven. Uh, and now the Gyrocopters are going to have to either go back there and finish them off, which then means the Death Runners aren't being pressured as much. It's just a scary situation all around. But look at this. Felix is actually hiding. So Felix is pulled back away from the main engagement. Uh, Belagar plus the Thane are fighting here, but oh man, this is a little bit scary for the Dwarves. Belagar is hit by Assassin's Trophy and Trophy Heads from Queek, and he is getting shanked super hard. He's going to need some support. Belagar might actually die here. Queek and uh, Hadri's Assassin Goon Squad probably is going to take out the King, but again, we've heard that before. And the Gyrocopters are getting massacred by the Gisales. This time, Hadri's is not messing about as his uh, gun line is able to finish off the Gyrocopters. I think that um, perhaps Yumaius is maybe going to have to go to the drawing board. I think Hadri's may have figured out the, uh, the code here on this build. But that's what game three is for. Belagar is being hunted by Queek. He's most certainly in some trouble. Um, Felix and the Thane are still somewhat healthy. Maybe if the Dwarves can somehow stabilize their gun line, but no, this game's over. The 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 Death Runners came back here. They came back here, and uh, yeah, this is gonna be it's gonna be game blouses. Yeah, you can see the artillery of the Dwarves going down here. The Gyrocopters are being crossfired here, and um, Belagar Iron Hammer is gonna be getting hunted down by the Assassin as well. For the Karazhan Corps, settle the grudge. Well, this game is going to create a grudge, which was previously eliminated. So if we're doing some Dawi science here, there's still going to be... I mean, I guess we have an even... We're breaking even on the grudge department. Yep. Queek gives it to Belagar pretty hard in combat. I don't think the dwarves have any chance this time. I know I said that to an extent in the previous game, but... Yeah, losing your lord and Queek being healthy, plus like the assassin. Hadris would have to make some huge misplays to lose this game. Like, all the dwarven artillery dying here is, is pretty rough for sure. Mortars are charging into combat, although they're mainly trying to avoid that gyrocopter, it looks like. Here, it looks like Queek does take some damage. Felix and the Thane are able to give him some business, but uh, from here, the Plague Priest and the Skaven Slaves will pile in, and Queek will destroy Felix in combat. Destroy. And uh, yeah, Death Runners are still numerous, which is really, really rough at this point in the game. And uh, GG. Hadris is going to be tying up the series. We got a Game 3 coming in. How are the players going to be changing their builds? That is the question. Well played there. A very proper comeback by Hadris, uh, remedying many of the mistakes he made in game one, making some nice adjustments to his build on a very micro level. And uh, yeah, this time Queek did not take any shit. Belagar got dunked on, 195 gold. I like the extra Gisele. Um I like the mortar inclusion, I think it's nice. Like four Gisales will give Gyrocopters a lot of problems. Um, yeah, great game, great game guys. So let's update these nameplate here, update the score. Boom. GG well played. So for the next map, we can go ahead and do the Eshin. Let's do it to it. Let's satisfy the grudge. You guys ready for the rubber match? I think Umize is he's gotta go all in here on some wild shit. But I don't know. Maybe he'll stay with the same build. We'll see. We'll see, my friends. We are on Eshin for the map. Eshin is a pretty classic multiplayer map. Used in many tournaments. Now for the great mind game. I know. Both players have kind of showed their hand here. You know, I would be so down for a Mass Slayer rush. I'd be so down. You think Adrian? I, I don't think you... Queek is actually really good in this matchup. I think you go Queek. Yeah. Death Runners are really good at killing dwarves, true. We've had awesome battles across the boards. <laughs> dwarves mark Dozer saying dwarves maybe marked the book a little bit too soon. We'll see. But Eshin is the map. Presser Sleepy Time ASMR, thank you for becoming a member. Really appreciate it. Welcome to the Dukes and Dukeettes of Haggard. This is the Skin Wolf Rubber match. Oh Thomas, dude, I like that, bro. That was good. The <laughs> Skin Wolf Rubber match. Nice man. I'm gonna start I'm gonna steal that one. I'll credit you though whenever I see you. The Skin Wolf Rubber match. Oh, come on, dude. How did I not think of that? Nice work, man. Shit. Yumai's the High King. Will he hold? If he tries the same build a third time in a row. That would be interesting. If if like Yumai's refuses to budge and he goes with the same build and just tries a different execution. Yumai's is ready. 
He is. <laughs> uh, how about Dwarf Miners? Yeah, Blasting Charges are really good in this matchup. Are Gatling teams any good versus Dwarves? Not really. No. Like, uh, the Dwarven Shields are pretty cost-effective there, and I don't know. They get obstructed too much in my, for my liking. Which factions counter Skaven right now? Um, Wood Elves are really good against Skaven. I think Vampire Counts are good against Skaven. Um, I think Vampire Coast has an even, uh, even maybe slightly a, an advantage against Skaven. It's still close. I mean, I don't know. I think Vampire Coast versus Skaven is like a 50-50 matchup. I think... I, I actually was practicing with Hadri's a couple days ago. I was playing Vampire Coast against his Skaven, and I was able to get some pretty solid wins against his Skaven with Vampire Coast. Um, but that was using Solastra. King uh, used um, Luther Harkin earlier. But yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I would say those are probably the... That would be my evaluation. Grombrindle could be interesting here. You know, Ungram wouldn't be terrible either. Although, you know, the Unbreakable Lords are nice, for sure, because they don't just get chased off. What would be really nice, too, is since, since like, Umayus is fighting these hero blobs... A flash bomb Grom Brindle with the melee defense buff from No Fear could be really strong too. Yeah, the Viking, I, I see what you're saying. They, they certainly can. I, I still feel like if you're playing a really good vampire count player, they'll have an advantage, but that's just me. I mean, you know, obviously you've probably had different experiences than I have. Um, but, you know, I still don't like that matchup for Skaven. I, I, it's stressful to play. Um, I think Great Stag Knights are good. I think the ROR is really good in many matchups, but the other ones are just kind of average in most matchups. Still good, but I prefer the ROR Great Stag Knight when I'm using them. Do Orcs have a better time versus Skaven due to their many Wolves? And No, James Wright. Well, Greenskins actually have, I think, a bad matchup versus Skaven. It's been a matchup I've struggled with for a long time. I think if you're playing Orcs, you have to go for a mass Vanguard rush. That's your best bet. Yeah, that's your best bet, in my opinion. Damn, guys, what an adventure this has been. I feel like we've gone all the way to Mordor and back together. And now we're uh, we're here in the Grand Finals. Game three, the the, the Rubber Wolf match, the Condom Wolf match. Yeah. Yeah, how are the, uh, the bracket predictions going for everyone? For anyone who's playing in the March Madness, or Match Madness, for this uh, tournament, what is your score out of... Um, how many possible ma uh, battles are there? So we got round of 16, which has 8, and then... Then we got four, so 12. Yes, yeah, so that's like what, out of 15 or 16 or something? Or, yeah, I've used Warp Grinders, Viking. Yeah, it's pretty good. <clears throat> I use them. I mean, yeah, you can go with like, you know, Foot Throt if you want, Foot Pack Master, and then just get like, you know, Brood Horde. I mean, there's any number of ways you could play it. I think Throt is really good, though. Yeah. All right, guys. Eshin is here. Let's do it. Honey Nut is 10 of 15. All right. That's not bad, brother. That's a pretty good prediction. I think somebody earlier um, had like a crazy accurate prediction of the tournament so far. But like, I don't think anybody would have guessed the Dwarves beating Skaven in the finals. So like, if, if the Dwarves win this, I think it's going to ruin so many people's brackets. I have eight. I'll have nine if Skaven win it. Okay. That's not bad, Ben. <clears throat> Ungum versus Queek, who wins? I don't know, maybe Queek. Yeah, I don't know. Queek has the debuffs, which are really strong. I think Queek would win. <clears throat> Hadri's not buckling off his build. Um, going with more or less the same thing. He's got four Death Runners, a Poison Wind Mortar. How many Gisales does he have? Only three this time. So he cut a Gisale, um, just to get a little bit more width and brought some Slingers, it looks like. <clears throat> and now for the Dowie. The Dowie. What do we got? Okay, yeah, things are changing. So we got Dwarf Warriors backed up by Quad Slayer. Uh, looks like we also have a Rune Lord this time who has Felix with him and Gotrek. Oh, Gotrek and Felix are here. I love it. No missiles though. He only has a single gyrocopter in the back. So the Dwarves are more or less doing a rush build of sorts, but not a Vanguard rush. Um, I would have liked to have seen like a couple Rangers or something, you know, just to shoot at the Death Runners, but he's gonna have to use Slayers to fight Death Runners, which is a pretty messy affair. Yeah, uh, I would love I would love to play in faction war, but you know, obviously, I think it's better that if I just sit and cast. You know, yeah, 
I play in. Uh, I I usually don't play in my own tournaments, with the exception of the Swiss League I run. So I run an ongoing Swiss League that's like six or seven weeks. You play one uh, best of five a week, and there's um, we got a hundred and fifty dollar prize pool for that. If I do end up winning that though, the prize pool will just go to second place. Chances are I won't win it, but you know it could happen. <clears throat> so, but yeah, normally I don't play in my own tournaments. All right, guys, this is going to be interesting. A very different dwarf build, very spread out, which I don't know. I, you know, I, I I don't know if this is going to work. I a uh, little little concern for it, although it is going to put a ton of pressure on the Gisales. The Gisales will not be effective here, um, comparatively speaking to previous games, because there's no good targets. Like they don't want to be shooting dwarf warriors and shit. But the best target for the Gisales will probably be slayers. I think the dwarves need to stay a little bit more together. Like this spread out allows death runners to like isolate weak flanks and things like that. <laughs> the last charge of the Dowie. It is a dwarf rush, dude. Well, Gotrek is just a powerful duelist, even. So, like, having Gotrek beating on Queek is pretty good. Like, Gotrek can definitely hurt Queek pretty bad. <clears throat> and, you know, he has a chance of uh, getting that. I would have liked to have seen Grom Brindle, though. For a build like this, Grom is so much better than a Rune Lord. I don't know why the hell you'd want a Rune Lord. Like, what are you going to Rune of Wrath and Rune the Death Runners? I mean, uh, I don't know. <clears throat> we'll see. Maybe he'll prove me wrong. Does he have any Rune? He only has Rune of Wrath and Rune, yeah. One gyrocopter on the back of the map. Pressure's on, all set for the Karazhan core. All right, you know, yeah, I'm very worried about this dwarf build, but if he makes it work, then I'll be, I'll eat my words. Like, I feel like there's so much stuff that the Skaven are just happy to see here, you know? Like, the dwarf characters are over there. Like, the Skaven army could engage this whole force, like, way, way before, you know, the Dwarven hero squad even gets in position. Yeah, we'll see. Mortar's going down on Slayers. It looks like every single shot misses, which is pretty funny. The gyrocopters are now moving in. It looks like there's a gyrocopter. So, well, technically it's still three gyrocopters, so they're able to get in there and do some pressure. And uh, no Vanguard units, though. So it's just uh, the dwarves getting in there the old-fashioned way. The Mortar teams, oh, talk about Value City, just bombing those Slayers there. That's that's definitely very painful. There are Slayers on the other side. Um, Death Runners in total, how many do we have? It looks like four or three. One, two, I think there's, there are four Death Runners. Yeah, there's one work lurking in the wings over here. The Slayers definitely want to fight the Death Runners. That's like a value city. So the Mortars have switched onto these Dwarf Warriors. The Gyrocopter is immediately killed by the Gisales, which uh, feels pretty bad. <laughs> the, they're able to really uh, punish those guys pretty good. And now these Slayers could perhaps engage against these Death Runners, which I think wouldn't be a terrible idea. Especially if the two Slayers sandwich these Death Runners, they could probably kill them pretty quickly. So the dwarves are going to be doing a flank overload. The gyrocopters have fallen, completely massacred. And now here comes the frontline fight. Dwarf warriors getting ready to engage. And slayers have taken a fight against death runners. They're winning that fight. That's actually a good trade for the slayers. These ones are pulling back, avoiding the clan rat summons, which I also think is pretty good control here by Yumais. But here comes the business, man. The slayers, uh, the dreaded slayer cavalry coming around the flanks, going to be moving in to uh, press onto the Gisales while the dwarven heroes also move onto the flanks as well. Can you open Last Samurai music? No, I can't. My stream would be uh, shut down. It'd be Karate Chats, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, the Slayer is really performing quite well against the Death Runners, actually. Quite impressed with that. Also, you know, forcing out a couple Skaven summons. Gotrek is being sniped as well, and the Death Runners probably just fight them with the Slayers. I mean, rather than try and kite them, they're way faster than you. They have 48 speed against your 40, so I think you just got to fight them. And the Dwarves, yeah, everything is more or less engaged now. Everything in the middle for the Dwarves is kind of getting crumped, except the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass. Those guys are holding relatively firm. And these Slayers out here um, are putting a dent in things. Yeah, they're, they're, they're putting a nice little dent in there. But the Death Runners should be able to clean them up. There's just too many of them. Yeah, I think the build needed a little something something else. Like, just the amount of Dwarf Warriors just didn't seem cost effective. Now, if the Dwarves had come in with, like, Blasting Charges or something, I think that could have done the trick. Like... Blasting Charge is backed up by Slayers. Because Blasting Charges will annihilate Death Runners and uh, also clear out Skaven Slaves and Clan Rats really well. But again, the game isn't over yet. Um, we still have the Hero Squad, and you know they could potentially win some big trades. Although these Dwarf Warriors, man, are just getting punished. And Skaven are happily using all of their ammunition. Here comes the last stand, man. Here they come. Let us see how this engagement goes. Felix and the Rune Lord moving into combat. Clan Rat Summon being used to obstruct their uh, their business here. Warriors of Dragonfire Pass put in a massive trash can by Queek and the Assassin. Just absolutely dumpstered. Literally, like, lost all their models and did, like, no damage in return. The Slayers here are able to kill the Death Runners, which is a nice grab. Anytime you can get those guys off the battlefield is a huge victory. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if the dwarves are able to get some good engagements in the hero fight, that could be a way to get back in the game. Um, here we do have the dwarven uh, or the skaven missile teams repositioning uh, to get a better uh, kind of angle and also more distance from the dwarven forces, which is quite smart. Yeah, the dwarves definitely taking a, a righteous, righteous beating from these mortars and Gisales just kind of opening up into their forces. And they have so much ammo left too, which really sucks for them. The Rune Lord overextending a little bit. He better be careful. He's chasing down that Plague Priest. Not that he could really do much against him in the first place. And Felix and Gotrek are left over here. Um, Rune Lord most certainly needs to get back here because now there's an Assassin's Trophy going down. Kui has used Verminous Valor, which blows away all the nearby dwarves and allows him to hunt the Rune Lord. And this could be the beginning of the end for the Dawi, as the Rune Lord is getting chased down by the dreaded Skaven Assassin. And, uh, and yeah, I, I don't know if Gotrek and Felix will be able to get there in time. Maybe. Probably Rune of Wrath and Rune on Queek just to buy some time could be the right way to go. We do have a shit ton of Slayers piling in. Slayers could make a difference here. The Mortars are about out of ammunition, so that means there's not going to be too much punishment in that regard. And Queek is actually pinned down by Slayers, while Gotrek is uh, moving through the Clan Rats to try and get to that Assassin. But man, Queek is just the, the hunter, but Gotrek bursts through the ranks! Oh, but he gets caught by Skaven Slaves again, and this poor Rune Lord is just... Really just in precarious situations over and over again. The Slayers are bumping and grinding pretty good. They're definitely uh, getting down. But, you know, they're just so mucked up by chaff. And yeah, the Rune Lord has got to use Rune of Wrath and Rune here to escape. Escape an Assassin's hot on his tail. He is really, really alone here. But Gotrek is going once again, trying to catch Queek. But every time Gotrek escapes, Hadrius is so on point using his summons to block him up. But, yeah, there's a nice attack right there. Queek actually takes some damage. And the Rune Lord, I think, knows this is like his last chance is... Like, all right, let's at least fight with Gotrek, who's also being sniped by a million Gisales. Holy shit. He is getting popped, man. And uh, Rune Lord is going down. I think that's going to be game. And Hadrius is once again going to be a Faction War winner after doubting himself earlier. The dreaded Skaven claimed victory just barely from the hands of one of their, uh, you know, better matchups. So that is the third Skaven win in the Faction Wars. Definitely a very strong faction, but you also have to give... Big props to the pilot. Um, the pilot adjusted. He stayed calm. He won some uh, tough matchups today and uh, was able to come back from the brink of defeat when the dwarves went up a game. Now, I think Yumais might have mind gamed himself too much. I think his original build had a better chance. I think a, a build with a little bit of range support would have been better. Because, um, yeah, the dwarf warriors just did not do their thing. They just got dunked on, dude, like across the board. So, well played. The disgusting rats win it. They do indeed. But that was not an easy win. That was a hard-fought win. Those players had to fight the hard way. So if you go to the Faction War bracket, Hadrius will be the champion of the Horned Rat and the champion of today's tournament. Hadrius, of course, had to fight against uh, King of the Dead earlier. He had to fight Vampire Coast. He had to fight Lizardmen. He had to fight some, you know, gritty, gritty opponents. But he was able to claw it out with his little rat claws and get all the way to the finals. And Skaven are very strong, but they do have their counters. Um... But, you know, in Faction Wars, a lot of it comes down to, like, how your opponents play out, right? Like, he didn't have to face Wood Elves because uh, Xyphos lost. He didn't have to face Vampire Counts because uh, Valkanos. Like, it all could have gone different, right? Like, what if Valkanos had lost a tank and then Vampires were there? It's like a whole different situation. Or what if someone else had made it to the finals? There's many variables in place, but despite all those variables, Hadri's played an amazing set of games and he pushed to the finals. After taking a hard loss in that first game in the finals, he kept his cool, kept his composure, and um, was able to come back and win. Yeah, it was it was a great series, man. But it's, you know, that's really cool too, to see the dwarves get to the finals. Like, man, that was exciting. Big props to you, Maes. I mean, that's something you don't see often. Gisales are definitely very strong. I just think that last build was, um, just didn't have the teeth. Yeah, well played, Hadris. I know you were doubting yourself last night, but it would appear that you had no grounds to do so. So Hadrius is going to be winning the cash prize for today's tournament. Congratulations to him. The King of the Skaven rises once more from the pits, from the hell pits, and he's able to claim victory. <laughs> Aerocrastic says, QSA forever. Okay, now back to work. Turin, can you make a list at the end of each faction war of which race won the previous factions? I can actually tell you right now. So if we go to the Faction War Hall of Fame, which I have in my Discord, we have... The first winner was Talaxalan Soothsayer with the Empire. Then it was Falcon with the Lizardmen, Hadris with the Skaven, Anticity with Vampire Coast, the Wood Elves with Falcon, who won with Old Wood Elves. Then we had Hadris win with uh, Skaven again, and then Anticity with Coast, and then Hadris with Skaven again. 
Yeah. Soothsayer in chat. All the QSA clan members rising up. Yeah. Yeah. Well played to Yumais and Hadris and everyone who played today. A, a salute to those who have fallen, to the champions who have fought. And, uh, you know, thanks to all these guys for playing, man. Just absolute champs making. It's the players here. I mean, just great players across the board. Um, any of these guys could have won under the right circumstances, right? And uh, it was just super awesome to see. I know. And there will be another faction war before you guys know it. Middle of January, probably like two or three weeks from now. We'll have a, a couple more and uh, go from there. Three wins for the Skaven, yeah. So Skaven and Vampire Coast have the most wins in Faction War. Um, Empire has one. Wood Elves have one. Um, and Empire has one as well. Yeah. It's pretty glorious stuff, man. Pretty glorious indeed. All right, guys. Special thanks again to all of you for joining. Thank you to the mods for helping out. Big thanks to... All of you guys for some huge donations. We have seven new channel members, so thank you guys for joining. To Presser, Sleepy Time, ASMR, Bubba's Big Blast, um, Tihon Noin. We also have... I'm trying to scroll up and see all these. Sophie Shaw. Thank you, thank you. And then we uh, have a couple more, I think. Yeah, Ariz, Run Command, EXE, Eric Larson, and Dozer Roman. And then on top of the new channel members, we had some super generous donations. So if you guys enjoyed this, do make sure to uh, like and subscribe on the way out uh, for more of this kind of content. We're going to be having some really cool, cool events coming up in the next month. Um, and yeah, man, just super generous donations as I look across them here. It's going to take me a minute to go through them all. Orlando Calrissian, epic name. Dozer Roman, Drinking Bird, Matthias, Presser, Sleepy Time, ASMR, One Man Boy Band, Richard Long, Carrot Shell, Dozer Roman again, Tiny Mouse, Clint Morgan, Karachikin, The Melee Salon, Galahan. Samuel Christensen, Jack Daniels, Presser Time, Sleepy Time, ASMR, Mike E, Ephraim Va, Jack Daniels, Justice Sponge, uh, I think Tamashu, oh, the, Samur the Samurai, <laughs> the Samurai Dog Donations. I can't read that. Oh, sorry, I forgot Katakana. Pope Taint V, Matt Hardy, T. Carter, Ozkirk, Mike, you're not getting me in it again with that name, dude. You're not. Nermy the Nerm, Sean and Maphone. Aledron, Wesley Chartran, Antonius, Trays in the Infinite, Agizal, Damien. Holy shit, you guys went crazy today. Thank you so much. Dozer Roman, um, Plessy, Mike Amarillo, Rando Howard, Ben B, Tihan Noin, and Plessy, and uh, Mario, Mike E, and Arez. Thank you guys. Holy shit. So many donations. I will get you guys the Discord link uh, in the video after the fact. For some reason, it's not letting me link it in my own stream, which is stupid. Um... But it is what it is. So we'll get to the bottom of that. All right, guys. Thank you for joining. Congratulations to Hadris for winning the faction war and to Yumais for a glorious, valiant Dawi effort claiming second place. The one time Dawi make it, they have to fight Skaven. Pretty unfortunate. But, you know, he, he made the best of it and uh, almost got the series, which was quite amazing. And again, a salute to all those who played today. Really appreciate you all. And my friends, we will be back with another faction war in uh, January in the first, probably first couple weeks. And then... Um, I have some other really exciting events coming up as well, which uh, we'll give you guys details uh, on very, very soon. All right. Cheers, my friends. And we'll see you guys on the other side.